Caspian's Fortune, Infinity's End, Book One, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. One. Why must you disappoint me, Cas? Next time, come visit my side of the ship, the elegant woman said, descending the long metal ramp. Caspian Rabo raised his fist to his chest in salute, ignoring the insinuation. The princess knew full well if Caspian so much as looked at her the wrong way, he'd see the end of a shooting gallery by the end of the day. But that didn't mean he couldn't at least be cordial. I can only apologize if everything wasn't to your satisfaction, he replied. She reached the bottom of the ramp, gliding over the surface as if she were on a portable hover, her long sapphire dress concealing any hint of actual legs underneath there. For all Cass knew, maybe she didn't even have legs. Perhaps there was a rolling device that replaced her entire lower body. It was better he kept that image in his mind, rather than where his imagination wanted to direct him. A sweet, flowery scent filled the air as she moved into his personal space. Cass tightened his fist, pressing it into his chest as hard as he could as her copper eyes studied his own. The princess was almost exactly his height, and she stopped inches short of their faces touching. Caspian tried not to breathe her in, but it was impossible and intoxicating at the same time. You know, Cass, she said, her voice low, we could always extend the trip. Your skills could be put to use in places other than the engine of your ship. Cass suppressed the urge to wet his lips, "'Begging your pardon, your highness, but I'm afraid we wouldn't have the time. "'You're due for your ceremony in only a few hours.' "'She reached up with her slender fingers and drew them down the stubble on his cheek. "'He felt the ache of desire bloom within him, but he held steadfast. "'He really wished for that mechanical torso right about now. "'I can be quick, if you can,' she whispered. His body wanted to shudder at the suggestion, but he planted his resolve. One finger out of place, and he was dead. Her father, his royal highness of Cloistria, would make him suffer ten different ways before granting a merciful death, and suffer greatly. Still, the temptation was strong. If he suspected she was doing anything other than toying with him, he might actually consider it. Alas, she said, dropping her gaze, you're correct, and I mustn't keep my family waiting. You performed your duty admirably. Cass drew a breath, the first he'd taken in the last two minutes. The princess moved past him, still gliding as if on a cloud of air. He dropped his fist and turned to watch her leave. Your accommodations were satisfactory, she added. But next time, I'll expect the deluxe package. Cass had to keep from rolling his eyes, because even though the princess had her back to him, her two guards, who had disembarked before her, stood facing Cass, their stares boring into him. Making a move on the princess would have been the last voluntary action Cass ever took as a human being. He pulled a small rectangular device from his pocket, checking his balance on the comm unit. Something was wrong. Er, Princess? Cass called, jogging to catch up with her. The two guards immediately advanced on him, moving on either side of the princess, and each grabbing him by the bicep. For course sake, I just want to ask a question, Cass spat at them. The princess turned to face him again, gliding forward. He wrenched one arm free when the princess raised her hand to indicate he could speak. Change your mind? Her eyes twinkled. Your payment didn't process through, Cass said, holding up his readout. Oh, her shoulders dropped, as she seemed genuinely disappointed, but it quickly hardened back into her normal confidence. I transferred your payment to your partner's account. He gave me all the proper credentials. I assumed you two split everything fifty-fifty. Cass did his best to keep from lashing out at her. My... Partner, he meant it as a question, but also didn't want the princess to see his confusion. 
Yes. Mr. Maddox explained it all quite expertly. Cass bit the inside of his lip, forcing a smile. He has, of course. Sorry for the confusion. I hope you enjoyed the trip. She smiled back. Not as much as I could have, I suspect. She reached up for his face again, but stopped midway and retracted her hand. Then she turned on her cloud of air and was off toward the entrance to the Elongorium. And with a sharp snap of her fingers, her guards turned and followed her. As soon as she was through the sliding doors, Cass raced back up the ramp into the ship. Box! Box! Get me coordinated on Maddox, now! Box poked his rectangular metal head from around one of the corridors. Maddox? he asked in his Mancunian accent. What's he got to do with anything? And drop that damn accent, Cass yelled, reaching the cockpit of his ship. His hands flew over the controls, retrieving the ramp and moving through the pre-flight checklist faster than he should. He didn't care. There was no time to waste. Sorry, boss, Box said in his normal voice as he entered the cockpit, his bulky mechanical frame slumping down to the pilot's seat. Last known location was Devil's Gate, as if he would be anywhere else. Great, Cass fumed. Just fantastic. That's six hours away. It'll all be gone by then. Stole your money again, huh? Box asked, in the superior way he always did. I never did like that, man. Then help me get us the hell out of here so we can steal it back, Cass yelled, finishing the pre-flight sequence. Boss, I don't think you're supposed to— He's not getting away with it. Not this time, Cass said, hitting the thrusters. The reasonable excuse jumped to life, lifting off from the landing pad and spinning 180 degrees as it blasted away from the Elongorium. Box turned his attention to the controls, making the adjustments Cass had forgotten in his haste. How'd he do it this time? Box asked. Can't the princess. Told her we were partners, Cass yelled. Boss? What? You're yelling. There's a finite amount of oxygen. Cass gritted his teeth. Give me a break. We have reserves for weeks. Fine, Box said, folding his spindly metal arms behind his head. Don't complain to me when the air runs out. I don't need it. In fact, keep screaming. It means I inherit this ship sooner. Robots can't own ships, Cass said, seething. He wasn't even focusing on Box. All his thoughts were on Maddox and how much of his payment the man had already gambled away. In six hours, he'd be lucky if there was even one Cass soap left. Robots can't lie, either. Box said, with a smugness that could never show on his featureless face. Box was a typical Class 117 autonomous mining robot, which meant he was built for labor. He sported a transparent visor across his eyes and a metal mask across the rest of his face. But there was nothing underneath there except a speaker for a mouth and two yellow optical sensors for eyes. It was designed to protect his components from the harsh weather conditions of whatever assignment he'd received. Fortunately for Box, he'd never seen a day of labor in his life, thanks to Cass. Cass rubbed his temples. He needed to get to Devil's Gate quicker. How close is one of the undercurrents to the gate? Approximately 50 billion kilometers, Box replied. At least he was good for that much. Cass never had to consult the nav system. And how close are we to the undercurrent? Vitar has an entrance at the edge of the system. Thirty minutes at this speed. They had already reached the uppermost layers of the atmosphere of Vitar IV, home of Her Royal Highness and surrounding court. It wasn't a place Cass had visited before, and he didn't see what all the fuss was about. It was just another blue and green planet with a purple atmosphere. The only reason it was even important was because it was in Sargan space. Had it been part of the Coalition... We're taking the undercurrent, Cass said. Boss, that will cut less than an hour off the trip and put extra strain on the ship. Maybe you want to get her service before another undercurrent jump. He swiveled a box. Tell me this, smart guy. How am I supposed to pay for any repairs without any money? 
Bach shrugged. Steel? I noticed the princess had some fine jewels on her person. He wasn't going to dignify that with a response. No, he was going to go get what was owed to him, and nothing more. Except this time, he needed to make things clear to Maddox. The fat lip and black eye he'd left the man with last time hadn't been enough. You could always ask for another loan from Vina, Box suggested. Any more loans and she'll own this ship. Is that what you want? Cass asked, going over the controls for an undercurrent jump. She's probably nicer than you. I bet she'd give me a bed, he replied. You don't sleep. That doesn't mean I don't like to lay down every once in a while, Box retorted. Rest my creaky joints, my old servos, put up my ambulatory units. Cass's eyes narrowed. Even after five years in space with Box, he still had trouble knowing when he was being serious or not. Typically, robots had zero use for any recreation. But ever since Cass made the modifications, Box had been more interested in non-robot things. Maybe if you'd stopped lounging around watching net dramas all day, your joints wouldn't hurt as much. Movement is a good thing. I need them to relax. Cass pushed away from the console, standing. Just input the coordinates and let me know when we're ready to jump. And for once in your short life, don't complain about it. No promises. Box kept his focus on the controls in front of him. Cass shook his head and made his way back down the main corridor, the doors to the cockpit sliding closed behind him. He couldn't believe he let Maddox get the better of him again. And after everything he'd done for the man... Cass had to learn his lesson the hard way. Life outside the Coalition was hard, and it was unfair. And that was probably the most difficult part to get used to. You get screwed over by someone... There was no justice system in place to right the wrong. You either took care of business so it didn't happen again, or you allowed yourself to become a victim, another casualty of the Sargan Commonwealth, and he refused to be a victim. As Cass passed the quarters where the princess had stayed while he'd ferried her from Tau Hydri, that sweet scent reached his nose again. He stopped a moment and inhaled, holding the smell inside for a moment. By core, he needed a drink. Two. The blaring of the alarm startled Cass awake. He fell off his shelf of a bed, smacking his face on the hard metal floor. Box, shut that thing off, he yelled into his communicator. Sorry, boss. Just thought you'd like to know we're five minutes out from Devil's Gate. No, you're not. Cass replied, pushing himself back up. You're right, I'm not, his voice said through the overhead. I'll be up there in a minute, Cass grumbled, shutting his calm down and moving to the sparse sink in his room. One would think as captain he'd get the nicest room on the ship, but no, those were reserved for the guests. It was the only thing he had to offer over other couriers. And it didn't help, his competition kept upping the ante on him. Now he was expected to have vid screens and fancy soap in every hab suite. That, combined with his interest payments to Vina, and pretty soon he wouldn't be able to pull a profit at all. Cass splashed some water on his face, then cupped some and drank it greedily, his weak old stubble scratching his hand. He'd managed to finish off one bottle of scorb from his stash before passing out but it always made his throat dry. Not to mention the always-present headache. Headaches were par for the course, whether he was hungover or not. He checked himself in the mirror and ran his hand through his dark hair a few times to adjust his stubbornness. Once marginally satisfied by what he saw, he made his way to the bridge. Busy today, Bach said as he entered the cockpit. They had exited undercurrent space to find at least 40 ships in various positions around Devil's Gate. The station itself was quite large, a giant upside-down domed disk a couple of kilometers across. Below the disk were dozens of levels for things like entertainment, shipping, storage, or habitation. 
Devil's Gate was one of the larger stations in this part of Sargan space. Anywhere to park? Cass asked, surveying the top of the disc. I think I can squeeze in, Box said, jerking the controls. The ship lurched forward at considerable speed, and Cass grabbed his seat so he didn't fly off. RE-12, slow your approach vector, a voice snapped over the comm systems. Acknowledged, Box said before cutting the comm. He sped up. There, right there, Cass said, bravely taking one hand off the chair to point at a space where another similar-sized ship was leaving. A third ship was waiting to take the spot above it. Can you make it in? Watch me. Box's metallic fingers running over the control pad, while the other hand remained on the throttle. The parked ship pulled away as Box came screaming into the airspace. The ship waiting above them made a move to take the spot. Not today, Box said, jerking the ship around so the rear thrusters decelerated them instantly as he dropped the ship into place, landing it perfectly. I knew there was a reason I gave you the piloting job, Cass replied. There was no way a human, even an amazing pilot, could have pulled that move off. It's what I do, Box replied, his glowing yellow eyes flickering with appreciation. Cass was glad Box didn't have a human face. He'd never wipe a smug look off it. Box turned the comm back on, only for it to light up with three different feeds coming in at once. The station flight controller was angry with you, Box said, as is the ship we cut off. A Rustian, I think. He paused a minute. And the ship we almost clipped on the way in would like a word as well. Cass rolled his eyes. It was your doing. You deal with it, he replied. I'm going to find Maddox. Cass initiated the rest of the docking procedures, making sure they had a hard lock to the station. If you think I'm missing that, you've gone crazy, boss, Box said in one of his accents. I told you, stop doing that, Cass replied. Sorry, boss, Box replied in his normal voice. Docking procedures complete. I'm sure these guys can wait a while. He cut the comms again, shutting the ship down. Come on, Cass said. Let's get out there before he finds out we're here. I don't want to spook him. The hypervader doors opened on level 35. It was primarily an entertainment level, with a few spaces reserved for goods and storage. But it was also Maddox's favorite level, where all the gambling tables were. If he was anywhere on this station, it would be here. They got off the lift with a dozen other people, mostly human, but a few non. Cass had noticed one of the Erustians on the lift eyeing him suspiciously, and he couldn't help but wonder if they had been on the ship Box had cut off. The only problem with pissing off an Erustian was they were, on average, over two meters tall and all muscle. Not to mention the hard pieces of bone or hoof growing out of their fingers, so when they made a fist and hit you, it felt like being hit by a sharp brick. It was not an experience Cass looked forward to repeating, and he made sure to avoid eye contact. Once they were out of the lift, the Arustians had gone their own way, while he and Box made their way down the main promenade, checking the different establishments for Maddox. He won't be hard to find. Cass tapped his sidearm underneath his jacket just to confirm it was still there, and he hadn't accidentally left it on his ship. It was a weapon of his own design, a Class L boom cannon, the only one in existence, of course, it was probably illegal to have a weapon that not only fired a plasma pulse, but a projectile at the same time. But it wasn't as if the Sargans were strict on weapon control. It was in their best interest for people to arm themselves out here, because it meant squabbles might turn into firefights. Firefights meant less competition on quality goods, and the Commonwealth had no problem with that. I dare say, Box emulated in a bad British accent, I do believe I've found him. He pointed through a window of the next establishment. Beyond the crowd was a man of medium build, blonde hair pulled into a ponytail, spinning one of the letra wheels. He proclaimed something in a drunken slur, causing the women on each of his arms to burst into manufactured laughter. Maddox, Cass said under his breath as he narrowed his eyes. 
He pushed his way into the crowded and noisy room, box right behind him. The speakers blared some electronic noise from Ashook or some other coalition planet, while the smell of the room was a combination of body odor, perfume, and alcohol, all jumbled together. Cass suppressed the urge to stop by the bar first, and instead pushed through the crowd, moving people out of the way. Most were too drunk to care. His gaze didn't leave Maddox, who only continued to spin the wheel before downing a gulp from his considerable glass. As Cass reached the second closest letra table, Maddox finally locked eyes with him, and his expression went cold. He dropped his glass, turned, and took off running in the opposite direction, leaving the women surprised at his sudden departure. Cass was ready for it. In three steps, he vaulted the letter table and broke into a sprint after Maddox, who pushed his way through one of the back doors to the establishment. Adrenaline surged through Cass's system and pushed the last remnants of the headache away. Box, go around, Cass yelled, pushing through the same door. But he didn't check to see if Box had heard him or not. He wasn't about to let this man get away again. Cass found himself in a long hallway filled with chemical, industrial, and mechanical equipment. The door had soundproofed the noise from getting into the casino, but in here it was loud enough to obscure someone's footsteps. Maddox could have gone in either direction, and there was no sign of him. Cass glanced down. A puddle of green discharge covered a small part of the floor, and leading away from it was one footprint every meter or so. Maddox had caught one foot in the puddle. "'He's gone to the east,' Cass said into his calm. "'Understood,' Box replied. He wasn't sure where Box had gone, but he hoped he had a better understanding of the layout of this place than Maddox did. Cass followed the footprints until they began to dry out, causing him to slow. He didn't want to miss anything. The noise wasn't as bad this far down. There had been a gravity generator right behind the casino, and those tended to put out a lot of ambient noise. Probably a backup. In case the station lost power, the casino could keep everyone's chips where they were. Total gravity loss inside a money haven like that could turn into a bloodbath. The sound of metal hitting metal echoed through the hallway, and Cass took off toward the sound. It wasn't far away. As he rounded the corner at a T-junction, he saw someone stumbling down the hallway. It didn't take him long to catch up. Maddox glanced behind him and, with a panicked look on his face, tried to pick up speed, only to trip over his own feet and fall face first into the wall. Box appeared at the other end of the hallway. Looks like you didn't need me after all, Box called. Cass didn't respond only approached Maddox, who moaned as he tried to push himself back up to a standing position again. Cass grabbed his jacket from behind, jerking him into a standing position, then swiveled the man around and threw him against the wall. Maddox winced and slid back down. His eyes were half closed. Oh, no, you don't. Cass grabbed him and kept him upright. Did you really think you could get away with it, Theo? You don't steal another courier's money. Box came up behind Cass. I... I needed it, Maddox said in a pitiful voice. You needed it, Cass replied. For what? Gambling? You needed to throw away my money? No, nah, no. Nah. It's not like that, Maddox said, his words slurred. I was doing really good on the tables. I don't care if you're a millionaire. Cass replied, you don't steal from me. Maddox smirked and put his hand on Cass's shoulder, but Cass brushed it away. Yeah, but you're okay, Cass. You won't kill me like those other guys. You're the only one I can steal from. Oh, yeah? Cass said, pulling his boom cannon from under his jacket and pressing it to Maddox's temple. You want to test that out? Cass caught Box beginning to reach for him, but the robot apparently thought better of it and pulled back. Maddox began sobbing uncontrollably. Come on, Cass, he pleaded. You don't want to kill me. We've been in this for a long time together. It'll never happen again, I promise. Please. 
Cass pressed the tip of the gun harder into Maddox's skull, but his finger remained off the trigger. I'll give you everything I've won. You can have it all, Maddox pleaded. Cass waited a beat, watching the pathetic man. His eyes were slammed shut, as if he expected the hand of death at any second. Cass pulled the gun away and reholstered it. All of it. If you steal from me again, I know, I know. Maddox rushed his words, putting his hands out. Never again. Thank you. I knew you were one of the good ones. Ten minutes later, the three of them had returned to the casino. Cass more than once propping Maddox up so he could keep walking along the way. Cash it all in, Maddox yelled to the tender on the other side of the ornate gate. He pressed his thumb to the small pad in front of him. All of it, sir, the robotic tender said. Yes, all of it, Maddox pronounced, sticking his chest out. Cass shot a glance to Box, shaking his head. Here you are, sir. The tender handed Maddox a receipt, showing his full balance. Cass snatched it away from his hand as soon as they were clear of the tender. What the hell is this? Cass asked, shoving Maddox back. Remarkably, he stayed on his feet. I thought you said you were doing well on the tables. I did, Maddox protested. This is the best I've ever done. There is less than a quarter of my money here, Cass replied, his body tensing. That's all you have left? Maddox shrugged, then stumbled down into a chair beside him. It's what I owe you, he slurred. Then he lurched forward, and his head hit the table in front of him. A soft snore came from his mouth. Cass rubbed his temples. His headache had returned. I should have shot him. Probably, Box said. Cass looked at the slip. It had Maddox's transfer number on it, which meant all he needed was a scant of a man's thumb to get the money back into his account. I'm not leaving here empty-handed, Cass replied. Grab him. Let's go find a terminal. As you command, sire. Box bent and hoisted the unconscious man over his shoulders. Three. I don't believe this, Cass said, staring at the terminal outside the casino. Maddox lay in a heap beside the machine, still snoring. Don't tell me. He was lying, and he's actually ridiculously wealthy, Box prompted. He's got less money in his account than I do, Cass replied. His winnings are pretty much it. He tapped a few controls, confirming the account status. Maddox was dead broke. What about his ship? Box asked. Highly leveraged, from what I can tell. I could take it and get at least a portion back of what I'm due. Cass gripped the sides of the terminal so hard his knuckles turned white. Which leaves him stranded here. Box scoffed. It was a strange sound coming from a robot. You already know what you're going to do. Can you just do it already so we can leave? You go back to the ship, Cass said. I'll take care of this. Box hesitated, then left him alone with Maddox. The rest of the promenade was fairly busy, and he disappeared into the crowd. Cass turned back to the terminal and transferred Maddox's winnings into his own account, using Maddox's thumb to confirm the transfer. He should take the ship. It would serve Maddox right for betraying him. But Cass couldn't do it. He couldn't leave the man stranded, regardless of what he'd done. He shut down the terminal, then hunched over and patted at the drunk man's jacket. All he had on him was a small data recorder in his inside pocket. Cass smacked him across the cheek. Maddox startled. What? I'm taking this, Cass said, holding the recorder in front of Maddox's eyes. He'd get a pittance for it, but he didn't care. It was something. Don't steal from me again. You got it, Maddox slurred before falling asleep again. Cass stood and made his way down the wide corridor. Security would come get him and let him sleep it off in the drunk tank. Cass wished he was ruthless enough to have taken Maddox's ship. 
it would have gone a long way to settling his debt. He could have broken it down for parts, sold them off one by one, and doubled his profit. But he wasn't built that way. Despite his current situation, it wasn't how he was going to live what was left of his life. He needed to be better than that. Cass found another terminal a few shops down. He didn't want to make a secure transfer with a drunk and unconscious man leaning against the terminal, especially when it was as important as this. After a quick log on, he confirmed the money was in his account, and he transferred almost all of it to Vina. He didn't want to think about what would have happened if Maddox had burned through more than her cut. Yeah, Vina, you know that last job with the princess? I don't have your portion. If you'll spare the beheading for a few more weeks, I can probably scrounge up another payment. He made sure at the end of the transfer to submit his best wishes as well. And a merry fuck you too, he said under his breath. A man passing by had turned his head as Cass spoke, and Cass leaned over the terminal closer until he was gone. You better appreciate this, he added, unsure if he was talking to Vina or Maddox. On the way back through the station, Cass stopped off at the exchange shop to turn in the data recorder. As expected, he received a pittance for it, but at least it was enough for a couple of drinks at the bar. As he passed back by the casino, he was glad to see security had already come and picked up Maddox. The man was nowhere to be seen. Drunken and disorderly people collapsed outside of establishments were generally bad for business. Cass made his way down a few more doors until he came to an establishment called The Pit. It was a place he knew well and frequented often, though not as often as Maddox hit the casinos. I'll take a firebrand and a tooth melter. Cass plopped down on one of the stools and pressed his thumb to the pad. A robot bartender, similar in appearance to Box, glided over and poured the drinks. So, you have any good jokes lately? Cass asked the bartender. The robot's yellow eyes flashed while he continued to pour and mix the drinks. Two blind men walk into a bar, the third one ducks. Cass eyed the robot, wishing he'd kept his mouth shut. Maybe he shouldn't have told Box to go back to the ship. He was good for some entertainment when he wasn't in one of his moods. The bartender slid the drinks toward him. Tipping is not a planet in the Caladon system, he said. I'll try the drinks first, then we'll see, Cass replied, sipping the firebrand. True to its name, it burned all the way down. But accompanied with that was the sense of relief, knowing he wouldn't have to dwell on thoughts of how to pay for the repairs to his ship without any more money. In a few minutes, he wouldn't even care. and Based on how much he got for that data recorder, he should be able to suck at least a few hours out of this place. Cass wasted no time in taking the tooth melter a sickeningly sweet drink that helped chase the firebrand. The old bartender hadn't done a bad job. Maybe not tip-worthy, but certainly not bad by any means. Cass waved to the robot. One more round. After that, he'd have to switch to something he could nurse. Not often you see rugged ship captains order fruit drinks, a female voice said beside him. Cass wheeled around, dizzy by all the alcohol infusing his blood, and it took him a moment to comprehend what he was seeing. She was a mercenary, tall, and wearing a long cloak that reached the backs of her knees. Her dark brown hair was done into a braid that fell down her left shoulder, and her emerald eyes glittered like the jewels they stole the name from. But the most noticeable thing about her was the broadsword strapped to her back, "'Excuse me?' Cass said. "'Your choice of drink. It's unusual,' she said. "'Perhaps his luck hadn't run out after all. "'How often did beautiful women approach him in a place as seedy as this? "'Though the sword was concerning. "'Cass leaned back away from the bar to get a better look at the weapon strapped to her back. "'He didn't recognize the hilt. "'What's with the sword?' I use it to cut off the heads of my enemies, 
the woman said, deadpan. Hiding his expression, Cass leaned forward again and took the second firebrand the bartender had poured. Join me? He knocked the drink back. I don't drink. Of course you don't. So much for luck. Cass took the second tooth melter and knocked it back as well. What is that supposed to mean? The woman frowned. Nothing, Cass said, waving to the bartender again, who'd barely gone two meters. Give me a rank, whatever you have on tap. The bartender nodded and glided away. You really should clean yourself up, the woman snapped. Cass screwed up his face. I'm sorry. Is there something I can do for you? Since you're obviously not looking for any company, would you please leave me alone? The woman's eyes narrowed. Your demeanor is unbecoming, she said, especially for a captain. Cass sighed. Let me guess. Vina sent you. If she wants another courier job, she's going to have to wait. I need repairs, and I... Vina didn't send me, the woman interrupted, crossing her arms. I want to hire you freelance. Cass couldn't help but laugh. You want me to work for a mercenary? You really don't know who I am, do you? You're Captain Caspian Rabot. That's all I need to know. And who might you be? Cass asked. She stiffened. Evelyn. Does Evelyn have a last name? The bartender brought the rank. It was tinged green with a good amount of foam on the top. Just how Cass liked it. He took a long draw from the mug. That's not important, she replied. Well, Evie, I hate to disappoint you, but my ship is in no condition to be doing freelance work. Not to mention, if my boss found out I was making money without cutting her in, she'd cut me off, if you get my drift. He took another draw. Sorry, you'll have to find yourself another captain. It didn't escape his notice she bristled when he called her Evie. Evelyn took one look at his glass and then at him again. It appears you're quite comfortable where you are then, she said, her eyes boring into him. A wave of shame bloomed up from within, and it took every last ounce of the rank to drown it before it became unbearable. But the entire time he drank, he didn't take his eyes off Evie and she didn't take hers off him, though they were filled with disgust. Cass took a breath and slammed the mug back down on the metal counter. Evie sneered and turned away, disappearing through the doors. That had been the right call, hadn't it? He couldn't take a mercenary's job even if he wanted to, not with his ship in its current state. It needed at least a dozen new parts before he was confident he could pull anything off. Perhaps the universe was reaching out with one hand, trying to give him a chance. Then again, perhaps Vina already knew about his troubles and was testing his allegiance to her. But Evie hadn't seemed much like Vina's type. In fact, she hadn't even seemed that much like a mercenary, except for that head-chopping comment. Regardless, the woman carried a sword. Not the kind of person he wanted to trifle with. No, he needed to keep his head down and figure out what he was going to do about his cash flow problem. But even that could wait. Cass motioned to the bartender one more time. And if he wasn't sure it was impossible, he could have sworn he saw the bartender glance at him with exasperation but robots didn't have emotive faces. Except, maybe spending all this time with Box had taught him how to read them better. Yes, sir? The bartender asked, approaching him. Definitely some malice in there. Had to be. One more round, Cass said. Four. The alarm tore through the air, and Cass shot straight out of bed, puking on what remained of his sheets. Damn it! 
Cass wiped his mouth. The smell of vomit permeated the room. Turn that fucking thing off, Cass yelled in the comm. The alarm went silent. Everything all right, boss? Box said through the speaker. It would be a lot better if you stopped waking me up with an ear-splitting siren. He clutched his pounding head, recalling the brief image of a woman with a sword. Had he dreamed her? Sorry, boss, but I do love hearing you wretch in the mornings, Box said. Cass coughed and spit what remained of the vomit into the spreading pile on his bed. He cleaned it up later. What time is it? Nine hours have passed since I brought you back to the ship, Box replied. You need to hydrate. Cass pushed the sheets to the side and staggered to his sink, splashing water on his face and down his throat. It didn't help. You brought me back? Carried. You were too drunk to walk. Again. Tell me I didn't do anything stupid, Cass said hanging his head over the sink as the water droplets dripped down his face into the basin. No more than usual. That was a relief. Cass hadn't meant to let it get out of control. He hadn't even thought he'd had enough money to buy that many drinks. He'd underestimated how much he'd gotten for the data recorder. I'll be up there in a minute, Cass said. It was hard to concentrate under the shower. Each stream of water felt like an exhaust blast on his skull. He shouldn't have gone overboard, but what else was he supposed to do? He was almost as bad off as Maddox. At least Maddox had a functioning ship to make runs. Cass would be lucky to launch from Devil's Gate at all. And he still had no clue what to do about his money problem. No. He knew what he needed to do. He just didn't want to do it. Cass finished the shower and threw on his cleanest clothes. If he had to do this, he wanted to at least make a good impression. Morning, he grumbled, ambling into the cockpit. Box's attention was focused on a net drama playing on one of the screens. Coffee is brewing in the kitchen. Sleep well? With each step, a miniature shockwave blasted its way through his brain. Don't start. What's the ship's status? Box paused the feed and turned to him. Thruster 4 on the port side is dead. You have two magnetic coils that need to be replaced, and the undercurrent targeting system is off by 12%. It will need to be switched out with a newer model, unless you want to get lost in the deep reaches of space. That would almost be preferable. Cass slumped down to the captain's chair. Really, it wasn't the captain's chair. This ship was too small to have anything so grand. Box always took the pilot's seat, so if he was really honest with himself, it was the co-pilot's chair. He was the only one who thought of it differently. Maybe I can take a look at the targeting system. Realign it in some way. Hab Suite 2 has a pressurization problem, but it's localized, Box added. Also, two of the landing gear struts are rusted from that landing on Calfor Straxus. Which, if you remember, I warned you about. Okay, okay, stop, Cass said, putting one hand up and rubbing his temple with the other. How much do we need for repairs, minimum, to get the ship in working condition? If we ignore Hab Suite 2 and a few other non-essentials, approximately 425,000 Cassop. Cass slapped his hands to his face and screamed into them, despite the pain it caused his head. When he removed them, Box was staring at him. Would you like me to leave? No, Cass said, standing. I hoped I wouldn't have to go to Vena, but I don't see any other way out of this. Do you? The robot shrugged. It's not too late to take Maddox's ship. We could leave him yours. I'm not giving up the reasonable excuse. This ship has been the one constant in my life for the past five years. What about me? Box complained. You weren't you in the beginning. You were just like all the rest. 
Cass made his way into the kitchen and poured the slimy coffee from the maker into a chipped cup. It might as well be tar. Still, he downed it as quickly as he could without burning his throat. Box appeared at the entrance. I'm serious. There are people worse than you out there. People who deserve to have their ships stolen. It isn't like you'd have to make it a regular thing. Cash shook his head. I'm starting to think you're right. Making an honest living out here is impossible. I've already had to concede to carry Vina's goods along with the passengers. But it looks like that might not even be enough anymore. He placed the cup in the auto cleanser. But I'm not taking another courier ship. You seemed pretty serious with Maddox last night, Box said. That was to scare him. Sometimes I think he's worse at this than I am. Except he's willing to break a few rules. Cass turned to the one window in the kitchen. Beyond was the surface of the station. Hundreds of ships docked beside one another. And after that, the blackness of space stretched to infinity, only occasionally interrupted by a speck of white. It could be worse, he said. She could have me working down on Vitar. At least here I'm in space. Even if it is the same few routes over and over again. The thought of the woman with a sword crossed his mind again, and he turned around. Box? The robot looked up. What would you think about taking a mercenary job? Fina would cut off your balls, he replied. He arched an eyebrow, only if she found out. If you're willing to risk it, I'm not sure I'd be so careless with my genitals, if I had them. Let's take a moment and be thankful you don't. Cass immediately wiped that image from his mind. I think something happened last night. It must not have been up to your usual standards. I didn't catch it on the vid feeds before I came to pick you up. Box moved into the kitchen, his yellow eyes blinking in what Cass recognized as amusement. No, not that. A woman approached me, a mercenary, said she had a job for me. What did you do? I think I laughed in her face. Cass shook his head. I don't know. Maybe I imagined her. I was already drunk when she came up. A random mercenary comes up and offers you a job out of the blue. You, Box said. I agree. It was probably an alcohol-induced hallucination brought on by your fear of facing Vina and perhaps even guilt over what you did to poor Maddox. You just said I should steal his ship. Doesn't mean I can't feel sorry for him, especially after you pointed a gun in his face. Tisk, tisk, Captain. Cass's eyes narrowed. I really hate you sometimes. No, you don't. If I weren't here, you'd end up talking to the coffee maker, and nobody wants that. Box turned and left the kitchen. Thanks for the help, Cass called after him, knowing it was futile. I guess I'll go off and sign the rest of my life away. Box didn't reply. He'd probably already plugged back into his net drama. Cass smoothed the front of his wrinkled shirt, then grabbed his worn jacket from the floor and dusted it off before slipping it on. He hated himself for what he was about to do. Even if he wanted the mercenary job, he didn't have the ability to do anything worthwhile, not unless this possibly fictitious woman paid for all his repairs. As he strolled out of the ship and down through the airlock into the connecting corridor, he winced as he imagined the look on Vina's face when he asked her for a loan. She'd toy with him, that much was guaranteed, and she'd hem and haw over it and try to make him think he wasn't worth the extra risk. But the truth was, she'd love it. Because it would mean Cass would be indebted to her so deep, he'd never be able to get out. He'd be a part of the Sargan Commonwealth for the rest of his life, and there was little he could do about it. It wasn't as if he could go back to the Coalition, what with the warrants for his arrest and all. Not that he ever would, anyway. Cass made his way through the main promenade, looking exactly as it had last night. The only difference being, 
it wasn't as crowded as it had been the night before. It seemed everyone only came out later in the station cycle, which was synced up with the closest planet, Vitar. Vitar had a 22-hour day. It was better than some of the more exotic planets, but also made adjusting difficult. He kept the reasonable excuse on a 20-hour cycle, despite operating in this sector of space for over five years. It was something he didn't want to let go of. Not yet. As Cass passed the pit with zero memory of Box retrieving him from the place, he happened to glance over, only to catch sight of the same woman from last night. He almost stumbled, but managed to keep his composure at his stride. She was leaning up against the side of the doorway, her arms crossed with a long sword still strapped to her back. As he passed, her gaze bore directly into him, following him down the corridor. Cass thought about calling out to tell her to mind her own business, but thought better of it. Instead, he turned away and focused on his destination, Venus Chambers. He hadn't made an appointment, but it wouldn't matter. She'd see him, if for no other reason than to give him a hard time. It seemed to be her favorite pastime. Before Cass rounded the corner, he risked one look back toward the pit, only to find the doorway empty. Finally, go find someone else to bother. Maybe he should mention to Vina he was being headhunted by a couple mercenaries. See if she wouldn't up his pay. But why would she? By core, he'd be lucky if she didn't decide to impound his ship. But that definitely wasn't happening. He tapped the boom cannon under his jacket. No one was getting that ship. A pair of strong hands grabbed his lapels, yanking him inside a room adjacent to the corridor. He hadn't even seen them coming. By the time he got his bearings and the fog of his hangover allowed his eyes to adjust, he found a very long and sharp blade pressed to his neck. And the person holding it was none other than Evie. Five. Cass breathed heavily as Evie pressed the blade to his skin. Is this because I said no? By Garth, your breath stinks, Evie replied, screwing up her face. Ever hear of a mint? Cass surveyed the room. It was a normal hab suite with a bed and adjacent room with a head and shower. But it appeared unused. A window on the opposite side of the room showed the starfield beyond. I'm not really into the kinky stuff. If you're going to make me do this, you might be dis- Shut up, Evie said. How any woman would want to have sex with you is beyond me. Then, if you'll just excuse me, Cass said, I have a meeting, and I don't want to put it off any longer. Otherwise, I'll lose my nerve and have to pay another visit to the bar. Evie lessened the pressure on the sword, still keeping it close to his throat. I don't care about your schedule she replied. You're coming with me whether you like it or not. You sure you're not into kinky stuff? Cass asked. Because the sword seems to be turning one of us on, and it's not me. She withdrew the weapon, sheathing it with a simple, practiced movement. Cass worked to hide his awe. My name is Lieutenant Commander Evelyn Diazol of the Sovereign Coalition of Aligned Systems. I was ordered to retrieve you from Sargan space, and that's what I'm going to do she said, as if it was obvious. Upon hearing the words Sovereign Coalition of Aligned Systems, Cass recoiled, pressing himself further into the wall, despite the lack of a weapon making him do so. I don't think so, lady. You don't have a choice, she replied, matter-of-factly. No, you don't have a choice, he said, heat rising in his cheeks. I'm not part of the coalition anymore. I can do whatever I want. Mr. Rabot, she said, her voice dripping with disdain, I don't think you understand the pre- I understand perfectly, Evie, he said, pushing past her. The coalition decides maybe I'm better off back in jail, so they send an errand girl to do their job for them. I don't think so. You'll actually have to use that sword on me if you want me to come back with you. Jail? What are you talking about? I was ordered to bring you back to Coalition Space, to Starbase 8, 
She narrowed her eyes. Why were you in jail? You don't know? He scoffed. That's surprising. And here I thought I was infamous. I'm sure someone will tell you if you ask. But it's not going to be me, because I'm not going back. Until recently, I was stationed out near Epsilon Lyre. We don't get a lot of gossip out there. She seemed to reset herself. Regardless, it doesn't matter. The Admiral made this mission a priority one, which means come with me willingly or unconscious, your choice. Neither. He grabbed the handle of his pistol, but kept it in the holster. I told you, you'll have to take me in a body bag if you want to have a chance of getting me back into Coalition space. Evie's eyes went to the pistol, and she stiffened. He hadn't even meant to do it. It was a reflex. But if the Coalition had sent her, how many other officers were out there on the station waiting for him? She might be right. He might not have a choice. If she was alone, he had a good chance of getting past her. But if there was a small army on the other side of that door waiting to ambush him, he'd never have a chance. And the longer he stood here arguing with her, the more paranoid he became about it. Cass released the handle of the gun, leaving it in its holster. Evie relaxed her shoulders. Look, he said, I don't have a quarrel with you. But if you try to take me back, I'll be forced to shoot you in the leg. And neither of us wants that. Don't make me do it. She seemed intrigued by the prospect. I have my orders. How many more are there? To take me back, he asked, when she cocked her head as if she didn't understand what he was talking about. Just me? Cass nodded for a moment. I have no doubt you know how to use that sword. But I also know you won't use it on me. Not if you're really from the Coalition. He turned toward the door. If you want my advice, he said, get out while you still can, before they make you do something you can't take back. He took another breath, then pushed the pad beside the door, and it slid open. It was a gamble, turning his back on her, but he needed to get out of there, to get out from under her accusatory stare. To his astonishment, the door slid closed behind him, sealing her back inside. Cass's hands shook. Coming so close to the Coalition after five years of nothing had rattled him more than he'd expected. He hadn't set foot across Coalition space ever since the incident. As far as he was concerned, the crime-ridden, slimy underbelly of the Sargan Commonwealth was much safer. Everything in the Coalition was too... structured, too easy. At least that's how they made it seem. That was the whole recruitment slogan. Come join the Sovereign Coalition of Aligned Systems. Share in our resources. Eliminate your planet's problems. Yeah. And the only cost was any sense of self-determination. The supporters would disagree with him, saying not only did people have the right to choose whatever they wanted, they could do so without consequence. Want to be a painter? Great. The coalition would provide for all your expenses. Prefer to lay on some exotic beach for the rest of your life? No problem. The Coalition had you covered. Want to explore the stars in an advanced starship? Absolutely. Have the time of your life. Except, sometimes you might have to do a few things you might find questionable. We are a military organization, after all. And there has to be a trade-off for all those painters and people lying on the beach all day. It all has to even out in the end. Ugh. Cass tried shaking his hands out as he made his way back to the main corridor. He couldn't see Vina like this. She'd play him like a Valderan skern. No, he needed to get his head straight. He passed the pit again, but the last thing he needed at the moment was more alcohol. He'd made the mistake of meeting with Vina drunk once, and it had not gone well. Apparently, it was difficult to make contract negotiations for what you're agreeing to haul for someone when you're intoxicated. 
he was still paying for that one. No, he needed to go back to his ship, get his head straight. Otherwise, he might as well curl up beside the wall like Maddox and wait for station security. Six. That was quick, Box said as Cass re-entered the ship. He'd moved to the kitchen and had switched off his regular net drama to some other program. I didn't get to Venus. That... Cass paused. What are you watching? Hmm? Box said, looking up. Oh, this? It's an old program called World on Fire. It's about this woman, Janet, whose husband has been cheating on her, but she doesn't know it. And then her teenage daughter finds out he was actually cheating with her best friend. But she doesn't want to tell her mom because she thinks her mom will think it's her fault because she's the one who invites Rebecca over all the time and it will tear their family apart. And there's all this drama and it's just great. It was on for 47 years. I'm on season three. Cass stared at him, dumbfounded. You know what? I'm sorry I asked. He rubbed his temples again. I need to go lie down. I assume nothing else is broken in the thirty minutes I've been gone? I don't know. I've been engrossed. Box turned his attention back to the display. As Cass made his way out of the kitchen, Box called to him again. What stopped you from reaching Vina? The smell of the bar? No, smartass, Cass said, returning to the entryway, his mouth firmly set. That woman showed up again. I didn't dream her up after all. She's from the Coalition. Box reached up, turned off the screen, then swiveled around to face Cass. Spill it. Cass fumbled a moment. There's nothing to spill. The Coalition wants me back. I said no. End of story. Box took a step forward. You said no? You think they're just going to let you go about your merry business? What the Coalition wants, Cass waved him off. I know. And as soon as I splash some water on my face, I'm going back to meet Vina. I'll get the money to fix the ship, and then we're gone. The Coalition can't operate in Sargan's space forever without being detected. And if she tries to stop me again, I'll just blow her cover. She'll have to go back empty-handed. What's her name? Box asked, reaching over for the portable terminal in the kitchen. It booted up easily. Lieutenant Commander Evie Diazol. Evelyn Diazol, Cass corrected. Evie, huh? Don't start. Box's fingers raced over the interface, breaking through the Coalition's primary firewall in seconds. I knew there was a reason I kept you around. I know. It's my winning personality, Box replied. Here, Lieutenant Commander Evelyn Diazol, born 2568 on Sisk. That's pretty far outside the inner ring. And a hell of a long way from here, Cass added. Enter the Navy Academy at the age of 18, quickly rose through the ranks. Her parents were, are, in the Coalition as well. But it looks like their files have been redacted. I can't seem to find anything on them. Anything else pertinent? Cass asked. The more he knew, the better. Despite his warnings to her, he knew he hadn't seen the last of the lieutenant commander. A few commendations for service. Her postings have been all over the place, but mostly around the outer rim. She stayed away from Horus and the central planets. Probably explains why she doesn't know about me, and why they chose her to bring me in. Lack of prejudice. Anyone else would have smashed your nose in first, Box said, his eyes flickering with laughter. Oh, she's also got one hell of a piloting record. She might even be able to keep up with me. Great, Cass sighed. So even if we do get off the station in one piece, she'll probably be waiting for us. He tapped his foot, pondering. See if you can locate any ships with a faint coalition signature. She'll have no doubt masked it. But maybe if we know what we're looking for, we can... Found it, Box replied. About half a kilometer away, Pad 076 Delta. 
It's tiny, a two-man shuttle with undercurrent capability. The Coalition has been busy, Cass said. Those were still in the development phase when I left. He stared at the screen. Pad 076 Delta. It wasn't that far away. He could get over there quickly enough. There was even a good chance he could get on board without triggering the alarm systems. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Probably not, Box replied, spinning back to face him. What if this is a good thing? What if they genuinely want you back? Not everything about the Coalition is bad, you know. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. Cass turned his back on Box, passing back through the entry into the corridor. Think about it, Box said, raising his voice to follow Cass down the hall. It's the perfect opportunity to get away from Vina. You'd have the Coalition's protection. Cass's face flushed. Yeah, all four walls, with ample amounts of bread and water. No thank you. I'd rather take the risk. What if it isn't to send you back to prison? Box asked. Let's be honest. We know what this is about. And if they aren't going to send me to prison, then the alternative is much worse. Either way, it's a bad deal. At least with Vina, I know what her motives are. I know she's trying to manipulate me. She's upfront about it. But the Coalition likes to pretend it is this giant, benevolent whale just gliding along, making sure everyone is safe, when really it's just another alpha predator. It will do anything and everything it needs to survive. The only difference is the Coalition lies to you about it. They'll pretend like nothing is wrong, that you will always be safe and secure and happy. And the truth is, there is no safe, secure, and happy. It doesn't exist. That's what most people in the Coalition don't realize. I'm not going back to that fantasy. I like it better in the real world. Tell me how you really feel about it, Box replied. I don't know why I even bother with you, Cass said, extricating himself from the situation. Box loved to get him fired up. He just couldn't seem to help himself. You sure there isn't something you want to get off your chest? He called, his tone slightly mocking. Cass ignored him, trailing the hallway down to his quarters. He opened the door to his room, only for the stench of vomit to smack him in the face. He had to suppress the urge to relapse, and instead went to the small ensuite and closed the door. The stench in here wasn't as bad, but still present. He might just have to incinerate those sheets. He ran the tap, then splashed a generous amount of water on his face, noticing his hands had stopped quivering. The anger over the coalition had won out over any fear they might actually be able to take him back. Water ran down the sides of his neck, seeping into his shirt underneath. He took an extra few minutes to clean his teeth before giving himself a last once-over. He could do this. So what if it meant he knew how the rest of his life would turn out? There were worse fates. Maybe in another ten, fifteen years working for Vina, he might even be able to move up in the organization. Though, he shuddered at the thought of what she required of her lieutenants. Perhaps it was best to stay in transport, to stay out in space. Wide, open space. This time Cass took the opposite direction outside the hard lock with his ship. Since Devil's Gate was a giant disk, it only made sense he'd get to Vena's by taking the long way around, except he had a stop to make first. The upper corridors weren't as spacious as the promenades of the lower levels, most of them having been designed with function in mind rather than comfort. More than once he had to duck under pipes and squeeze through small spaces to get to adjacent landing pads. The first thing through his mind was Claxians would have a hell of a time fitting through here. Which was an odd thought to have, considering he hadn't even seen a Claxian since his court-martial. But it seemed the appearance of Evie was drawing out all sorts of unwanted and repressed memories. Zero seven six Delta, Cass said to himself as he approached one of the locks. Let's see if anyone is home, or if you're still out there waiting for me. 
He pulled a scanner from his pocket and did a quick search for heat signatures, finding nothing out of the ordinary. The shuttle was remarkably small. Had she slept in it? Coalition space was at least five days away with the nearest undercurrent. He crept back into the lock itself, walking up the ramp to the shuttle door. All we have to do is make you think there's a coolant leak inside. Cass tapped a few commands on the access panel, and the door slid open. It was sparse, as all things Coalition tended to be. A small bench to his right doubled as a bed. A locker sat to his left, which had been left unlocked. He peeked inside to find three identical uniforms and a smattering of other personal items. A small door beside the locker led to the onboard utilities, also very clean and not smelling of vomit. The front of the ship had two chairs and a view screen. According to Box, all the Coalition had done was apply a layer of electronic paint and alter the engine signatures. It was enough to pass if anyone wasn't looking. But for someone with experience with Coalition ships, and shuttles in particular, he'd had no trouble identifying it. He'd almost forgotten what it was like. Shaking the thoughts away, Cass quickly went to work, removing one of the side panels to the shuttle to access the primary undercurrent generator. Two minutes later, and the system had been permanently disabled. She'd need either a brand new generator, which she'd have a hard time finding here without revealing she was Coalition, or wait for rescue. Either way, she wouldn't be following Cass once Pina approved the loan and all the parts were installed, neither of which would take more than half a day at most. Cass dusted off his hands, replaced the panel, and made his way back down into the lock careful to leave everything as he'd found it. One problem down, one to go. Seven. Taking the long way around to Vena's, Cass didn't pass the pit again, but he kept an eye out for Evie anyway. He wasn't about to be ambushed a second time, and she seemed to have some kind of superpower allowing her to get right in his way. At the same time, he practiced what he would say to Vina. He needed to be firm and yet grateful. He'd do what he had to do and get the hell out of the station. At least out there, he was in control. And while he didn't relish the idea of ferrying any more princesses across the Sargan Commonwealth, things could be a lot worse. Cass approached the giant cylindrical dampeners near the center of the station. They were at least 30 meters in height and ran up through multiple levels, but if not for them, any time a cosmic trench would pass through the system, every person on the station would go flying. He thought of them as gigantic metal guards, since they were situated on the opposite sides of the entrance to Venus section of the station, one of the most lavish and unnecessarily large spaces he'd ever seen. He approached the doors nestled between the dampeners and pressed his thumb to the pad. The twenty-meter-tall doors swung back, revealing the inner entrance, complete with human guard this time. He was tall, yet muscular, wearing a derby hat with what appeared to be the tip of a spear sticking out of the top. Court, Cass said, passing the guard standing beside the scanning portal. Rabo, Court replied, tapping a few buttons. Cass felt a tingle as the scanners electronically probed every part of his body. Gun? Court said, holding his hand out. Cass unholstered the boom cannon and slapped it into Court's hand, butt first. Do everyone a favor and keep the safety on, Cass said. Someone's feisty today, Court replied, placing the gun in a drawer which slid shut. You're gonna need it. Why? What's wrong this time? Court smiled, revealing two missing teeth and two more platinum replacements. Cass hadn't seen it, but another one of Vina's lieutenants told him Court pulled them himself. Apparently, he was working toward a set of specially engraved teeth. You'll find out. I just hope you haven't come to ask for anything. Cass sighed, pondering how far he could get the reasonable excuse before it completely fell apart. Thanks for the advice, Cass replied. 
Court hit another button, and a second set of doors opened, revealing what Cass referred to as the long walk. Past the second set of doors was a massive open room, 30 meters high, just like the dampeners. In front of him, a long walkway a hundred meters long, decorated with a red velvet carpet straight down the middle. On either side of the carpet, the floor extended another ten meters before dropping off into nothing. Below housed the guts of the station itself, and at least a 250-meter drop. Vina told him it was where she disposed of all the people who disappointed her over the years. She often joked it was becoming too full, which was impossible, as anything that fell was incinerated halfway down from the heat the station generated. Regardless, it provided a creepy atmosphere, with the orange glow emanating on both sides as her subjects, as she liked to call them, approached her. At the very end of the walk sat, what else, but a giant throne, complete with steps leading up to it. Behind the throne, more dampeners gave the room the appearance of a church with a very large organ. Cass grumbled to himself as he walked, not allowing himself to be intimidated by the space, or her for that matter. He'd never seen her actual quarters. This was just where she tended to do business. And considering she owned the station itself, it was only fitting she chose the center as her lair. Off to the left and right of the throne were areas where the floor was not missing and presumably led to her private sanctuary. Today, it looked as if he'd come at a good time. Typically, she was on the throne, mirror or console in hand, either preening herself or watching something entertaining. Though one time he'd walked in as she'd ordered an execution, watching as the man had been tossed over the edge. She had been in a particularly good mood that day. Cass marched along, taking less time than he normally did to get up to the throne. Rasp, you're looking well, he said to the light-skinned man standing off to the side with his hands clasped in front of him. Come back later, Rabo. Rasp replied in a deep voice. You don't want to be here today. I'll make it quick, Cass replied. Let me see her. Rasp shrugged. It's your life. He turned and disappeared behind one of the walls to the left. Cass waited off to the side of the stairs. He didn't like being directly in front of the throne. It felt wrong somehow. Too ominous. The only sounds were the occasional swoosh noises from the dampeners and the general hum of the station. Otherwise, it was silent, which was impressive for such a cavernous room. He imagined it could be quite peaceful in here. Maybe that's why she liked it. After all, it... And what does he want? The screech came from behind the wall where Rasp had disappeared. The relative calm of the room destroyed as Vina's voice echoed throughout the entire room, bouncing off every surface over and over again. The distinct sound of heels striking the floor made Cass glance up to see Vina appear from behind the wall. But this wasn't the typical, together, everything is in its place Vina. This was a frantic Vina, a side of her he'd never seen before. I don't fucking believe this, she huffed. She ignored him, making her way up the stairs to her throne, her long green dress dragging on the ground behind her, as it always did. Her dark hair, typically in some kind of ornate braid he could never figure out, fell over her bare shoulders, while her green crown remained perched on the top of her head. She had vibrant blue eyes, which complemented her dress, except today they were hidden behind a sheer veil attached to her crown. She adjusted herself, then sat in the throne, crossing her ankles and grasping the armrests on either side, before turning to look at him. Approach, she said. Cass swallowed his pride and made his way up the steps, stopping at the very last one to take a knee. High Priestess Vina, he said, bowing his head. Caspian Rabo, what a surprise! Her tone caught him off guard, but he wasn't about to let it derail his plans. Vina liked pomp and circumstance, and it wasn't out of the ordinary to spend at least five minutes singing her praises. 
but everything about this meeting seemed out of the ordinary. He wasn't sure what to expect. I'd like to thank you for taking the time... Save it, Rabo, she snapped. We both know why you're here, so get on with it and leave me be. I have more important matters to attend to. Cass raised his head and stood, drawing a deep breath. I need a loan. She let out one short but loud laugh and sat back in her chair, glaring at him. Alone. Her eyes dashed to the left. And what, pray tell, would you need with a loan? My ship is in need of repairs, and if you wish for me to continue making supply runs for you, you'll help me out. A wicked smile spread across Vina's face. This was more like it. This was what he'd expected. She relaxed her shoulders, not releasing him from her gaze. And just how much do you need, if I were to grant such a request? Her long nails tapped against the armrests in a strange rhythm. Four hundred and twenty-five thousand, Cass replied. It was a lot. They both knew it was a lot. But he wasn't going to back down now. Oh, Caspian, she said, her voice suddenly saccharine. That's an awful lot of money. She tapped the armrests again. And what might I receive in return for this investment? Extend my contract until it's paid in full with interest. Vina seemed to consider it, then turned her head to the side, revealing a series of earrings sparkling in the light just underneath her hair. I heard you had a little encounter with our mutual friend Maddox yesterday. You could call it that. What was she getting at? As I understand it, he wasn't very fair to you. She turned back to him, her grin widening. And you had to take matters into your own hands. Things got heated. Your point? Cass asked. It just seems to me that my little boy scout is growing up, she said, her voice still dripping with honey. Maybe you're ready for something more serious. He struggled to maintain his composure. I'm fine out where I am, ferrying diplomats and your other illustrious guests. You need someone you can trust out there. Suddenly, coming here seemed like a bad idea. He hadn't considered she might take the opportunity to renegotiate his contract. There were plenty of couriers. She could always use someone else. And why would she give him a loan when she could easily reassign him? He mentally slapped himself in the face. How could he have been so stupid not to see this before? Her long fingers traced imaginary lines on the armrest. I don't know, Caspian. I hate the thought of you out there, all alone. Just you, your ship, and that pathetic robot, your only source of company. She leaned forward. I think we can find you something much more suited to your particular skills. That's enough, a female voice announced from somewhere off to his left. Vina recoiled as if she'd been bitten, the smirk on her face transforming into a visage of loathing. Stepping out from behind the same wall Vina had appeared from earlier was none other than Evie, arms crossed and a smug look on her face. Eight. What are you doing here? Cass said, stiffening. And here I was hoping it was all a bad dream. Vina said, examining her long nails. "'What is going on?' Cass asked, unsure of anything at this point. "'Why would Evie be conferring with Vina? "'Her story about being in the Coalition hadn't been a ploy. "'Box confirmed that much, "'which meant she had either gone rogue "'or was more determined than Cass gave her credit for. "'This mercenary,' Vina said, "'disdain dripping from the word, "'has purchased your contract.' She put her hand down. What? Cass took a step back, broaching the edge of the stairs. He righted himself just in time before tumbling backward. You allowed that? He glanced from Vina to Evie and back again. It wasn't an easy decision, I assure you, Vina said, her chin higher than before. 
but it was too good of a deal. Though, upon re-examination, I think I might have been cheated. She narrowed her eyes at Evie. We have a deal, Evie replied. Bina scoffed, flitting her fingers. So we do. Cass's commune beeped. He checked quickly to see it was Box on the other end. Problems? he asked. A team of Venus people are here, Box replied. They want access to the ship. Cass caught Venus's gaze. I have to get my goods from your hold if you're no longer going to be in my employ, she said. I can't allow you to walk away with two million in untraceable equipment now, can I? Two million? Cass yelled. That's how much I was carrying? Venus' smile stretched wide as she sunk back into her throne. Don't blame me if you don't know what you're carrying. Weren't you the one who, how did you put it, didn't give two shits about what's in your cargo hold as long as you didn't have to deal with it? Maybe I'm paraphrasing. Box, let them on. They're going to lighten our load, Cass said, tapping the comm unit to cut the line. He couldn't believe she'd put that much on his ship. It was possible she just did it to goad him. Had he actually looked at any point during the journey, he would have realized he'd had more than enough to trade for all the parts he needed to fix his ship, and then some. With a couple million, he could have stayed in deep space for a few years, just cruising. And all he'd needed to do was take it and run. How long will it take to unload? Evie asked, her arms still crossed. An hour or so, Vina replied, no longer interested. Cass watched Evie. The answer seemed to satisfy her, as she still wore that smug look on her face. She knew she'd won. Bina no longer had any vested interest in him. How much had Evie paid? By purchasing his contract, she'd eliminated any protection he could have expected from the Sargans when the Coalition came calling. Evie would be able to drag him back into the Coalition one way or the other now. Unless he blew her cover. If Vina found out she'd been paid off by the Coalition, she'd lose her mind. It was the one organization she refused to do business with, no matter how good the money was. He respected that about her. It was what drew him to her in the first place, and had been the one thing they shared in common. He'd never gotten the whole story, but from what he'd put together through the years, her hatred of the Coalition had something to do with how her parents were treated while citizens. Cast took stock of the room. Rasp was right behind Evie. Court was down the hall, and Vina had two other guards whose names he didn't know standing off to the left and the right of the throne. If he did blow Evie's cover, Vina would have no qualms about dropping her into the pit. Even with the sword, she didn't stand a chance against four of Vina's guards. Vina would probably even order Cass to help them, which was unacceptable. Wait. You can't just let some stranger purchase all my debt from you, Cass protested, trying to think of a way out of this. I don't even know this person. Vina stood and took two steps toward him, placing her hand gently on his shoulder. Even through his jacket, he could sense her skin was bitterly cold. I don't care, she said, her voice soft. All I know is I've lost a good asset today but the price to keep you was just too high. Contrary to what this mercenary thinks, you're not worth that much. She gave him a brief smile before dropping her hand. He couldn't exactly protest. He'd wanted a way out, though preferably one that didn't lead straight back to the Coalition. Although there might still be a way he could turn this to his advantage. What about the repairs to my ship? Cass asked, indignant. He thought he caught Evie's smile falter. I can't exactly do any jobs for anyone without an operational ship. Vina turned to Evie. I can, of course, repair his ship. Even when he was helping her, she couldn't keep the revulsion out of her voice. Though standing in this room, it was obvious Vina only liked the best. For a price... I don't think that will be necessary, Evie said. What? 
Venus said with mock concern. Who spends so much money on a courier who can't transport anything? Or perhaps your interest is in something other than his skills delivering goods back and forth. She drew her long fingers down through Cass's hair to the base of his neck, making him shudder. He didn't dare face her. Thank you, but we'll find repairs at the next port over, Evie said. Cass brushed Venus's hand away as she chuckled. It won't make it that far, he replied. Evie snapped a look at him, with fire in her eyes. I doubt I can even open an undercurrent in the state it's in. You won't find anyone else on this station with the appropriate parts either, Venus sneered at Evie. But don't worry. I'd be happy to give you a five percent discount. How generous, Evie said through clenched teeth. It's my pleasure, Vina replied. After all, you did give me a once-in-a-lifetime deal. She lost any trace of her earlier anger, and that made Cass nervous. Rasp, Vina called out. See to it repairs begin immediately. We don't want to keep our new friend waiting too long. Though, she turned back to Evie, I'm sure you can find something to do with him for a few hours. Yes, Mum, Rasp replied, turning and disappearing behind the wall. Evie clenched her fists, dropping her arms. I'll transfer the second payment to your account as soon as we leave. Vina grinned, nodding, but not responding. All of a sudden, she'd reverted back into the collected, regal woman Cass had always known. She resumed her place on the throne and tented her long fingers together as Evie approached Cass. Let's go, she ordered, marching past him and onto the red carpet for the long walk. Cass took one last look at Vina, who seemed content now, and turned to follow. What the hell was that? Evie whispered as soon as they were beyond the outer doors and back in the main corridors of the station. Cass had made sure to check his ammunition when he retrieved his boom cannon from court. He couldn't afford sabotage now. What? Cass said, feigning ignorance. He needed a drink. Badly. That crap about repairing your ship. You could have put my life in danger, she said. You did that the moment you stepped on the station, he replied. It's not my fault you went to see one of the most dangerous people in the sector to accomplish your mission. Well, it doesn't matter. She can keep your ship for all I care. You and I are going back to Coalition Space, and we're leaving right now. And in case you haven't noticed, you're all out of excuses. She picked up her pace, and Cass took longer steps to keep up with her. Well, actually, we're not, he said. She stopped cold. Look, unless you want a battalion of Coalition Marines on this station tomorrow, dragging your ass out of here... I suggest you cooperate. And don't think I can't do it. I told you this was a priority one order, which means you don't get to say no. What I mean is, we're not going anywhere because I disabled your shuttle. Cass smirked. And it looks like my ship is getting the repairs it needs. So in a couple of hours, I'll be saying adios, and you can just wait for rescue. Her jaw hung open slightly but her eyes burned into his. You... How could... Only a coalition... I told you. I'm an engineer. I know how stuff works. He turned and made his way down the hallway, leaving her standing there. But thanks again for getting me out of my contract, and for the repairs. He tickled the air with his fingers at her as he sauntered off in search of the nearest bar. Nine. Why is it 75% of the times I've seen you, it's been in or near a bar? Evie strolled up to the counter inside the pit. Cass moaned and took another gulp of his rank, relishing the fizz going down his throat. Give it up already. You've lost. In a couple of hours, I'm leaving the station once and for all, and you'll never see me again, he said. She sat on the stool next to him unhooking her sword and laying it on the bar beside her. The robot bartender glided over. Yes? What he's having, she said. The bartender turned to the taps. 
You're absolutely right, she said to Cass. He arched an eyebrow at her. You've got me. There was not a thing I can do to make you come back to the coalition. He took another sip as the bartender set her glass in front of her. Why do I feel like there's a but coming on, he asked. No buts, no more tricks. Here's to you, as clever as they said you were. You've bested me. She held up a glass. He furrowed his brow but lifted his own and clinked it with hers before taking another draw. I thought you didn't drink, he said. Now is the perfect time to start, don't you think? Every good failure needs a pick-me-up. What does this mean for you? He couldn't help but wonder what the failure of a Priority One mission would mean for her. Going back empty-handed. She shrugged. Who knows? They'll probably reassign me. Or maybe even demote me. Doesn't matter, though. If you're trying to guilt me into coming, it isn't going to work. Cass finished the rank. I'll take another, he said to the bartender. Guilt you? Ha! I'm not sure that's an emotion you're capable of, she said. I envy you. You have this uncanny ability to put yourself at the top of this little pyramid and everyone else around you just slides down to the bottom. She made a sliding motion with her hand. But hey, you get to stay there at the top, so no harm done, am I right? I'd just like to know how you do it. She tipped the glass back and drank half the liquid in one move. The bartender set the second glass in front of him. That's not how it is, he said, taking a large gulp himself. She was steering him into treacherous territory. Whatever you have to tell yourself. She finished off the rank and set the glass down. Another, she said to the bartender. Cass glanced at his own drink. Maybe I'll be like you she said. I'll just stay here on Devil's Gate. Pick up some work here and there. Earn myself a ship. I'm not going anywhere for a while, so I might as well make use of my time. She yanked the second glass out of the bartender's hands before he had a chance to set it down. Cheers. Evie raised it slightly before downing half of it again in one gulp. By course, slow down. If you really haven't had anything to drink before, you're going to topple off that stool. What's that? Evie asked, sitting up straight. Was that concern I heard? She glanced around, like she hadn't known who it had come from, making a small spectacle of herself. Did someone just express concern about my well-being? Nah, not here. Not in Sargon space. Cass shushed her. Keep your voice down unless you want people to start asking questions. You know what I can't figure out? Evie said, slamming the glass down on the counter and staring him directly in the eye. Her eyes wavered slightly. If she wasn't careful, she'd end up on her ass before she managed to finish her second drink. I can't understand why you didn't just out me to Vina. Why not tell her my true identity? It would have been a lot easier than sabotaging my ship. Which you did a magnificent job on, by the way. I can't even figure out how to make the shower work anymore. It was necessary, Cass said. I didn't have a choice. Answer the question. He hesitated, staring into his drink. You said you don't know who I am or what I did. No, and I don't care. If I needed to know, they would have told me. It can't be that important. Either that, or it's too important. But to me, it doesn't matter. I just have my orders. She took another drink. And you don't know why they want me back so badly? She shook her head, rolling her eyes. Above my pay grade. You don't get paid, he said. That's where you're wrong, she said, sticking her finger in his chest. I do get paid. I don't need money to be happy. I get paid in fulfillment from helping my fellow life form, whether it be human or other. I get paid in the life experience I earn through my actions. I get paid in the access to the virtually unlimited resources of the Coalition. Why anyone would choose this life over one there is beyond me. It's because you haven't seen the seedy underbelly of the Coalition yet, 
Cass said, draining his drink, emotioning for another. But don't worry. One day it will all be clear. Then you'll think back to this moment and say to yourself, Cass was right after all. Evie scoffed. Doubtful. She'd finished her drink as well. The bartender brought them both a refill at the same time. She didn't bother toasting him this time. Instead, she greedily began drinking. Evie, seriously, slow down. That's a good way to knock yourself out. Just doing what you do, she said between sips. Numb the world so it can't hurt anymore. It's all part of my new mission to understand alien life such as yourself. We're the same species. We definitely are not, she said, sadness reaching her eyes as she took another drink. Cass cursed himself. No, he didn't need this. He was home free. In a few short hours, he and Box would be off in the ship to some distant star, no longer concerned with the Sargans or the Coalition or any of this. Maybe he'd even discover a new civilization, something no human had ever seen before. All he had to do was get past Evie. All he had to do was leave her here. He watched as she drained the rest of the third glass. He'd barely even touched his. I didn't tell Vina, because I didn't want to see you killed. You might be a pain in my ass, but you don't deserve to die just because you were ordered to retrieve me. She eyed him, rocking back and forth on the stool. How generous, she spat. If I go, he said, testing the waters, I want it in writing I will not be jailed. She stared at him, probably looking for any signs of deception. And I will only stay in coalition space for two days. After that, I'm gone. Evie stared at the empty glass in front of her. I need certain concessions. Such as? Such as your guarantee you won't run when we reach the border, that you'll cooperate with whatever it is they need you for. She turned to him. I need to know you won't break your word. Cass stared at her in amazement. All traces of inebriation were gone. It was as if she were stone sober. Was her tolerance really that high? Even he felt the effects of the rank by now. If you can give me yours, I can give you mine, Cass said, not believing what he was saying. Why was he willing to go out on a limb for this woman? Probably because he would always wonder what would have happened to her if he left her here, alone. Not to mention he'd be looking over his shoulder for the rest of his life. The Coalition would keep sending people after him. At least, if he went in now, he could finally close this book, because there was only one reason they could want him so badly. You won't run, she said. You'll keep me out of prison, he replied. She stuck out her hand. He glanced at it, weighing the alternatives one last time. He grabbed his glass and drained it in one go, then grabbed her hand and gave it a quick shake before he changed his mind. Thank you, she said. 10. Cass stumbled down the main thoroughfare toward the hangar bay. Box had needed to move the ship from the parking area to one of the repair garages on the outer edge of the ring itself. The walk seemed to take forever, but it was probably hampered by the fact he'd had another two ranks at the bar after agreeing to return to the Coalition. Evie walked beside him, completely sober. Either you were lying about never having a drink before, or you're a sorcerer, Cass said, putting his hand up against the wall. The hallway stopped rotating around him as he did. Some people just tolerate it better, she said. They'd agreed, since her ship had been disabled and his was in the process of being repaired, they would take the reasonable excuse back to Coalition space. Evie argued it allowed her to keep a better eye on him, and Cass had tried to argue back, but when the urge to retaste the rank entered his throat, he shut up. He didn't like the idea of her on his ship, but he didn't see a better alternative. 
If he wanted this over quickly, it was better to take her back now. And frankly, he was in a hurry to get away from Vina. He still couldn't quite believe it was real, that he no longer owed her a cent. Which brought up something he'd been pondering. You do know that you just paid off a crime lord, don't you? All that money will go to people who build themselves up on the backs of others. Who make others suffer... He paused, ensuring he wouldn't throw up. Needlessly. I was told whatever it takes, Evie reiterated. And yes, that included paying off a few criminals. That's what I was afraid of, Cass replied. They reached the hangar bay as Cass's headache kicked in. Bina's workers swarmed the ship, replacing panels and wiring parts together. Off to the left of the ship was a pile of worn and damaged components. Bach sat in front of the ship in a fold-out chair, his metal legs resting on a transportation crate, while the hub of it in front of him showed that stupid show he'd been watching. Box, Cass said as he approached. Huh? Box, look at me. Box reached over and turned the hollow off, turning to face them. Oh, Cor, he yelled. You look terrible. Why do you want me to look at that? I was enjoying my show. Evie stifled a chuckle while Cass approached him. Are they almost done? he asked, indicating the ship. Hm? Oh, Box turned to watch the workers. They're 92% done, boss, he said, suddenly serious. They pulled a lot of stuff out of the hold. I watched them carry it away. I know. We could have been rich off that stuff. I know, Box. Could have traveled the stars for years. Made it out to Omicron Terminus and back again. He was staring up at the ceiling, twenty meters above them. Yes, had either of us thought to look, we could have done that. Cass held his stomach a moment. As it is, we're going back to the Coalition. But you said... Cass put his hands up. I don't care what I said. We're going. For two days. Then we're out. Got it? Got it, boss. His yellow eyes dimmed, indicating disappointment. Cass doubted Evie even noticed. It was something you only picked up if you were around bots for a while. Cass turned to Evie. This is Lieutenant Commander Diazol, he said. Evie, this is my traveling companion, Box. To her credit, Evie held out her hand. Box examined it a minute, then took it, giving it one shake. That's rare, he said. What's that? Evie asked. Not many people are willing to shake a robot's hand. Most think I'll crush it with my mammoth strength. Others are just assholes, he said. I've worked with artificial life forms in the past, Evie said. You're no different to me than Mr. Rabot here. I hope I'm a little different, Box exclaimed. He smells like Mugar excrement. Cass rolled his eyes. Fine. I'll go shower. I assume the water pressure is working. Box activated the hollow again, except this time a manifest showed up. The pressure is... Yes, you're clear to clean your balls, boss. Cass turned to Evie. Ignore him. He has an unhealthy obsession with genitals. Cass began walking toward the ship. No more unhealthy than humans, Box called after him. Evie caught up beside him. Maybe you could show me where I'm staying. That way I can stay out of your way until we're ready to leave. Cass reached the ramp to the ship, placing his hand on one of the struts. He took a deep breath. I can't believe I'm doing this. He turned to Evie. Follow me. Leading her up the ramp, he took a right when they were past the second lock to the ship, down the primary corridor. It'll take at least five days to get the coalition space from here, Cass said, passing the hab suites. When he reached the last one, he pressed his thumb to the pad beside the door, which slid open. So, make yourself comfortable. I know how far it is. I flew here, she said, stepping into the room. It wasn't the nicest suite on the ship, because he wasn't about to give a coalition officer his best accommodation. She was lucky he didn't put her in an escape pod and tow her behind them. The room was sparse but functional, not unlike Cass's room. 
except the window was on the other side. This will be fine, thank you, Evie said, removing her sword and laying it on the bed. We have limited food supplies, but it will be enough to get us there. Use the kitchen if you need it. I'll stay out of your way if you agree to stay out of mine, he added. Agreed. I'll be fine in here. Great, Cass said sarcastically. Just great. I'm so glad we're doing this. He left her at the entryway, heading back to his own suite. All he wanted to do was lie down. He didn't want to shower. He didn't want to clean up. He didn't even want to think. He just wanted to try not to think about the mistake he was in the process of making. Not thinking about it was the best thing he could do for himself at the moment. As the door opened, the pungent smell of day-old vomit hit him, and he doubled over, retching in the hallway. "'Is everything all right?' Evie asked from her doorway down the hall. "'Fine, fine,' he waved a hand behind him as he was still bent over. "'Just stay over there. I've got it.' "'You sure?' "'Yes. Under control.' When he didn't hear anything else, he assumed she'd return to her suite. Cass tapped his comm. Box, get up here and help me clean up this mess. What mess, boss? The one in my room. And now the hallway, he said, his throat burning. Drank too much again, huh? Box asked. Cass didn't respond. Instead, he cut the comm and ventured into his room, pulling the soiled sheets off the bed and balling them up. He took them down the corridor to the lock, down the ramp, and out into the garage, tossing them on top of the rest of the discarded equipment. Box came up behind him. I need you to print me a new set of sheets, Cass said, before we leave. Use the station's power. Box leaned down, putting his hand on Cass's shoulder. Are you sure we should do this? he asked. Why not just leave? Cass turned back to the ship, as if he could see right through it. Right through to where Evie was probably sitting on the bed, wondering how she'd gotten herself into this situation. Because I can't run forever, Cass replied. 11. Cass approached the door to Evie's room, pressing the button beside the door, causing a chime to ring inside the room. Just a minute, she called. He waited, wondering why he'd made the effort to come all the way down here when he could have sent a message through the comm. The door slid open to reveal her in her full coalition uniform. He hadn't seen her bring it aboard, but it made sense. She'd probably return to the shuttle again before they'd left Devil's Gate while Cass was sleeping off his hangover on his sheetless bed smelling of vomit. We're half an hour out, he said. Just wanted to make sure you knew. I knew, she said. Cass looked past her to see she'd hung the sword on one of the small hooks on the wall. You going to bring that back into Coalition space? She paused a moment, her eyes flickering back and forth over his face. Not that it's any of your business, but yes. It will go back into my personal storage. Not exactly Coalition issue, he said. I expect most citizens don't appreciate an officer walking around with a tool that slices off heads. She chuckled. No, it's just for infiltration. Plus, it doesn't hurt to have a family heirloom at my side. Helps keep me grounded. She stared at him, as if waiting for him to say something else. Why had he come down here? Anything I should know before we arrive? I don't want to be shot down once we get in the Starbase perimeter. She arched an eyebrow. You know about that? Don't worry. I've already transmitted our description. They know we're coming. Did you get that agreement in writing yet? He asked. Evie tapped the back of her hand twice, and Cass's comm unit beeped. He grabbed it, glancing at the document it had just downloaded. Official coalition letterhead and all. He closed the document and replaced the comm back in his pocket. I'm not stupid. I know once I'm on that base, you can keep me there. But I'm trusting you'll keep your word. Don't make me regret that decision. 
She watched him, her eyes scanning his face. You're not the only one going out on a limb here. How do I know you don't have some plan devised once you get on the station to sabotage it? You clearly know what you're doing in that department. For all I know, you could completely disable our closest defense to Sargan space. Cass almost laughed. He hadn't considered sabotaging the station until she'd brought it up. But stations like that were different than a simple shuttle. Not that he couldn't do it, but it would be a much more complex and lengthy procedure. I have a feeling that's going to be pretty hard, with guards watching my back every minute. You know an awful lot about coalition procedure, she said, staring at him under lowered lids. Somehow, with her uniform on, she looked taller, cleaner. Cass supposed that's what the Coalition did to people, polished them up and spit them out. Cass shrugged it off. I know a lot about a lot of things, he said, turning to head down the hallway. Oh, he turned back. When we get there, make sure they don't mess with my ship or my robot. I'm fond of both. She nodded. You have my word. Cass continued down the hall. It had better be worth something, he muttered under his breath. He returned to the cockpit, where Box was monitoring the undercurrent. How's she looking? I think we'll get through with a clean run. No trenches detected so far, and we've only got another four minutes in undercurrent space. For once, Box was paying attention to what he was doing instead of watching some program. How far from the station will we be when we exit the current? Half a second later, Box answered. 800,000 kilometers. Another 15, 20 minutes to the station itself. Out in the distance, Cass could see the station, hanging in the blackness of space like a child's mobile held up by an invisible string. It was like a giant white hourglass, at least from this angle. A wide, flat cone at the very top, thinning in the middle, then expanding again down to the bottom. In the middle of the spire, various pods and instruments were attached. Each was specifically there for a purpose and could be removed or changed out as necessary. A deep loathing welled up in the depths of his core. This was crazy. He should have just left Evie back with the Sargans and fled to an uncharted sector of space. Get out of the local area. Maybe he would have died in the blackness of the void, but at least he wouldn't have to live with this fear permeating his system. You must have impressed Vina, Box said, pulling Cass from his thoughts. What? This new equipment. She set you up with some of the best stuff I've ever seen. Brand new thrust controllers, top-of-the-line undercurrent emitter, platinum-coated actuators. The ship has probably never run so well, not since you've owned it, anyway. Cass furrowed his brow. Did you happen to talk to any of the installation crew while they were working? Box fell silent for a moment. No, I felt it was much better to just let them work and stay out of their way. You mean you'd rather watch vid programs than do your job? Cass took a deep breath. Why would she go to the trouble? She wasn't happy about my leaving. At least, not until the end. Box's shoulders jumped up. Maybe your new owner paid her good money for you. Cass exhaled through his nose, willing himself not to take the bait. Whatever the reason, stay on guard. I don't want to be caught by surprise out here. Always, boss, Box replied. Cass found he couldn't return to the sanctuary of his room. Every day they'd been in under space, the room had felt smaller, more closed in. What had once been a place he could take refuge now felt like a flying cage. He'd spent more time in the kitchen and cockpit than normal, taking time to enjoy it while he could. There was no telling what would happen once they reached the station. But with any luck, he and Box could leave in a few days. Unless this had all been a giant setup. He paced the hallways while Box initiated docking procedures. They'd come into the station's perimeter without issue and had been granted clearance. 
It should have made him feel better, Evie had been truthful about that part, but somehow it didn't. Piloting the ship into the docking bay had felt like just another set of bars closing down on him. He'd managed to find some clean clothes for once. It was nothing more than a cotton shirt and his pocket trousers. He'd even rummaged in the back of his closet and retrieved his jacket, the one he'd gotten from his brief time with Liss. If he thought about it hard enough, he could even still catch her scent on the fabric. Evie stepped out of her room, carrying a small bag and the sword in one hand. Have we landed? she asked. Box is finishing the procedures now. Tell your friends if they plan on searching my ship to not break anything. I have some valuable artifacts in here, and I don't need coalition fingerprints all over them. She flashed him a side eye. I'll see what I can do. The ship shuddered, and Cass recognized the sound of the exhaust systems purging their excess thrust. They had landed. Box, he called. Yeah, boss? You're coming with us. Let's go. There was a loud thump, and Box came trotting down the hall. A field trip! His eyes flashed in excitement. Cass pressed the button to lower the main ramp from the primary lock. Evie took a step for the door, but he took her arm, stopping her. Don't make me regret this, he said, doing his best to keep his voice from shaking. You can trust me, she replied. He nodded and let go following her down the ramp and out the second lock into the vast space, box close behind him. When they exited, he couldn't help but be impressed by it all. After five years of seeing nothing but barely maintained Sargan ports of call, the pristine station of the Coalition was a breath of fresh air. Unlike the landing pad at Devil's Gate, ships weren't crammed in the bay like sardines. The closest shuttle was a good thirty meters away, and everything was clearly marked and easy to follow. They had landed on Pad Charlie Sigma 17. A crew of four started their external check of the ship, as was standard procedure when a non-coalition vessel docked. They checked for anything hazardous or any potential problems with the ship itself, which they would then present to the pilot upon their departure. Smug bastards. Evie handed her bag and sword off to an enlisted crew member in a gray jumpsuit and gray hat, he saluted her before taking her goods, then trotted off in a different direction. Let's go, she said. We'll head through the civilian sector. It's the quickest way to the Admiral's office. Perfect, Box exclaimed, following along. I was planning on going there anyway. Do you know how many drama programs I can download while we're here? He asked. And they're all free. My processors are going to be full. Yes, Cass said. Free. He glanced up to the ceiling of the shuttle bay, a good twenty meters above them. He couldn't detect a bit of dirt, dust, or exhaust anywhere. Just like it was supposed to be. Sterile. He turned to Evie. I'm surprised we didn't have an escort waiting for us at the bottom of the ramp. Though it was standard procedure with potentially hostile vessels. I told them I could handle it. Think of it as a peace offering, she said maintaining her focus forward as they walked to the closest hypervader. That's very generous, Cass said. She didn't reply, only stopped at the door to the hypervader, pressing a button beside the door. Cass took a last glance back at his ship, hoping it wasn't the last time he'd see her. He couldn't help but stare past her at the star field beyond the protective force field. Cass sighed turning back to the hyper that had just arrived. Main concourse, Evie announced as soon as the three of them were inside. She glanced at Cass. Here we go. Twelve. As the doors opened again, Cass steeled himself for what lay ahead. The reality of the situation sank in. He was on a coalition station. By choice being escorted by a coalition officer. This was insane. He'd lost his mind. Before him was a long, wide corridor with shops on both sides. The corridor curved out of sight, following the natural curve of the station. In some ways, it was like Devil's Gate, and in other ways, it was the complete opposite. 
For one, the concourse was much wider, about 50 meters, giving people plenty of space. No one was in any danger of running into anyone else here. Fountains of different liquids lined the center of the concourse, each demonstrating a different show. Above them, a glass atrium curved over the entire concourse, and beyond was nothing but stars. The concourse only had one level, but above the shops on both sides were massive planters filled with flora from at least 30 different worlds. It felt like a dungeon to Cass. There it is, Box squealed. It came out as a garbled yowl. He took off toward one of the shops, and Evie and Cass had to run to keep up with him. What is he doing? Evie yelled. He found the entertainment store, Cass replied. Box was already inside of the counter. He'd dropped an uplink cord on the counter with a thud. Fill it up, he said. The attendant peered around him at Cass and Evie entering the store. Ma'am? he asked. Evie nodded. It's fine. What? You have to get permission to download entertainment now? Cass asked. No, it's just that a robot walking in and demanding something isn't usual. She forced a grin. What would you like? the attendant asked Box. As much as you can fit inside me, he replied proudly. Cass groaned, dropping his head. Yes, sir. The attendant took the uplink cable and plugged it into a device beside him. Oh, yes, that's it. Give me more, Box said. For course sake, Box, Cass yelled, walking over. He yanked the cable from the machine and swiveled Box around, pushing him out of the store. He's had enough. Thank you. He waved to the attendant, who seemed speechless. Evie followed them out. Do you have to make a spectacle everywhere you go? Cass asked once they were back in the concourse. Yes, he replied. Life is short. Make it interesting. We need to keep moving. The Admiral expects you, Evie said, walking past them. Cass caught the hint of a smile on her face. They continued moving down the concourse with Box following behind, completely enveloped in the information he'd downloaded. Every now and again, Cass would catch the eye of someone, and they would sneer or turn away. He'd been fooling himself if he'd thought people had forgotten already. It had only been seven years ago. Cass was more astonished no one had told Evie yet. Just as they approached a second hypervader in the center of the concourse, a woman strode up to Cass, fire in her eyes. Before he knew what was happening, her palm had struck him across the face. It hadn't hurt much, though it had been a shock. All around them, people stopped moving. Do you know who I am? she demanded. Cass forced himself to look at her. He nodded. How Dare you show your face here again, she said, raising her hand to slap him again. Ma'am, step away, Evie forced herself between them. This is the coalition. We don't assault people. Give me your hand. I need to scan you for security. Me? the woman yelled. He's the criminal, she pointed to Cass. You're letting him walk around free, and you want to arrest me? For striking another life form, yes, Evie said raising her hand to her comm unit. Evie, it's okay. Cass placed his hand on hers and guided it back down by her side. It's fine, he reiterated. Are you sure? She just committed a class one infraction. He nodded, not looking at the woman. Let's just keep moving. They walked around the woman, who continued fuming there in the middle of the concourse. Next time, it'll be a class two, she yelled after him. They filed into the hypervader and waited until the doors closed. What was that about? Evie asked. Are you okay? She stared at his stubble-ridden cheek. Ask around. I'm sure someone will tell you, he said. She turned her attention to Box, who was still involved with his hollow program streaming from his arm. What about you? Do you know? Box nodded. 
We're like soul sisters. We tell each other everything. She turned back to Cass, a smirk on her face. He's exaggerating, Cass replied. The hypervader stopped, the doors opening on a very clean hallway. The sides were a neutral gray, and the floor carpeted with something firm but pleasant. On the far side of the wall were a series of doors every few feet, each labeled with a different person's name. Some were transparent, and others weren't, but in the ones Cass could see through, people worked at desks inside. They'd reached the main offices. Where to? he asked. Follow me. Evie turned right down the hallway. It sported a more pronounced curve, with all the transparent doors on the outside, with other non-transparent doors lining the inside. She tapped her hand as they walked. Lieutenant Commander Diazal, with Caspian Rabot, proceeding to Admiral Rutledge's office. Cass stopped cold. What did you say? he asked. Evie turned to him as someone passed them in the hall. What? Which admiral? Admiral Daniel Rutledge, she said, her words falling off a cliff. She really didn't know anything about him, any of his history at all. I'm not going. Deal's off, he said. He wasn't about to face that man again, not after everything that had happened. Wait, you can't back out now. Evie said. You gave me your word. Cass had already turned back down the hallway to get to the hypervader. He might not make it far, but he'd be damned if he didn't try. You never said I'd have to deal with him. Captain, don't do this, Evie warned. Don't force my hand. He turned back. Box was leaning against the wall watching the program, oblivious to what was happening around him. I should have known, he said. I should have suspected he was behind this, but I didn't want to believe it. That's my own fault. I should have been more honest with myself, because there was only one reason the Coalition would want me back, and it's sitting on the other side of a desk down there somewhere, he pointed down the hall. What is this all about? Evie asked. Why not just meet with him? He's the one who ordered me to find you. I can't say I'm surprised, Cass replied. But I can't do it. I'd rather go back to Vina than face him. Her features softened. You told me I could trust you. Cass cursed himself. He glanced down the hallway. More than likely there were guards down there, ready to grab him the moment he tried to run. His ship had probably been disabled, so he couldn't escape without authorization. He glanced back at Evie, pleading with him. He'd known it would come to this someday. He just hoped he'd been wrong. He took a deep breath and turned back toward her. Fine. Lead on. She relaxed her posture, but held his gaze a moment. Then she turned, leading them down the hall until they reached a door larger than the others. And based on how far the next closest doors were on either side, Cass could only assume this was their destination. As confirmation, the plaque on the door said, R-A-D-M, Daniel S. Rutledge, S-C-A-S. Cass shoved his hands in his pockets so they couldn't see they were shaking. You might as well do it, boss. You're already here, Box said, his focus still on the program. Mo. Oh. So you can do more than one thing at a time, Cass said. Only on special occasions, Box replied. Ready? Evie asked, concern in her eyes. Cass nodded. She tapped the button beside the door. Enter, the voice Cass hadn't heard in over five years said. The door slid open. Thirteen. The office was clean and sparse, a perfect picture of how a Coalition Admiral's office should look. In the center of the room sat a large, white desk made of some super polymer. Cass didn't want to guess which one, with a built-in command system that would appear at the touch of a button. He'd seen desks like this before. 
They were often called war desks due to their advanced tactical displays. Behind the desk was a giant map of coalition space with the borders outlined in a dark blue. To the upper right was the Sargan Commonwealth, outlined in green, and down below, outlined in red, was Sil territory. The man Cass hoped he'd never have to see again stood up from the desk, a grin across his face. His broad, stocky shoulders filled out his admiral's uniform well, and his brown beard had gone a great deal grayer in it since the last time Cass had seen him. It seemed ten years had passed for Rutledge, not five, though those years had hardened him, not worn him down. His eyes were lit with activity, scanning Cass, then Evie, and then Box behind them. Cass had to work not to shrink from the man. He'd never thought this day would come, and if it had, he imagined it going much differently, with Cass pulling the boom cannon Evie'd made him leave on the ship and blasting a hole right through the man. Commander, he said in his gravelly voice, well done. He stuck out his hand for Evie, who took it, shook once, then placed her hands back behind her. Her braid fell off her shoulder behind her back. Rutledge turned to Cass. I bet you never thought you'd see me again. Captain, is it? That's right, Cass replied, trying his best to hide his anger. Rutledge didn't offer his hand. And this is... He motioned to Box. My associate, Cass replied. Ah. Rutledge studied Box a moment. Glad you could both make it. He put his own hands behind his back and walked to the side of the desk. Commander, would you mind taking the robot outside for a few minutes? The captain and I have a lot to discuss. Evie's gaze flitted between them for a moment before she realized she was hesitating. Yes, sir, she said, taking Box by the arm. Cass heard the doors behind him slide open and closed again, but he didn't take his eyes off Rutledge. He swore he'd never turn his back on the man again. Rutledge chuckled. Gave yourself a promotion, I see. It's my ship. It needs a captain. Rutledge scoffed, walking to the wall on the far side. A vid screen was built into the wall, and he tapped it, bringing it to life. Right. Because if you can't get it through hard work and determination, why not just give it to yourself for free? Save it, Daniel, Cass said. Let's just get this over with. What am I doing here? I think you know, Rutledge said, tapping the screen a few more times. An overhead map of local space came up, zooming in on their location. I wish I could say it was good to see you again, but we both know that's not true. He paused. You're here because of the Atlas. I find that statement shocking, Cass said, deadpan. Cut the shit, Rabo, Rutledge snapped. Whenever he'd gotten riled up in the past, he'd started sweating on his forehead and Cass could already see the sheen reflecting off him. She's missing. Good riddance, Cass replied. Rutledge ignored him. Ten days ago, we lost contact with her, he said, out near the Rekka Quasar. The screen zoomed into the space around the Quasar. A red blip indicated where the Atlas had last been seen. What was it doing out there? Cass asked. Rutledge turned and smiled at him. I think you know. Cass struggled to contain his anger. You got it working, didn't you? You finally built the fucking thing, and they were testing it. First test was ten days ago, Rutledge said. Cass failed at controlling his anger. Then maybe they blew themselves up. Too bad you weren't on board. Rutledge scoffed again. This is bigger than just me anymore. We have people counting on the Atlas now. It isn't just some experiment. You still haven't answered my question. Why am I here? Cass followed him as Rutledge walked back over to the desk, staring him down from the other side. You're going to help find it. He took a step back. Why me? 
why bring in the one guy who doesn't want anything to do with the ship's experiments? Because, despite the need, most people don't know the intricacies of the project. They don't know what they're looking at. All they're doing is measuring results. I need someone who has seen this stuff up close, who can identify it and tell me what went wrong. You forget I was in jail by the time you finally brought one on board. I've never seen it, Cass argued. Technically, you'd already run from Cathora by the time we brought it back, but it turns out they are remarkably close to the initial prototypes you developed. I need your knowledge here, Caspian. If I had another choice, I would have taken it. Believe me. Cass turned his gaze upward. That I can't believe. He took a deep breath. I assume you knew what happened to me on Cathora? The Admiral gave him a hard stare. I thought so. Guess I was harder to get rid of than you thought. The Admiral's penetrating gaze bore into him. You're not here to rehash history. We can either leave that in the past, or we can waste time arguing about something neither of us can change. Which do you prefer? He was right. It wasn't as if Cass could go to a review board and plead his case. He had no proof. Not to mention he didn't know how many people were involved. This might be his only chance to get clear of this mess once and for all. He glanced at the map on the wall. How do you even know the ship is still out there? Rutledge relaxed his shoulders. We don't. But if it is, I want someone who knows what they're looking at when it's found. Things have escalated. I need to know what happened on that ship. Why, and if the experiment can be salvaged. Cass nodded, taking it all in. He worked his jaw, crossing his arms. And if I refuse... We have a comfortable brig. You can have your old spot back. Cass shook his head, staring at the ground. I expected nothing less. I knew this was a mistake, coming here. And yet I came anyway. He thought about it a moment. Fine. Toss me in. Impound my ship. Let's see what happens. Cass swore he could see a vein throbbing on Rutledge's forehead. The older man watched him a long time, and Cass watched right back, daring him to do it. Because the fact was, Rutledge was on a time crunch, and Cass wasn't. He didn't care if the ship was ever found. If Rutledge had gone to all this trouble to find him and bring him in, he wasn't about to toss him in the brig. Rutledge turned away first. It's too bad you can't order me to do it, Cass smirked. That would solve all your problems, wouldn't it? Of course, the last time you ordered me to do something, it didn't go so well. For either of us. What do you want? Rutledge asked, his back to Cass as he studied the map in front of him. I'll go find it, in my ship, alone. When I find it, I report the information to you, and then I'm gone. Forever. I want all records of me and the Coalition destroyed, like I didn't exist. Out of the question, Rutledge said, turning back to him. You'll run the first chance you get. It's what you do. I'm not... Cass began, but Rutledge put his hand up. I have a ship ready to depart, waiting for you. For the duration of the mission, you will be a special advisor to the crew. If you find the ship... Confirm what happened. Report back to me. Once that's done, Rutledge said, raising his voice above Cass's objection, then you can depart from here. We'll load your ship on the Tempest. Cass shook his head, nails biting into the palms of his hands. If you think I'm joining another coalition crew, you can... It's temporary. And I'll agree to your other terms, once it's found. He sat back down in his chair, eyeing Cass as he leaned back. Otherwise, it is the brig, and neither of us gets what we want. Fine, Cass clenched his teeth. Rutledge showed the smallest hint of a smirk, then tapped the back of his hand. 
Commander, come back inside, please. Evie entered while Box remained in the hallway. Cass turned just enough to see him displaying his vid on the far wall. Escort Mr. Rabot to the maintenance yard and arrange for his ship to be transferred over to the Tempest. Sir? she asked, glancing at Cass. Rutledge glanced over to Cass, his eyes piercing him. He's going with you to look for the Atlas. Fourteen. The doors closed behind them, sealing the Admiral's office from the outside hallway. Cass took a deep breath, praying to core he hadn't gotten himself into something he couldn't find a way out of. When he glanced up, Evie was staring at him. What? he asked. You two know each other, she said. He chuckled. Yeah, we know each other. Who do you think threw me in prison for two years? You were an officer? she asked, her eyes widening. Cass glanced to Box further down the hall, his attention wrapped by the vid screen projected on the wall. Believe it or not... Why didn't I know that? she asked, indignant. I guess Ruddy in there didn't think it was important. He walked toward Box. I looked for a file on you before I left, but there was barely anything there. It mentioned you were a citizen, you had an altercation, and you were no longer part of the coalition. Nothing about serving in the sovereign navy, nothing about being an officer or being in jail, she said. Box, Cass said, ignoring her, put that away. We have work to do. Box turned his head. But it's on the best part. See, this guy Antonio just found his half... Box! He reached up and tapped his arm. The video disappeared. Where to? We need to get back to the ship. We have a mission. His yellow eyes blinked on and off in confusion. A mission? I thought this was the mission. You've been assigned to my ship, Evie said. The Tempest. We're going out to look for one that is missing. And you agreed? Box asked, his voice full of surprise. It's the Atlas, Cass said. He pushed past Box down the hall toward the hypervader. Oh, Box said. His and Evie's footsteps fell in step behind him. Did everyone know about your service record besides me? Evie asked, catching up with him. It appears that way, he replied. She sped up and stood in front of him, forcing him to come to a stop. Rank. What? he asked. What was your rank when you were discharged? Lieutenant Commander. Same as you, he replied. She visibly relaxed. That's how you knew how to disable my shuttle. How you knew so much about coalition procedures. Once an engineer, always an engineer. This is why he hadn't told her. He didn't want to reminisce about the past, about his time on his last posting. Before that, things had been... better. Maybe not perfect, but better. Wait. Were you an engineer on the Atlas? she asked. No. I started out as the engineer on the Hartford, but was offered to be first officer after a few years, he replied. That's my station on the Tempest. I was transferred before I went on temporary assignment to find you. He raised his eyebrows, forcing a smile. Great. Looks like we're evenly matched. Cass stepped around her, trying to run the variables in his head. Could he really get away once they found the Atlas? Or what was left of it? He might need to make some modifications to his emitters on the reasonable excuse. If Rutledge double-crossed him... The Tempest might be able to hold on to his ship if he tried a forced escape. It would be tricky, but he couldn't drop his guard. Not now. He reached the hypervader, pressing the pad to call the car. Evie came up beside him again, eyeing him. Box appeared on his other side. When we get back to the ship, I want to do a full systems check, Cass said. But I just did one before we left. I don't care, Cass replied. Check everything again. We're going into deep space, and I don't want to be caught off guard. He winked at Box, making sure he was turned away from Evie. You heard the Admiral. 
Someone will move your ship for you. We're going straight to the Tempest. Cass shook his head. No one moves my ship but me. Sorry, Commander, she said, emphasizing the sarcasm. Admiral's orders. Box tapped his metal arm as they waited. The doors opened, and they stepped in. Shipyards, Evie said, as the doors closed. The hypervator shot past the civilian section of the station, speeding up. Below his feet, Cass could feel the car vibrating as it reached high velocity. The shipyards were on the upper end of the station. As he was thinking about the last time he'd been on the station, the back of the car turned transparent, and he was treated to a view of the inner workings of the spire as they rose through it. Floor after floor of either habitation, offices, or storage. And in the center, running through the entire station, a large power core providing clean energy to the station itself. Starbase 8 had been here since before Cass had been born and was one of the largest coalition bases on this side of space. But you didn't feel the sheer size of it until you were traveling from one end to the other. Even at this speed, it was taking a long time, and Cass estimated they had to be traveling at at least 300 kilos per hour. Who is moving my ship again? he asked Evie. A competent officer, she replied. I can't take the risk you'll leave. Transferring the ship means moving it from the civilian shuttle area to the shipyards, which means going outside the station's defensive perimeter. I'm sure you understand. Then why didn't we just park in the shipyards to begin with? Cass asked. Because you told me you were here for two days, and then you were gone. I saw no need to expose you to sensitive coalition technology. But obviously, I'm the only person who doesn't know about your past. So I'll take responsibility for that one. My bad. I'm not letting anyone... It's too late, Captain, she interrupted. I've already signaled to have it moved. I did it in the hallway back there. Cass grumbled, but turned away from her just in time to see the shipyards come into view. At least a dozen coalition ships sat docked around a central core and hanging in midair as if by magic. But there was no gravity in the shipyards, unlike the opposite end of the station at least not in the area where the ships were constructed. Cass caught sight of a few he recognized. Ajax class, Hermes class, Waterfall class. All staples of the Coalition fleet. But there was one he didn't recognize. Is that it? He pointed to the smaller ship. It was compact, with what seemed to be wings flowing out from the main body, then reattaching again. Its undercurrent emitter was mounted on the top of the ship, Unlike others, where it was mounted on the bottom, he couldn't even see the bridge. Yep, brand new from Coalition Development, Evie said, sticking her chest out. USCS Tempest, FCX 8001, Dragon Class. Dragon Class? Cass arched an eyebrow. It's a new line of stealth vessels. The Tempest is the second produced, the first one in full service. She has modifications to the undercurrent adapters, it allows her to travel the currents almost twice as fast as any other Coalition vessel. How is that possible? Box asked, before Cass could ask the same thing. Coalition ships had a fixed speed in the undercurrents. It took as long as it took. There were no shortcuts. The Klaxians came up with it. Who else? Evie asked. They found a more efficient way to traverse the currents. Don't ask me to explain it. I'm not an engineer. No, but Cass was. Now he wanted nothing more than to get inside that ship and inspect its engine, figure out what made it so fast, figure out what the Klaxians had realized that they hadn't. You have a Klaxian on board? he asked. She nodded. He's our chief engineer. Cass took one more look at the ship before it moved out of sight, replaced by a standard bulkhead. The hypervator turned back to opaque. I can't wait to meet him. The hypervader came to a stop, and the doors opened on a large bay, much like the shuttle bay on the other side of the station, where the reasonable excuse had been parked. Could they have moved it already? Cass was itching to get back as soon as possible. Evie led the way through the expansive room, which Cass assumed was a construction bay located close or near to the center core where they could access the ship. Before they could get very far, 
Cast noticed an officer approaching them. His uniform matched Evie's, but his purple stripes near his collar indicated a captain's rank. Cast drew a deep breath, steeling himself for the inevitable confrontation. He was on the older side, with a head of thinning hair and a stern look that seemed to be carved on his face. His piercing blue eyes didn't leave Cass as they approached each other, stopping only meters away. Commander, he said, his voice strong. Captain, she replied, placing her fist to her chest briefly. Do you know? I know him, the captain replied. Evie pinched her lips together. Caspian Rabot, this is Captain Cordell Green, she said. Green didn't move or stick out his hand, which didn't surprise Cass. He'd heard the name before, but never met the man. He had a reputation for being difficult to work with initially, but fair. And he was one hell of a captain from his reputation. At least if he had to go into deep space with a coalition ship, he'd have one of the best captains the coalition had to offer. I will be out of your hair as soon as humanly possible, Cass said. I should hope so, Green nodded. Who? He trailed off. This is Box, my assistant, Cass said. Green turned to Evie. Is he coming too? Yes, sir, she replied. Green seemed to mentally right himself. He returned his gaze to Cass. I understand we are searching for your previous posting, he said his words coming out stoic and solid. I have requested more information about this mission, but have been denied access. Information I assume you have. Cass didn't respond, though Green stepped closer. I am in the unfortunate position of being required to trust you will not get me or my crew killed. But rest assured, if I see something I don't like, the mission is over. I don't care what the Admiral says. I'm not risking my ship for an escaped convict. I didn't escape, Cass said, drawing himself up. I was released on parole. And ran, Green said. I won't do anything that will put your crew in danger, Cass said, only realizing what he was saying as the words came out of his mouth. Green didn't laugh, as most others probably would have. He only watched Cass. Cass was the first to break the stare. Green turned to Evie again. Commander, when he's on the ship, I want him under guard at all times. Aye, sir, she said. And this robot, too. Make sure they are both contained to non-essential parts of the ship. You mean I don't get to see the bridge? Box complained. That's my favorite part. Green only stared at him before turning back to Evie. Carry out my orders, Commander, he repeated. I'll see you aboard. He turned on his heel and left them standing there, walking with purpose back the way he'd come. He's intense, Cass said. Is that true? Did you run from your parole? Evie asked, watching the captain walk away. Cass couldn't read her. Was she accusing him? Or was she trying to understand? I didn't have much of a choice. And until a few days ago, it worked out pretty well, Cass replied. I guess everything comes back around, in the end, Evie said. She walked off too, leaving Cass and Box standing alone among the workers around them. Fifteen. As they made their way through the connecting tunnel to the Tempest, Cass caught a glimpse of his ship pulling into the shipyards and making its way toward them. He stopped in the walkway, nudging Box. Who's driving? Box turned, focusing on the ship. I have their image. As soon as we get in the ship, I'll access the manifest. Satisfied, Cass resumed the trip down the tunnel. Evie was ahead of them, waiting at the main port to the ship. It wasn't ideal, but Cass felt better about being on the Tempest than being on the station. At least he wouldn't have to stay in the same structure as Rutledge. 
Ensign Yamashita will escort you to your quarters, Evie said as they reached her. A young woman with jet black hair stepped out from behind her, dressed in a scientist's uniform. She glanced up the box. I've never seen an AMR in person before. Ensign, Evie said. Yamashita seemed to remember herself. Yes, sorry, sir. She faced Cass. If you'll follow me. She indicated they should fall into step behind her. Cass remained put, with box behind him. Yamashita turned when she realized they weren't behind her, glancing at Evie as if at a loss. Is there a problem, Captain? Evie demanded. I don't need quarters. I'll stay on my ship. And he doesn't sleep. He threw a thumb back to Box. I watch him sleep, Box said, as if it was his duty. Both Yamashita and Evie seemed at a loss for words. But Evie spoke first. You can't stay on your ship. It's a security issue. Then talk to Rutledge. I'm sure he'd love that he had to bother him with something so petty, Cass said, ramping up his own hostility. If she could act like this, then he could too. Ensign, Evie said, drawing her words out. Inform Lieutenant Page our guests will be staying on their ship. Make sure he maglocks it so the ship can't leave. She turned and left the three of them standing there. Yamashita shrugged. I guess we're going to the docking bay. Do you know if your ship is in Bay 1 or Bay 2? Which one's bigger? Cass asked. Enter, Captain Green said. The door slid open, and Evie stepped through, her posture near perfect, if she did say so herself. Relax, Commander, Green said. He was behind his desk, reviewing something on the screen in front of him. Have our guests been settled? He insisted on staying on his own ship, she replied. I didn't want to bother you or the Admiral with it. Green glanced up for a second, then returned his attention to the screen in front of him. Make sure Paige knows. Already taken care of, sir, she said. Good. He shut down the program and leaned back in his chair. Please. He indicated the seat on the other side of the desk. Evie hesitated a second, then decided it would be best not to be rude, so she took a seat. We haven't had much of a chance to get to know each other yet, Green said, but I want you to understand that I must have complete trust in my XO. You are not to protect me from any information you find pertinent. She began to nod. If you have a dissenting opinion, I want to hear it. The only way this ship works is if all of us are honest and work together. I agree, sir. She took a breath. And I'm not just saying that. A smile formed on her lips. This had been the assignment she'd been pursuing for almost four years. So it was a stealth vessel instead of an exploratory ship. So what? She wasn't about to screw it up now. Green showed a hint of a smirk. You brought Mr. Rabot in. I need to know everything you know. Tell me what he's likely to do. Unfortunately, sir, I seem to be in the dark about Ca Mr. Rabot. As I'm sure you know, I've been stationed on the outer rim of Coalition space for a long time. Not a lot of news gets out there. Green nodded, leaning forward and tapping on the table, pondering. You wouldn't have heard this. The Coalition redacted all his records. They didn't want the information getting out. But it happened right here, so most of the residents know who he is. Did you know him, sir? Before? Green considered it. Not personally, but I knew of him. Rising star in the Coalition. On track to be a captain of his own ship by the time he was thirty. Gifted engineer. No one could believe it when it happened. Sir? Evie began, glancing down for a moment. I know I don't have clearance, but what did he do? I don't want to give you an erroneous impression, since I don't know all the facts. He was first officer aboard the Atlas, Green said. 
and the ship was thrown off course. It ended up in seal space. That's pretty far off course, Evie said, building a mental map in her mind. They would have had to traverse a lot of neutral space, the large area separating coalition space from Sill. How did he get out there? The report mentions a gravimetric storm, something we haven't seen before. But you'd have to ask the Admiral. He was captain at the time. Evie sat back. Rutledge was his commanding officer? Green nodded. Apparently, on their way back, they ran into a SIL ship. Evie's hand went to her mouth. The SIL didn't see them at first. But when Rutledge ordered Cass to ready the weapons, he disabled them instead. Then he sent a coded message to the SIL, telling them where the Atlas was. What? Evie said her mind trying to wrap around the idea. He'd betrayed his crew? They managed to get out of there before the seal could do too much damage. According to the logs, Rutledge saved them. But twenty-four people still died in the attacks. When they returned here to eight, Rabot was court-martialed, and Rutledge got a promotion. I don't understand, Evie said. If he was such a model officer, then why... Why betray the coalition and put his ship in danger? Green shook his head. The psychiatrists called it a psychotic break. The pressure of performing got to him. He temporarily lost control of what he was doing. Then shouldn't he have been rehabilitated? Evie asked. That was the plan. And the reason he was only in prison for two years, Green said. But then he ran off to the Sargans, and Rutledge had him banned from returning. There didn't seem to be a desire to go find him. A lot of people were angry at him regardless. Evie furrowed her brow. It was a lot to take in. And it explained a lot about Cass's behavior. But to betray the Coalition like that? To cost those lives? It was unthinkable. I'll be honest with you, Green said, standing and going to his window that showed the rest of the shipyards beyond. Rutledge ordered me to place him back under arrest as soon as the mission is complete. Evie glanced up. Sir? He wants to make an example out of her bow. He's probably going to spend the next twenty years in prison. She screwed up her face. But Cass told me Admiral Rutledge made him a deal, Evie said, that he could go free when the mission was over. Green turned back to her. I don't like it either. But honestly, I'd feel better with him inside a cell. I don't like the idea of him roaming the ship freely. The man has no business being on any coalition ship ever again. He paused. That being said, I don't like being kept in the dark, and the Admiral has been very quiet regarding this mission's objectives. I need to know what I'm getting my crew into. Evie pondered the situation a moment. He hasn't said anything to me, other than he was the XO on the ship we're hunting. Which makes sense now. Are you asking if I trust him? Green nodded. Before you told me what he did, I would have said there was an 80% chance he'd carry out the mission without being a problem. And now? Green prompted, ridges in his forehead appearing. Twenty-five, she said. So far he'd held his word, but it hadn't been easy. He'd seemed to her like a spooked rabbit, ready to flee at the slightest noise. Though, to his credit, he hadn't needed to come at all. He could have gone off on his own and left her empty-handed. And if she'd come back without him, there was a very good chance she would not still be assigned to this ship for its mission. But, Green arched an eyebrow, I don't know if it's his guilt or what, 
but I feel like he'll see this thing through. He's had more than one chance to run and hasn't taken it. That doesn't mean he won't, Commander. I'm just being honest, Captain. Green seemed to take it in. Very well. See if you can find out anything else before we arrive. The last known location of the Atlas is a couple of days outside Coalition space. Again? That ship sure did go outside Coalition space a lot. Yes, sir, she said. She tapped her chest and rose from the seat. Dismissed. Sixteen. Crewman Robert Abernathy, Box said, using the terminal on the wall opposite of where the reasonable excuse had been parked. That's him? Cass asked, eyeing his ship. Is he still in there? Box shrugged. The ramp had been extended when Yamashita had finally gotten them down to Bay One. The ship was a flurry of activity, everyone running around, preparing for the mission. Most paid Cass no mind, but the few that did glance up passed by with angry looks on their faces. Yamashita didn't say anything else on the way down. Cass couldn't tell if she knew or not. When they arrived, a guard was already waiting for them at the door to the bay. Yamashita had handed them off, and Cass had stormed past the guard, intent on seeing his ship. So far, no one had stopped him, and the guard hadn't said anything about Box accessing the terminal. I'm going in, Cass said, making his way up the ramp. Every punch is another four months on your record, Box reminded him. Cass stopped, took a breath. Box was right. It wasn't Abernathy's fault he'd had to move Cass's ship. No, it was Evie's fault. They could have easily gotten back in the reasonable excuse and flown down here rather than take that ridiculous propaganda ride. It wouldn't surprise Cass if visiting dignitaries got the same treatment during their application to join the Coalition. It was such a pony show. A hiss of air above them notified him the lock was opened. Abernathy came strolling down the ramp, but stopped short upon seeing Cass. "'Did you scratch her?' he asked, pushing past the boy. He couldn't have been older than twenty-one, and making his way into the ship. "'Scratch her, sir?' He turned to Cass, confusion on his face. Cass laughed. It had been a long time since anyone had called him Sir. Abernathy was like Evie and Yamashita. Either too young or too new to this area of space to know who he was. Cass turned to face him. Yes, scratch, or dent, or otherwise injure. I just got her repaired and ready to go. I don't need some inexperienced pilot tearing microfractures in my ship's hull. Recognition dawned on Abernathy's face. He knew who Cass was. He'd just never seen a picture of him before. No, I didn't scratch her. He made a noise in his throat that sounded a lot like a curse and turned to leave, passing Box at the end of the ramp and exiting out through the nearest door. You do have a way with words. Box replied. Get up here and help me do that systems check. I want to make sure they didn't do anything to her. Like what? Box asked, approaching him. Like, disable the engine so I can't... so we can't leave. Cass's calm beeped before he could take another step. He tapped it while keeping it on his belt. Yes? Mr. Rabot, please report to the bridge. We are preparing to depart said an unfamiliar voice. Cass sighed, closing the comm. Fine. You do the full systems check. Look for anything out of the ordinary, he said. I want to make sure when it's time we're ready. Got it, boss, Box replied, heading into the ship. And no vids until you're done, Cass called after him, receiving no response in return. He estimated there was a 50-50 chance the check would be done when he returned. He shook his head and made his way back down the ramp. The same guard that had been near the door stood at the very bottom. 
You're my escort? Cass asked. The man nodded. Then lead the way. The doors to the main bridge opened, and Cass had to steel himself. The last time he'd been on a coalition bridge, it had ended with him being let off in a pair of cuffs. He never thought he'd see one again. Despite the relative variety of ship configurations, most coalition bridges were laid out in a familiar manner. Though Tempest was completely different, and it took him a moment to figure out where everything was. The spacious room was circular in design, with eight different stations situated around the center, all at different height levels. Sunken into the floor were stations one and two, which were the navigation and piloting stations. They were tilted up at a slight angle to get a better view of the primary navigation display in the middle of the room, which was a three-dimensional projection of what was ahead, behind, above, and below the ship. On either side of the two primary stations were the tactical station and the ship control station. They were on floor level, with control panels in front of them, and chairs, but they also had secondary control systems behind them as backups. On either side of those were the captain and XO chairs, each with their own consoles as well. While some ships had these two stations directly next to each other, it seemed the Tempest had set them some distance apart. Perhaps to get a better view of the projection in the middle? Cass wasn't sure. Finally, rounding out the circle, were two final stations directly across from each other, also at floor level, but about five meters back from the central projection. One of these had to be the engineering relay station, and the other, the station closest to the hypervator door, was probably a station configurable to whatever was necessary for the particular mission. It was blank, as if it hadn't been turned on. Along the curved walls of the bridge were various other fold-out stations. Some were redundancies, in case of damage, and others controlled other aspects of the ship that weren't necessary to be manned at all times. The other parts of the walls sported giant screens that could produce more traditional two-dimensional views of what was happening outside the ship. But the redundancy ensured if one was damaged, there were three more the crew could use if necessary. Cass took notice of the heavy-duty carpet under his feet and the decorative details on each of the stations and along the walls. Someone had gone to a lot of trouble to make this place feel comfortable, at least subconsciously. Captain Green stood from his chair as Cass entered, taking the three steps down and walking over to stand in front of him. Mr. Rebeau? Captain? Crewman Wells, please remain by the hypervator, Green said. The man behind Cass nodded and returned to the back wall. Green stood to the side. Would you like an introduction, or... Cass forced a smile. No, thank you. He glanced to the people staffing each station. Most shot him dirty looks. Though he realized the ship control officer wasn't human. It was evident by the dark blue robe he wore covering everything except his face and hands. He looked human, but anyone who'd ever met an Untuburu knew it was nothing more than a hard light projection. Their natural form underneath was decidedly very unhuman. He was the only member of the crew who greeted Cass with a smile. Cass glanced to Evie, who sat at the executive officer's station. She didn't return the favor, instead focusing on the projection in the middle of the room. Take a seat at the empty station, Green said. We are about to depart. Cass walked over, doing as he was told. It was eerie, taking orders from a captain again though he much preferred Green over Rutledge. If he looked past the display in the middle, he was staring directly at the engineering control station, the one he really wanted to see. The woman manning it didn't glance up, instead stayed focused on task, though the station was nothing more than a glorified backup for the main engineering station somewhere else on the ship. On most ships, it wasn't even manned. On this vessel, with a Klaxian in charge down in engineering, he saw they might need a liaison, especially since Klaxians only communicated with their minds. Commander, 
Are we ready? Green said, standing in front of his chair, eyeing the display in the center. The projected image was of inside the shipyards. Aye, Captain, Evie said. All hands prepare for departure. Clear all moorings and disengage all docking clamps. Everyone went to work on their respective stations. Cass couldn't do anything other than watch. Why had Green brought him up here? Surely it wasn't for Cass's own benefit. The screen showed the ship moving away from the central hub of the station, clear on all sides. Behind them, open space beckoned beyond the threshold of the station itself. The pilot didn't bother turning the ship around, instead backed it out using the primary thrusters, something Cass could appreciate. It took a certain amount of skill to send a ship backward, since most of its propulsion systems were designed to send it forward. The pilot was to his left, and he glanced over at the young man with a bronze complexion and the sunken seat, watching his hands move with grace. He was a junior-grade lieutenant, but he flew like a pro. As they cleared the station, Cass uttered, Impressive. The pilot turned his head, so his hazel eyes landed on Cass. He looked as though he was about to say something, then thought better of it and returned to his duties. Ensign Blackburn, set course for the BLV undercurrent. Best possible speed, Green ordered to the young woman with long, dark hair sitting on Cass's right. He turned his attention to the rest of the bridge crew. For those of you who don't know, this is a search and rescue mission for the USCS Atlas, lost near Sil Space ten days ago. Mr. Rabot is joining us temporarily until we locate the ship and he can confirm it is in good working condition. Sir, said the man of the tactical station. He had wheat-colored skin and sported a trimmed beard and mustache, hiding a gaunt face. To Cass he looked about forty, but his hard-edged voice and sharp features made him seem older. He's confirming? Yes, Lieutenant Page, Green said, on orders of the Admiral himself. Unless that's a problem for you... No, sir. Page flashed Cass a quick glance before returning his attention to his own station. Green took a seat and turned his attention to Cass. Mr. Rabot, we will begin our search in the area where the ship was last seen. I understand it carried a portable space dock. Oh, hell, the space dock. Cass had forgotten, or he'd chosen not to think about it. Either way, it made sense the ship still used it, given its mission. Yeah, the Coalition built a space dock that the ship could tow to a remote location to save it from needing to return to Starbase every time it needed a tune-up, he said. That hadn't been the real reason, of course. A portable space dock? The woman with the light blonde hair at the emergency station said. That seems terribly inefficient. Cass couldn't quite place her accent, but if he had to guess, it was draconian. Draconian families were some of the oldest in the Coalition. It was rare to see any of them serving on starships. Believe it or not, Cass said. Last I checked, it had its own crew, 20 to 30 workers, and about 100 drones and automated pieces of equipment. Why would they need their own space dock? Evie asked. It isn't that far between star bases or friendly planets. It doesn't make sense. She continued to avoid looking at Cass. Regardless, Green said, it's out there. We find the space dock, we find the ship. Hopefully. Undercurrent in ten minutes, Ensign Blackburn said from the navigation seat. Very good. Rond, once we're in there, make sure it's a smooth ride. Yes, sir, the man who'd almost opened his mouth to insult Cass replied. Ship reports ready, the Unterboro said. Like all of his species, his voice was like death's whisper, as in it had a heavy quality to it. There was just something about when an Unterboro spoke. The atmosphere around them seemed to dim in some intangible way. They often sent shivers down his back. Cass always assumed it was the translator the Untuburu built into their hard light projections. 
Though they all looked different, they pretty much sounded the same. They were also the only species in the Coalition to be given special permission not to wear Coalition uniforms, as, according to their religion, their robes were all they were allowed to wear off-world. Green nodded. Then it seems we are ready. Initiate all procedures, and may our efforts be fruitful. Cass watched one of the side screens as they moved through the inky blackness of space toward the invisible undercurrent. This was it. There was no more going back. 17. Box stuck his head into Cass's quarters. What you doing? Cass glanced up from the desk he'd cleaned off. For the first time in years, he'd found time to clean parts of his ship that had never seen the underside of a sonic mop. With most of the crew hating his guts and nothing else to do, he and Box had retreated to their reasonable excuse. They stayed there for everything except meals and periodic status requests from the bridge, all of which gave Cass plenty of time to get things in order. They'd hooked up the excuse's power conduits to the Tempest, keeping the batteries charged, but also allowing Cass to print anything he needed. The first thing he'd purchased was a brand new set of 1800 thread count sheets. He'd also managed to get rid of so many junk food wrappers, he'd started to question if Box had been sneaking food into his system when Cass wasn't looking. And after everything had been cleaned, there hadn't been much to do other than brood. So Cass had pulled out all his old star maps, the ones he thought he'd never use again after Vina had wrapped her chain around his neck. Just plotting our course, Cass returned his attention to the maps. They were old, printed on paper he kept rolled up and stored in special tubes in the back of his closet. He hadn't even thought about them in years. But they were reliable, drawn by some of the first explorers of these sectors. They had been the one thing he managed to retrieve after deserting the Coalition. Box entered the room. I finished World on Fire, Box said, melancholy in his voice. All 47 seasons already? It got better as it went on. I started watching on high speed. Shouldn't have done that. Cass scoffed, looking over the maps. You know, you're as bad as I am with impulse control. Speaking of which... He grabbed the bottle from the edge of his desk and took a long drink, exhaling at the end. That's better. She's still not talking to you? Box asked. Who? Cass asked, struggling to put the bottle down without spilling it all over the maps. Commander Diazol, Box replied. Why should I care who she talks to? Cass announced. She's free to talk to whomever she wants to. He gestured behind him, feeling Box got his point. Except it's bothering you. You and women, Box tisked. First Vina, now the commander. Is it because neither of them gave you any sex? Is that it? What? No, Cass replied, feeling his ears go red. He rolled his map up and tossed it on his bed. It was still messy, but at least it wasn't covered in vomit. Because the women you do sex don't seem to affect you, Box's eyes blinked. <laughs> Listen to yourself. The women you do sex. Who says that? He took a breath. It isn't about sex, and it isn't about Evie. It's being back on a coalition ship. I never imagined myself here. I wasn't prepared. For the hate, Cass nodded. At least you're not sequestered on this ship when there's a whole coalition vessel to explore. At least you get to leave once in a while. He leaned against the doorframe, crossing his arms. What are you doing? Cass asked, watching him. Being casual, you know, like you do. Cass shook his head. Whatever. Maybe I am upset about Evie. At least she was talking to me until we got here anyway. He picked up the bottle and took another swig. Hooray for the Coalition! May she long live in infamy. Boss, 
Maybe you want to. Do you know she hasn't looked at me once? I've seen her a dozen times since we came aboard, and she hasn't even acknowledged my presence. What the hell happened? She didn't seem to have a problem at Devil's Gate, or even on the way to Starbase 8. But then... What? Box asked. Cass smacked his forehead. Someone told her. He ground the heel of his palm into his forehead. How could I have been so dumb? Now we thought about it, it made perfect sense. As soon as someone who knew his past saw him, they told her what he'd done. It could have even been that ensign who'd first escorted him here the day they left. Why don't you tell her? Box asked. If it's bothering you that much. Cass glared at him through an alcohol-induced fog. Yeah, right. Stellar idea. You told me. You're not a coalition officer. Not only does it put us in potential danger, think about what kind of situation it would put her in. Especially since she's been taking orders from Rutledge. What if she reports back to him I told her the truth? Then what? Box seemed to consider it. Spacefaring accident? Cass nodded. Exactly. I just finished looking over my shoulder for the first time in a long time. I'm not about to start up again. Box was silent for a moment. Get me on the bridge. Cass looked up. What? No. These people already hate me enough. Are you saying you're ashamed of me? Box taunted. Green was very clear. You're to stay out of sensitive areas on the ship. Cass took another swig. More like all areas of the ship, Box replied, leaning into the door frame harder. They're just afraid I'll crack the ship's code, lock them out of the system. You would, wouldn't you? Cass asked. Box shrugged. If I got bored. But just before they lost all hope, I'd turn it back on. Cash shook his head again. You're insane. And you're pathetic. Locking yourself in your own ship instead of finding everything out about what's going on out there. Did you figure out how the ship moves so fast? No. Did you look into the Coalition files to see if the Atlas is still performing the same experiments? No. It wouldn't be in there anyway, Cass said. Green and the rest of them have no idea what the Atlas is doing. Rutledge wants to keep it that way. Why do you think I'm here? There has to be something, Box said, straightening himself. But you need to go look for it. I don't need you to tell me what to do and what not to do, Cass yelled, the alcohol exacerbating his anxiety. I'm just trying to get us through this in one piece and outside of any kind of room with bars on it. Isn't that enough? I guess it's going to have to be, Box replied. Evie made her way down the corridor toward Bay One. As the large door slid open, she noticed Wells still on his post beside the door. How are they doing? she asked as he caught sight of her. Same as before. They're staying put for the most part, he replied. The crewman's eyes were heavy. He'd been on the same posting for four days in a row now. No trouble? She looked up at the ship she'd spent five days on. It seemed smaller in the large shuttle bay. Not yet, though I'm not taking my eyes off him, Wells said. You know what he did, right? Evie nodded. I know. She'd been trying to reconcile it ever since the captain had told her, and she'd done a poor job at it. The best she could do was avoid Rabo and his robot for the duration of the trip. But something didn't feel right about all this, and she wasn't about to let blind hatred get in the way of her judgment. She'd gotten hold of his psych reports after some persuading of Dr. Zacks, telling her it was a matter of ship security. Zacks didn't put up much of a fight. Her people were naturally curious and scientific, and she hadn't found a reason not to give Evie the information. Crewman, take a break. I'll stand watch for a while, she said, not taking her eyes off the ship. Sir, he said. She turned to him. 
Did you not hear me, crewman? Well sputtered. No, sir. I mean, yes, yes, sir, I did. He tapped his chest and walked out of the bay, leaving Evie alone with the ship and its occupants. She checked the chronometer on her count device. It was late, and yet lights in the ship were still on. She approached the ramp and walked up, heading to the ship's main airlock. It opened without prompt. No big deal, she thought. If they ask why I'm here, I'll make something up about a spatial anomaly. Why was she there? Didn't she have enough on her plate with the initial crew evaluations due in the morning? Not to mention the primary coolant systems were only operating at 65% efficiency. And yet, she was wasting time here with these two renegades. Raised voices filled the hallway, and she made her way toward the personal quarters to hear better. The room she'd stayed in was only a couple meters away. Just not willing to give it up, Cass yelled. I told you I'd get us out of this, and that's exactly what I intend to do. And if he double-crosses you? Box asked. He must be in Cass's room with him. There was a rustling of papers before Cass replied. We'll be ready before then. The ship is charged and ready, and we've got enough supplies for a few months until we can get to the nearest non-aligned port. I'm not about to let Rutledge stop me again, not when we're so close. I promise you we will never have to deal with the Coalition again. Evie's heart panged. He thought he'd be able to get away. They still hadn't yet realized Green had ordered his ship disabled. But then again, Blom was as skilled an engineer as Evie had ever known. If anyone could disable the ship without them knowing, it was her. If they tried to run, it would only further incriminate Cass. The only problem was... He was holding up his end of the bargain. And Rutledge wanted him arrested anyway. Was it revenge? Or was there something else? Evie had no way of knowing without finding more information. And she couldn't do that unless someone magically granted her a higher security clearance. Boss, get some rest. You look like hell, Box said. I like looking like hell, he yelled. He was clearly drunk. It's your life. Box appeared in the hallway, staring at Evie, who had neglected to even try and hide herself. She froze at a loss for words. Box turned his head back so he could see inside Cass's room. Evie fumbled to say, to explain somehow. Box returned his gaze to her and put one finger against his non-existent lips. Then he strode past her, back toward the ship's cockpit. She watched him go, letting out a breath and thankful for his silence. The last thing she wanted was Cass knowing she'd snuck on a ship. She should have been more careful. There was a further rustling of papers and then a thump against what sounded like a bed. The door to Cass's room remained open, and she felt the urge to glance inside, but restrained herself. Instead, she turned back toward the airlock and let herself out. 18. Cass stumbled into the cockpit, his shirt off one arm and his pants still undone from tossing and turning the night before. What time is it? he asked. Box glanced up from his vid. Almost nine. There was a ship-wide announcement a few hours ago. We're close. What? Cass ran his hands through his hair. Why didn't you wake me? You look too peaceful. I didn't want to bother you. He returned his attention to the vid. I thought you finished that show, Cass said, writing his shirt. Spin-off series, Box replied. Of course, spin-off. Why not? Cass said to himself, adjusting his pants. When he'd woken up, he'd been dismayed to see he'd finished the entire bottle last night. And it had been a significant part of his stash. He only had three left. And since he wasn't welcome at the ship's bar, he might need to ration himself until this is over. 
Feel better? Box asked, not taking his attention away from the screen. No. Now I feel sick and hungry. They're still serving breakfast in the mess, Box said. Commander Diazol is there every morning. He snapped his attention to Box. How do you know that? She keeps a regular schedule. Breakfast right before her daily shift, he paused. Must be nice. All those waffles and pancakes, syrup and eggs, toast and rice. Stop! Cass closed his eyes and braced himself against the wall. Maybe he wasn't as hungry as he'd thought. Box turned to him. Do you need to see the doctor? No, I'm... I'll be fine, Cass replied. Then how about the ship's therapist? What? Cass sat in the co-pilot's chair. Does this ship even have a therapist on board? Box shrugged. Don't they all? Regardless, you need to talk to someone. This is tearing you up inside. Since we've been here, you've been a nervous wreck. You finished off two bottles last night. I finished off two? Cass groaned. No wonder his head hurt so bad. He hadn't had that much to drink since right after he'd escaped the coalition. I'm not seeing a therapist. Then talk to the commander, Box said. You might be surprised. Evie? The person who hasn't said one word to me over the past four days? I don't think so. She'd go right to Rutledge. Plus, I told you, it puts her in a precarious position. Look at you, concerned with others. I'd almost think you'd morph back to your human form, Box said. The words struck him. Evie had said something similar back at Devil's Gate. Fine, Cass said, standing too fast. The cockpit began to spin. He had to steady himself against the wall again. The alcohol was still swimming around his system. I'll tell her. I'm not afraid to see what happens. I guess we'll find out if we can trust her or not, won't we? He burped, not bothering to cover it. But if it turns out I'm right, make sure you've got this thing fired up and ready to go. At the first sign of trouble, we're out of here. Box blinked rapidly, indicating happiness. Good for you, boss. Getting it off your chest will be good for your misshapen, ugly soul. You know, I can always replace you with a less talkative bot. They aren't hard to come by. Cass tried to flatten the wrinkles in his shirt as he pushed his other arm through the sleeve and made his way out of the cockpit. You love me, Box called to him. I'll love it when we get out of here, Cass said, reaching his room, then his sink, and tossing enough water on his face and through his hair to make himself presentable. He even added a dab of cologne. It was more to mask the smell than anything else. Box was right. He needed to get this off his chest. Cass thought he'd be able to handle the pressure, but the constant looks, the incessant needling, was wearing him down. Someone needed to know. If just one other person knew the truth, then maybe he could get through the rest of this assignment without having a mental breakdown. There was a good reason he'd left all this behind. Out of sight. Out of mind. Cass meant to thank his escort to the mess hall, but forgot when the doors opened to reveal a bunch of crewmen walking around and eating breakfast. The commander sat at one of the far tables of the mess hall, her attention on an honest to core paper book. Cass hadn't seen one in years. He wondered if she would appreciate seeing his maps before he remembered why he was there and made a beeline toward her. Along the way, he kept his gaze straight, but couldn't help but catch dirty looks from the crew members. Though his vision swam, he didn't question his motives, except to briefly consider he might not be there at all had he only had one bottle last night. Cass avoided the food line and pulled up a chair in front of Evie, sitting down uninvited. Her eyes glanced up for the briefest of seconds before returning to the book. Make yourself at home, she said sarcastically. Got a minute? 
he asked. We're almost at the quasar, Evie said, and I'm trying to finish my breakfast. This will just take a minute. She sighed, closed the book, and took a bite of scrambled eggs. I'm not pausing my breakfast for you, so whatever you're going to say, get on with it. He noticed she'd taken a cursory look around the room. Those who weren't staring were in the midst of trying to figure out what the first officer of the ship was doing with a known criminal. But to her credit, she didn't seem to let it bother her. Instead, she waited in silence. I'm assuming someone told you, he began. I've heard the gist of it, she replied, chewing the eggs, then swallowing. Are you working for Admiral Rutledge? he asked. She sat back, the question catching her off guard. No, it was just that one assignment. Why? Because if I tell you what I'm about to tell you, and it gets back to him, it won't end well for me. Her eyes narrowed. Tell me what? Cass glanced around their immediate area. Anyone who'd been close when he'd arrived had given them plenty of room. It was as if he had his own personal force field around him at all times. The reports were faked, Cass said. The Atlas wasn't off course. We were where we were supposed to be. In Sill space? she asked. That's impossible. There's a treaty. Coalition ships don't violate Sill space. This one did. The Atlas is classified as an exploration vessel but in reality, it's a cover. It's really a battleship. Bullshit, she replied, tossing her fork down. The Coalition doesn't commission battleships. They haven't for a hundred years. They don't commission stealth ships either. And look what we're sitting on, Cass replied. She considered it. Okay, keep going. Our mission was to infiltrate Sill space. On purpose, what? Evie gasped. That's illegal. Keep your voice down, Cass shushed her. I know it's illegal. And it's in violation of the Coalition Charter and the treaty with the Sill, as well as going against the core values the Coalition purports to represent. Why? Evie asked, skeptical, though she had lowered her voice. He wasn't about to give her all the details. If she knew the real reason they'd been out there, it would put her in serious trouble, especially if she wasn't working for Rutledge. Not even some of the people who cleared the project knew what they'd been doing. I can't tell you. Just know it was Rutledge's baby. I didn't even have all the information, but from what I gleaned, he and a few choice admirals and the higher-ups made the decision. The crew on the ship and space dock was minimal for a reason. She leaned forward. To keep the secret? Can you imagine if that got out? What it would do to the coalition? He asked. There would be internal anarchy, Evie said, her eyes glazing over. The whole thing could break apart from the inside out. What if the Claxians found out? Exactly, Cass said. But why risk going into their space? We don't need the resources, and the Sill aren't a threat to us. Not since the end of the war almost a hundred years ago. I just know my mission. She studied him. So is that what happened? You did disable your ship's weapons? Only after Captain Rutledge ordered me to fire on a Sill civilian vessel we accidentally encountered, Cass said. We'd infiltrated Sill Space for two weeks when they spotted us. Rutledge said there couldn't be any witnesses. He told us to disable the civilian vessel before they sent for help. But you didn't do it, she said. He shook his head. It was the wrong call. We should have just run. I disabled our ship's weapon systems so when I refused the order, no one else could carry it out. I knew he wouldn't stop, so I sent out a coded frequency to the sill, alerting them to our presence. I thought he'd leave then, but he was too stubborn and wouldn't go. Is that why your crew died? Evie asked. Because he wouldn't leave? 
If he'd returned to neutral space and just left the damn ship alone, we could have made it back before we ran into trouble. But he wouldn't let it go. He had one of the other officers restrain me while he and the bridge engineer tried to fix the weapons. I take it you didn't have a Klaxian in your engineering section, Evie said. Cash shook his head. No such luck. He took a breath, then let it out. Anyway, two SIL warships showed up, and we barely made it back to the undercurrent before they destroyed the Atlas. On the way, Rutledge apologized to me, told me he knew he was wrong, and he'd take responsibility once we returned to eight. You can guess how well that went. He got promoted to Admiral, she said. For bravery in the face of mortal danger, Cass replied. What about the rest of the crew? Evie asked. They knew what really happened. It seems, Cass said, smacking his lips. He was parched. They all agreed with him. Or at least that's what I assume, since no one came to my defense. He grabbed her glass of water and drank the rest of it in one long draw. So, now you know the truth. I don't know what he's capable of if he finds out I've told you. Evie was speechless. She only sat in the chair, staring at him, probably trying to decide if he was lying or not. But he had to admit, he felt better talking about it. Even if she didn't believe him, he'd managed to tell his story to someone. All hands, prepare for undercurrent exit. Officers, report to the bridge. Cass glanced up to the hidden speakers in the walls. They were here. He hoped the ship had been destroyed. At least then, it couldn't do any more damage. Evie stood, gathering up her book. Come with me, she said, depositing what was left of her breakfast in the matter recycler and marching out of the room. Cass swayed slightly, getting his feet under him before he followed. Did she believe him? Was she going to talk to the captain about it? Or had he just made a fatal mistake? 19. Evie didn't say a word the entire way to the bridge. She'd dismissed Cass's escort, the same crewman who'd escorted him to the mess hall in the first place. When they got in the hypervator, she didn't look at or speak to him. Cass could only assume she was about to make a report to the captain. If that's how things were going to go, he needed an exit plan. He'd taken some time studying the ship's schematics, and because the bridge was in the center of the ship, it was easy to get to from almost anywhere. So there wasn't just one access point. It also had backup evacuation options in case of disasters. He'd noticed it when he first entered the bridge five days ago. Directly to his right and left had been doors, one leading to the captain's command room and the other leading to a conference room, as well as a second hypervader. He could use those hypervader lines to get directly to Bay 1. Cass would have to create a distraction to get past everyone and use that hyper to get down there quickly. So long as Box had done his job and didn't start daydreaming, he'd get there. The doors to the bridge opened just as the ship lurched out of undercurrent space. The rest of the crew was already there, save Blum, whose station was occupied by another engineer. And it seemed there was a different pilot as well. Rond, the kid who'd piloted the ship out of the space dock with such grace, was nowhere to be seen. Green didn't look up when Cass entered with Evie. His attention was on the main display in the middle of the room. It showed open space but in the distance was a tiny object Cass couldn't make out. He glanced over to one of the two-dimensional screens, but they only showed the same image, a tiny white object moving against a field of stars. Can we enhance that image at all? Green asked. Evie took her seat in the XO's chair, leaving Cass standing by himself. No one was paying him any attention. If he wanted he could turn right around and get back in the hypervader. But he was too intrigued by the object on the screen. Instead, he took a seat in the specialist's chair, which was still unoccupied. We're already at full magnification, the Untuburu said. 
We'll have a better look in a few minutes. What do the sensors say? Green asked. It's composed of galvanium, bortaxium, and giving off a high fusion reactor signal, Page said from the tactical station. It looks to be coalition. It's the space dock, Cass said without thinking. He'd already recognized its shape as it moved closer in the screens. It had been custom-built for the Atlas and was designed to fit around the ship in a way, almost like armor that didn't touch the outer hull. Most of that was for ease of access to certain areas of the ship while in deep space. When Cass had been stationed on the Atlas, they'd only used the space dock twice, mostly for minor repairs. Its true purpose would come later. Are you sure? Green asked. Cass nodded. Any sign of the Atlas? No, sir, the Untuburl replied. Nothing else within two light years. Green stood. Blackburn, as soon as we reach the space dock, plot a search pattern out from its current position out to five light years. I want to see if she drifted away. I, Blackburn said, already plotting the search grid. Cass could barely see her console from where he sat. "'Commander?' Green said. "'When we reach the station, you and Paige get over there. "'I want to know what's going on. "'I assume they're not responding to communications?' "'Page shook his head. "'Nothing but a faint power signature from them.' "'Green nodded. "'Sir,' Evie said, "'may I have a word?' "'Cass's heart nearly stopped. "'He glanced at Evie, then back to Green.' Neither of them paid him any attention. Of course. In my command room, please. Green turned and left the bridge through the door to the left, and Evie followed, still not looking at Cass. As soon as the doors closed, Cass felt more like an imposter than he'd ever been. Everyone else continued working at their stations, and the space dock only grew larger in the viewers. But he didn't belong here. He'd been tethered to this place by a connection he'd probably just cut in half and no longer had any reason to be here. Evie would make her report to the captain. The captain would either arrest Cass on the spot for violating the admiral's orders, or he would arrange an accident for Cass as soon as he was off the bridge. And if Green was in Rutledge's pocket, Evie's life could be in danger too. Why had he been so stupid as to tell her? Because he was still drunk from the night before? Or was it something else? Had he really needed to get it off his chest that badly? Cass realized he should have just kept his mouth shut. He'd managed to do it this long. Why had he finally broken his silence? Just as he was eyeing the hypervator door, he felt a presence beside him and glanced over. The Untuburu stood there. A smile simulated on his holographic face. Hello, he said, the word coming out as an ominous whisper. We haven't had a chance to meet. So, he reached out with his robed hand, and Cass took it, not thinking. What he ended up gripping was not a hand at all, but something that felt mechanical and hard in his grip. He let go almost immediately. Sorry, Zal said his voice deep and heavy, yet somehow cheerful. I forget to warn humans sometimes. The projection only does so much. No, it's fine. It's just been a while since I've met an Untuburu, and I've never known one willing to exchange physical contact, Cass said. I'm expanding my horizons, Zal replied. I wanted to welcome you, since no one else seems to want to. Cass appraised him. As an Untuburu, he could make the hollow projection display whatever emotion he wanted at any time. Some people said it made them untrustworthy, since you never knew what was going on behind the mask. But Cass figured he could say that about any human. Humans were excellent liars. Thanks, he said. Though I won't be here for long. I was hoping to speak with you longer, Zal said drawing out the last word, as Intuburus tended to do. It isn't every day someone leaves the coalition. I find you a fascinating person. 
Uh, sure, Cass replied. Zal's projection smiled, and he bowed slightly, the blue robe just barely concealing his face. Excellent. I will seek you out in due time. Until then, I have my duties. He turned and made his way back over to his station. Cass glanced around and caught Paige giving him a dark stare before returning his attention to his own station. Green's command door opened, revealing him and Evie together. They both returned to their respective positions. Cass cursed Zal. He'd distracted him from his only chance of escape. Rabo, Green said, you will be accompanying Diazal and Paige over to the space dock. Cass sat there for a moment, stunned. She hadn't told him after all. Yes, sir, he finally said. Paige's eyes flashed at him. Let's do this quickly and correctly, Green said to everyone on the bridge. I don't want to draw this out. He turned to Evie. When you're done on the space dock, rendezvous back with the Tempest. Hopefully, you'll find something that tells you where our ship is. Evie placed her fist to her chest. Dismissed. They stood in Bay 2, close to one of the larger support craft Tempest carried. Cass hadn't time to do a full count, but from what he could tell, the ship was equipped with 15 light support craft, ranging from shuttles to tugs to other short-range autonomous vehicles, and at least 10 or more medium-level support craft. These larger ships weren't as big as the reasonable excuse, but could carry up to 50 personnel and were outfitted for different types of missions. Some could be long-range exploratory missions, and others could be diplomatic envoys. In addition, it held a complement of 12 Space Wing-class fighter craft, outfitted with nothing but offensive weapons. Typically, they were used for the defense of a stationary object, like 8. He'd never seen them on a starship before. We're headed for Kirkini, Evie indicated the medium-level craft off to the right. Two other crewmen would be accompanying them over to the space dock, which was now visible through the open bay hangar, floating out there in space on its side. Evie climbed aboard first, with the rest of them following behind. On board, it was like a smaller version of his ship, without as many amenities. But it was very similar to the shuttle he'd disabled at Devil's Gate in decor and aesthetics. The front section of the ship was partitioned off by a door, which Evie and Paige passed through, leaving Cass with the two crewmen in the back. Stacked bunks lined the left side of the craft, each complete with its own sliding door for privacy, and on the right was storage. In the center was a conference table and chairs that folded underneath. Cass walked over to check the lockers, finding all manner of scanning equipment, as well as ten sets of Enviro suits. He moved to the back to find a washroom and toilet. Conceivably, a crew of ten could live on this craft for weeks, or even a month, if necessary. Prepare for departure, Evie's voice said over the comm, and the primary airlock slid closed, the ramp folding up under the ship. Cass glanced at the two crewmen, who didn't seem to acknowledge him, and took a seat at the planning table in the middle of the small room. They followed suit, taking the two seats furthest from him. He tapped his comm. Fox, we're off. Take care of the ship for me until we get back, he said. Be careful, boss. Don't get in over your head over there. I won't, Cass replied. The ship shook, and he could just barely feel the inertia pull him back as it accelerated through the base force field. He glanced out the window to see the ship's hull flying by and just barely caught a glimpse of Bay One, a corner of the reasonable excuse peeking out from the edge before it had disappeared and the ship grew smaller. After a few minutes of uncomfortable silence, Paige entered, heading for the lockers. We won't need the Enviro suits, he said. We'll be using the repel fields. Equip yourself with one and prepare to disembark in three minutes. He pulled five field generators out of the equipment locker, tossing one to each of the crewmen, 
then casually sending one in Cass's general direction. He had to stand and back up to catch it before it smashed into the far wall. Page didn't say anything else, only to return to the front section with the remaining two generators. Cass affixed his to his belt. They were standard equipment for non-hostile environments. All they did was generate a protective shell around the wearer when the generator detected something dangerous, but they weren't impervious. Typically, they were used in low-risk situations. Fun guy, Cash shook his head. He knew the two crewmen were staring at him, but he didn't care. A few more days, and this would all be over, and Lieutenant Page could just go shove it up his ass. Twenty. They didn't land on the space dock. Instead, Evie piloted the ship so it matched the space dock's rotation and speed. They just used the manual docking with the main airlock. Page was the only one armed with a weapon, and he went first, everyone else following with their own scanning equipment, all except for Cass, who had nothing. I'd be a lot more helpful if I had a diagnostic device he told Evie as they waited for Paige to open the airlock on the station side. You have everything I've been cleared to give you, she replied. He saw the two crew members exchange looks. The second airlock opened, and Cass's ears popped as there was a rush of stale air into the ship. The corridor beyond was dark, save for a few emergency lights. Paige glanced around, assessing the situation. Everyone stay there until I get the power on he said, disappearing into the darkness. Got any theories? Evie asked. Cass turned to her. About the power? Probably the station going into power-saving mode when it doesn't detect anyone using any of the primary systems. Standard stuff. Which begs the question, Evie said, why doesn't it detect anyone? The lights in the station blinked to life, illuminating the corridor beyond. Page returned from around the corner. Let's go, he said. Fifteen minutes later, Cass and Evie made their way down one of the side corridors, while the others made their way to the main command center of the station. Page had seemed happy to have Cass out of his hair. You didn't tell Green, Cass said as they walked. It didn't seem necessary at the time, she replied. What can he do about it now, anyway? He could toss me in the brig, Cass replied, or out an airlock. Evie scoffed. He wouldn't do that. The airlock, I mean. He's one of the most respected captains in the Coalition. If there's one thing I've learned, it's you never know who has skeletons in the closet. Usually it's the people you least expect. He peered down the empty corridor. It was so odd to see it so desolate. That may be true, but Green is different. He keeps his personal life close to the chest, but I don't think I've known anyone with more integrity. Haven't you only been working with him a few days? Cass asked. Her brows pinched together. Ah, Cass said. He's got a stellar reputation then. Those are never unreliable. Let me ask you something. If you're so sure of his character, then why not just tell him? She turned and grabbed his arm, stopping him. Because he's my captain, and all I've got is the word of a convicted criminal. Until I have something more concrete, I'm protecting his interests. It's what a good first officer does. You should know that, she let go. Thanks, I guess, Cass said, regardless of your motives. At least you don't think I'm crazy. I don't know what to think, she said. Based on your behavior and what I know about you, I'm inclined not to believe any of it. But... What? Something isn't adding up. I'm not so sure you are wrong. But until I can prove it, there's no sense involving the captain. Cass nodded. He hadn't expected her to actually take him at his word. Nor had he. Thankfully, he'd had a chance to sober up since the mess hall and now he could see what a monumental risk it was to tell her. It didn't seem that she was working for Rutledge after all. Although, 
An abandoned station in the middle of space was a good place to get rid of a body. What? Evie said. You've got a strange look on your face. Commander, we've reached the control center. Please rendezvous with us here, Paige's voice said over the comm. Understood, Lieutenant. She tapped the back of her hand, ending the transmission. She turned back to Cass. Let's move. What do you have? Evie asked, entering the small command unit. It was like a stripped-down version of the Tempest's bridge, without the central display system. Instead, massive windows on one of the walls showed the other side of the dock beyond. Paige turned to one of the crewmen. This room is full of an inorganic residue we can't identify, she said. But it's been here almost two weeks. When was the Atlas last heard from? Evie asked. Two weeks ago, Paige replied. She turned back to the crewman. Is there anything you can tell me about the residue? It's only in this room. Nowhere else on the station. If it were the remains of the crew, we'd expect it to be all over the dock. Let me see it, she said. The crewman moved to the side and pointed to one corner where the other crewman was working, taking a sample from the floor. Evie approached, getting down on her haunches to get a better look. Cass moved closer, but Paige put out a hand. That's far enough. Lieutenant, Evie said, he's here for a reason. Paige studied him for a moment, dropping his hand. Cass didn't break his stare until he was well past him. He leaned down beside Evie. Any clue? she asked. Is this what you were sent to find? He'd never seen the substance before. It seemed to be nothing more than black dust. Definitely not. Get a sample, and let's move on, Evie said, standing. She turned to Cass. How many crew did this thing have? Twenty-three, the last time I was here, he said. But that was seven years ago. Though I'm not sure the dock is rated to hold many more. It's supposed to be mostly autonomous. All the escape pods are still in place, Paige said, looking at one of the monitors. Evie turned back to Cass. Is what you're looking for here? He went over and performed a quick scan of the station. It was obvious it wasn't here. What Rutledge wanted was more than likely on the ship, and there's no way anyone on the space dock would have left it unguarded. The dock was nothing more than an accessory, a way to keep everything the Atlas was working on secret and in good working order. It never would have been on the station in the first place. Cash shook his head. He really wished the ship had been here. He'd be done and off by now. Evie nodded. Download all the logs. We'll take them back with us. Let's get back to the Krakini. Every second we waste here, the Atlas gets further away. Hey, Cass said, pulling Evie aside as everyone else disembarked back on the Tempest. She turned to him. I know you're the reason I was over there. I didn't want you to think I overlooked that. Is that your attempt at a thank you? She asked walking down the short ramp while he kept up beside her. No, it's just, I'm glad to know there are people out there that are still capable of fairness. She studied him a moment. It's stupid to have you on this ship if we're not going to use you. Taking you along was reasonable. The captain just had to be convinced you could be trusted. Ahead of them, Paige stood at the main bay doors, watching as they approached. You like staring contests, Paige? Cass asked as they passed. It seems to be your favorite pastime. Page gritted his teeth. Permission to escort the criminal back to his quarters. Denied. I want him back on the bridge, Evie said. We're back to square one here, and Mr. Rabot may have some insight into our next move. Page didn't say anything else, only fell in step behind them. The two crewmen had already disappeared to what Cass assumed were the science labs to analyze the dust. Cass's comm beeped. Boss, you back okay? Box asked. Cass tapped the device. Yep, smooth trip, Box. 
I'll... Did you confess your feelings toward the commander? He asked. Evie slid her eyes to him without looking over, but didn't falter. Cass cringed, feeling Paige's gaze boring into the back of his neck. I will talk to you later, Cass cut the calm. You'll have to forgive him, he said. He watches a lot of drama. He thinks we're becoming a bonded pair. There was a snort of derision from behind Cass. He ignored it. Evie scoffed. If he breathes, I tell him not to hold it, she said, as they reached the hypervator doors. Cass was more embarrassed than anything else, though he tried not to let it show. When he got back to his ship, Box was getting all his vid privileges revoked. A short trip later, they were back on the bridge, Paige taking a station from a female officer Cass didn't know. Evie held him back as Green approached. Commander, he said, his eyes flicking between them. No luck, Captain. Whatever we're looking for, it wasn't on the dock, Evie replied. I wasn't expecting it to be, Cass said. It's not something that would have ever been removed once, well, once the Atlas had it. He had to be careful. If he revealed too much about what they were looking for, Rutledge would have him arrested for certain. This is so frustrating, Green said, turning his back on them and staring at the display in the center of the room. For what it's worth, Cass said, it wasn't my desire not to tell you. Green faced them again. Curious. You're still following orders. After everything that's happened to you, Believe me, Cass said, it's purely self-serving. Green appraised him a moment. Suggestions? he said, turning to Evie. The search is coming up empty. I believe there's a non-aligned port of call not far from here, she said. It's small, but they may have heard or seen something. We may want to try our luck there, see if anyone's been talking about Coalition Salvage. Green pondered a moment. Very well. Prepare an infiltration team. We'll have to use one of the unmarked shuttles. Sir, Cass said without thinking. We could use my ship. It would attract less attention. Green turned his attention to Evie, the intensity of his look saying what didn't need to be said. After a moment, she nodded. I think it would be better camouflage. Even our unmarked shuttles are recognizable. It's not as hostile as a Sargan outpost, but there are still a lot of non-aligned species who aren't happy with the Coalition. It's your show, Commander, Green said. Just make sure you cover all your bases. Twenty-one. Where is this port again? Box asked, standing in the middle of the hallway. Shatan. You know, that place where we picked up that horologist a couple years back? Along the RQQS undercurrent? Oh, the one on the asteroid. That's the one, Cass said, pulling a new shirt on. It was less smelly than the last, though it still needed a good wash. What have you been doing this whole time? This place is a mess. I got bored. Couldn't find one of my data drives, Box replied. You'll have plenty of opportunity to clean up again on the way back. Cass grumbled to himself as he yanked on another set of boots. He was going for his classic look, something that wouldn't stand out in Jatan. Not Sargan, not Coalition. Have you done anything useful? he asked. I emptied the coffee maker. It had all this crusty brown residue in the bottom. Took me almost two hours, and I managed not to break it. Box said, poking his head in. Are you decent yet? Enough, I suppose, Cass said, catching his reflection in the mirror. He'd added an extra heavy coat and gloves. Jatan was cold, even inside. Satisfied with the level of ruggedness he'd self-inflicted, Cass returned to the hallway. Go ahead and plot the course. I'll wait until... The airlock opened, revealing Evie. She was wearing the sword again and sported a large leather coat. 
I see you're familiar with Jatan, Cass said, taking in her outfit. I do my research, she replied, walking past him to the cockpit. An old mining colony on an asteroid hurtling through space, where the system's sun only reaches the surface at random times. It's bound to be about as cold as you can get. Cass had turned his back on the airlock when it opened again, revealing the same ensign who'd originally escorted him when he'd first boarded the ship. She was also dressed in mercenary gear, though she looked less threatening than Evie in her more tailored clothes. Ensign, Cass began, struggling to remember her name. Yamashita, she reminded him. Just call me Laura. I don't need you telling every alien on that station I'm with the Coalition. Cass furrowed his brow. You don't think I can handle myself out there? I'm pretty sure I know how to navigate a place like Jatan. Can you say the same? How long have you been out of the Academy? A year? Her face turned red, but she didn't reply. Is there a problem? Evie asked, approaching them. Not with me, Laura said. Cass? Evie prompted. He let it go, though held Laura's stare for a moment. We're good. He turned away from them while Laura walked down the corridor, exploring the ship. He looked over at Evie. Remind me again why she's here? She's the best exobiologist on the ship. If we encounter something we don't know how to deal with over there, she'll know how to communicate. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I don't think it's going to be that hard, Cass said. If someone's heard of or has coalition parts from a salvage job, they're going to want to get rid of them. And if anyone's heard of a derelict coalition ship, word will have traveled fast. It was a good idea coming over here. Thanks. Evie had a faraway look in her eyes. Then she seemed to come to herself. Let's get going. Box expertly piloted the ship through the few asteroids left in the field, though they really weren't close enough to be of any danger to the reasonable excuse. The Tempest, which at this moment was parked behind another planet in the system to obscure it from any non-aligned ships, might have had more trouble. But as asteroid fields went, this one was pretty typical, sparse enough for easy transit. When they arrived at the colony, there were already a dozen larger ships in orbit of the small asteroid, all locked into a geosynchronous orbit. Box landed on one of the 30 pads available for passers-by. Cass watched as Box began the shutdown procedures, feeling just the slightest bit of envy at his skill. But he just wasn't pilot material. Never had been. He knows how to fly. I'll give him that. Evie said, as the four of them exited through the airlock into the colony's tunnels. As soon as they stepped inside, a blast of cold hit them. Somehow, it felt even colder than the last time Cass had been here. He's also not impervious to compliments, Box said from behind them. He likes to be told he does a good job to his face. Evie turned, a sheepish grin on her mouth. Box, I apologize. You are an excellent pilot. Thank you, Commander. Box's optics burned with yellow intensity. Cass couldn't help but grin himself. Split up? he asked, his breath visible as he surveyed the tunnel. It was large enough to drive a small shuttle through. But there weren't a lot of people around. A few passed through, but it wasn't nearly as crowded as Devil's Gate. Most of the warm bloods would be near the heated areas. Evie nodded. Laura, you go with Cass. I'll take Box. I assume he knows what we're looking for. He knows it, Cass replied, shooting Box a look. It was times like this when he wished the robot had a more expressive face. You find anything, calm me. And don't lose each other. This is not the place to get lost. Evie was talking to both of them, but Cass had the feeling the warning was more for Laura than him. She didn't seem scared, but instead alert, on edge. Box, let's go. Cass turned to Laura. We should start asking around in the main trading areas. Laura shrugged and turned, leaving him in the tunnel. He picked up the pace to catch up with her. You didn't know who I was when we first met, did you? No, 
and I don't care now, Laura replied. Bullshit. You couldn't have a bigger chip on your shoulder if you tried. And what? Laura said, avoiding his gaze. You don't think you deserve it? All I'm saying is don't feel like you need to hide it. Don't conceal things on my account. Laura shook her head as she walked. I don't see why the commander keeps giving you opportunities. Let me guess, Cass said. If you were in her position, you would have run me through with a sword already. That brought a smile to her face. Not exactly, but I wouldn't let you come on missions. I'm only here because I have to be, on orders from the Admiral. Evie didn't have a choice, Cass said. They turned a corner. This tunnel felt a bit warmer. They were quickly approaching the common areas. That's disrespectful, Laura said. What? It's Commander Diazol, not Evie. She glowered at him. Maybe to you. But I'm not in the system anymore. To me, she's just plain old Evie. You still shouldn't do it. She clenched her jaw. Why does it bother you so much? Cass asked, narrowing his eyes. It doesn't. It's fine, Laura said, picking up the pace. Wait. Wait just a second, Cass said, a smile spreading across his face. This is more than just respecting a superior officer, isn't it? I don't know what you mean. They emerged into a large carved-out space. Shops and eateries had been erected along the walls of the cavern, and there were large gathering spaces all around. The area was heated by giant red lamps above that made the space about 20 degrees warmer than the tunnels. Let's just start talking to people. Whatever you say, Cass replied. Evie walked beside Box through the tunnels, moving down into the lower sections of the old colony. They'd already talked to six different people, finding nothing promising so far. The lower sections were more dangerous, as it was where unlawful transactions were more likely to take place. But they had the best chance of finding information there. Box was surprisingly silent as they walked. The entire time she'd been on the ship from Sargant's space to wait, he'd been talking nonstop whenever she'd exited her room. Something wrong? she asked. I'm not the biggest fan of enclosed spaces, Box said, his head moving back and forth to survey the walls and ceiling of the tunnel. Don't worry, she said. This place has been here for hundreds of years. If it was going to collapse, it would have done so by now. He didn't reply, only kept his pace. I guess you can't tell me any more about what happened to Cass, can you? She prodded. He'd given her a lot of information back in the mess hall, but not all of it. There were still missing pieces, and she needed to find out what they were before she made any kind of decision whether she should tell the captain. The biggest red flag was Rutledge's insistence Cass be arrested once the mission was over. It hadn't sounded right from the beginning. But after what Cass had told her, it made a lot more sense. If Rutledge really did order him to fire on a civilian vessel, that could be very damaging. Of course, without any proof, it was a criminal's word against an admiral's. Unfortunately, I've been sworn to secrecy. Box replied, then glanced at her. It's for your own protection. She sighed. So everyone keeps telling me. But I'm getting sick of being the last person to know everything. I would tell you if I could, Box replied. I heard your calm earlier when we got back from the space dock, Evie smirked. Oh, regarding your future love affair? Yes, I am quite excited about it. Box replied, his posture suddenly better. Box, there is no love affair. That's not going to happen. But you're perfect for each other. The daring rogue and the prim officer, starstruck lovers from the moment they met. He turned to her. I've heard you banter. It's net drama gold. Evie shook her head, holding back a laugh. It just doesn't work like that, Box. I'm sorry. Even if it were somehow possible, I'm not attracted to him. Then why are you being so fair to him? 
Women are only nice to him if they want to sleep with him. Others just brush him off. Either that or try to shoot him, Bach said, throwing his hands up. Because I believe everyone deserves a fair chance, no matter their background, she replied. And if it turns out he's right, and Cass got a bad deal, the coalition is going to owe him one hell of an apology. She winced as she said it. Because no matter what happened, he would get a raw deal anyway. As soon as the ship was found, he'd be thrown in the brig until they got back to the starbase. And then he'd be in there forever. Or until he could be shipped off to a coalition world for rehabilitation, which in Cass's case probably wouldn't be pleasant. She had to do something. She tapped the back of her hand, activating her comm. Report. Cass's voice came through a few minutes later. Nothing yet. No one seems to know anything about it. Evie sighed, hoping this hadn't been a fool's errand. At the very least, there was one thing she could do here. Rendezvous in twenty minutes in the common area. Anything? Evie asked, approaching Cass and Laura. Box walked behind her. He'd seemed more relaxed when they entered the larger caverns. Cass shook his head. Though Laura spoke with the Plagarian for the first time. Laura's eyes were bright with excitement. It was thrilling. I never thought I'd get the chance. Evie smiled, then turned to Cass. Can I talk to you a second, alone? She caught the briefest of strange looks from Laura before she managed to right herself. Evie would file that one away for later. Sure. He allowed her to lead him into one of the small alleyways between establishments. When she was sure they were out of sight of any surveillance, as well as Box's hearing, she turned to him. I already told you I'm not into kinky stuff, he grinned. She turned away. You're being set up. He suddenly turned serious. What? The Admiral. He ordered Green to arrest you as soon as the mission was over, not to let you leave. You've got to be fucking kidding me, Cass said, kicking the nearest thing to his boot, which happened to be a Grissarian block, which shattered upon impact. I knew it. I knew that snake wouldn't keep his word. He didn't the first time. Why would he now? He balled his hands into fists, then turned back to her. See what I get? See what happens when I try to help? I knew I should have just left you on that station and gone on my merry way. Evie didn't reply, only leaned back against the wall, watching him. She could be demoted for telling him. She could lose her commission, and most definitely her posting. But she couldn't go on any longer with Cass thinking he would be a free man. It wasn't fair to him. She didn't like how the whole situation smelled. It was all contrary to the Coalition's most basic principles. And with everything that happened after he told her in the mess hall, she hadn't had a lot of time to process it all. I thought you should know, she said, feeling the length of the sword press into her back. He gave the order as soon as I was on board, didn't he? Cass asked. Before. Right after you met with him, I assume. Fine, Cass said, fuming. That's just fine. If that's how he wants to play, then that's how we'll play. He turned, leaving the alley back the way they'd come. Evie watched him go, hoping she hadn't just made the biggest mistake of her career. 22. Cass stormed from the alleyway toward Box and Laura, who seemed to be engaged in a conversation of their own. Box, let's go, he said. Box turned to him. I was just having a lovely conversation with this fertile female about World on Fire. Did you know she's seen it as well? Fertile? Laura said, resting her hands on her hips. I don't care. I need to talk to you. Alone, Cass said. Evie approached from the alley as well. Excuse me, Laura. It seems my boss is having a tantrum day, Box said, making a slight bow, then following Cass. Don't do that, 
he snapped. Do what? Belittle me in front of others, Cass replied. He didn't need Box making the situation any worse. They moved through the crowds, pushing around all the different species packed in close to the heaters. Somewhere off to the left came the sound of shattering dishes, followed by a smattering of applause and boos. One of the restaurants. When they were far from Evie and Laura, Cass turned around. They're going to arrest me. Box's yellow optics blinked in confusion. Who? Green. Under orders from Rutledge. He never intended on keeping his word. Which means, I assume, he plans on impounding the ship, and you too. How do you know? Box asked. Evie just told me. They got the orders before we even left. Box lifted his hand and stroked what passed for his chin. We shouldn't do anything rash. This might work out in our favor. Cass shook his head. No way. I'm not getting back on that ship. We need to leave this place on the reasonable excuse and never look back. Like we should have done in the first place. Had I actually listened to myself, instead of letting my bleeding heart speak for me, we wouldn't be in this situation. He was only making himself angrier, but he couldn't help it. Everything he'd worked for was on the line, and just when he thought maybe the coalition wasn't as bad as he'd remembered, it came back and reared its ugly head. We can't get away, Box said. Not with the Tempest out there monitoring us. Don't forget... It's a lot faster than any other ship around. They'd have us in a matter of hours. Not if we could sneak away, Cass said. And what about Evie and Laura? Do we just leave them here? They're adults, Cass said, his mind running through escape scenarios. They'll figure it out until someone comes to get them. They would need a distraction, something that would keep the Tempest here long enough for them to sneak away. But with it hiding out there behind the third planet in the system, it would take something substantial to keep their attention. Commander Diazal just told you this information. Don't you think you owe her something more than just to be stranded on a non-aligned station in hostile space? Not everyone of the Coalition is bad. By your own litmus test. He didn't want to think about Evie at the moment. He needed a plan. That's where he needed to put his focus. He hadn't spent all that time working for Vina just to be thrown in prison. Worst case scenario, he could always go back to her with a clean slate, if he had no other choice. Right now he was fueled, stocked, and ready to go. If the distraction was big enough, there would be no way for Rutledge to find him again. Once they were gone, they'd be gone, off into the deep reaches of space if necessary. Box tried again. Just explain the whole thing. She'll understand. And from what I know about Green, he might too. I can't take that chance, Cass said. I already put too much on the line telling her what I did. They're not going to give me a second chance. We have to make this happen while we have the element of surprise. The only way this would work is if he could keep away from Evie and Laura. A plan was forming in his mind. He glanced to the side. People moved back and forth, all going about their business. A Spaxian, about three meters tall, lumbered past, his blue eyes the only discernible feature on his furry face. He pulled a white ball from underneath his robe and dropped it in his mouth, crunching as he moved along. It caused Cass to glance up to the cameras, Surveillance cameras ran the gamut of the main common areas, but they wouldn't have them everywhere. They wouldn't have them in the bowels of the colony. He jogged over to one of the access terminals, with Box directly behind him. I need the manifest transfer schedule for the rest of the day, Cass said. Box nodded, going to work on the terminal. He was done in a matter of seconds. Cass peered around him to see the full schedule before him. What are you looking for? Box asked. A spark. When they returned to Evie and Laura, the women had been in the middle of interviewing more people in the common areas. 
They returned to Cass and Box when they saw they were back. Have any luck? Evie asked. Cass shook his head. You? Nothing yet, but there has to be something there. There are species here from at least thirty worlds, most of them in relative proximity to the system. A coalition ship doesn't just disappear. No, it doesn't, Cass replied, wishing they'd found both debris and nothing at all. Because at least if they'd found debris, the search would be over. But if the search was over, then so was his freedom. He was done playing nice. Look, we're heading down to the lower levels. I want to talk to some of the people down there. They might be willing to give up some more information. For a price. He glanced over to Evie. Transfer me a few thousand? To your personal account? No way, Evie said. You start bribing people, and they'll tell you whatever you want. And if you don't, they'll never tell you anything, Cass said, his hand outstretched. Evie huffed and pulled out a small unit from one of her jacket pockets. Fine, but I'm going with you this time. Laura, you and Box continue finding out what you need up here. She tapped the device, and Cass felt his personal comm buzz with a transfer. No, Cass replied. I want Box with me. Things can get rough down there. I need protection. Evie gave him such a pitiful look, he wished he hadn't tried to cover the lie at all. Don't worry, she said, patting the sword. I think you'll be fine. He could still make this work. Box just had to make sure he was on the reasonable excuse by the time Cass was done with his meeting. And he'd have to find a way to incapacitate Evie. There was just no other way around it now. Box, get back to the ship. I want to make sure no one's poking around. The censors would have alerted us, Box protested. Still, Cass pressed, you never know in a place like this. Someone might have a cloaked refractor or a subsonic emitter. I want to make sure we can take off when we need to. He forced his gaze on Box, doing his best to impress how important this was. After all their close calls, he had full confidence Box could be ready. But his allegiances might be conflicted at the moment. He'd never disobeyed Cass before, but there was a first time for everything. Yeah, sure, Box said, glancing at Laura. Worst case scenario, they could fire her out of one of the ship's two escape pods and pick up a replacement sometime later. They could even point her back in the direction of the station. That might be ideal. Evie would probably feel better about him if Laura stayed with Box. Time's wasting, Evie said, already heading back toward the tunnels. See you back on the ship, Cass said to Box as he followed her. Box only nodded in response. Twenty-three. Are you feeling okay? Evie asked as they made their way down into the lower levels. The walk was long, since there were no hypervators anywhere in the colony. Most of the storage was brought in by cargo transport that docked on the exposed part of the asteroid where shipping containers used to sit waiting to be filled with alkyrium ore. A couple hundred years ago, the ore had been a valuable resource. But with the advent of galvanium, it had become obsolete, and the mine had been abandoned. Strategically, Carper wasn't an important system, and it had no inhabitable planets, as they were all gas giants. So it made sense a non-aligned colony would eventually pop up here, out in the middle of nowhere, and from what Cass had seen upstairs, it had been thriving. Not really, Cass replied. I'm sorry I sprung that on you. I just thought you should know. I'm impressed you're sticking it out, though. I half thought you might try to run, she said, trying to keep her voice lighthearted. I haven't yet, he replied. I know the crew thinks I'm crazy, Evie said, but I just don't believe one mistake should define a person's life. And if what you told me was true, you didn't even do anything. If? Cass prompted. He was still furious, and now she was questioning his story. She still didn't even believe him. I'm a coalition officer, she said, 
And as much as I love to go on someone's word alone, I can't do it. I need concrete proof. Concrete proof doesn't exist, Cass said. So you either believe me or you don't. She didn't reply, which gave him his answer. That was fine. At least he wouldn't feel as guilty about leaving her behind. They reached the lower level in silence. It was a wide space full of shipping containers in one direction and a dark corridor in the other. The wide space had different partitions of containers, each indicating a different cargo port. Not all the slots had something to ship, and this place was notorious as a place where illegal goods could be exchanged. Cass wondered just how many valuables were in some of these containers. Probably enough to buy five reasonable excuses. Voices drifted over the quiet, and two figures appeared from behind one of the crates, approaching Cass and Evie. Evie put her mouth in a thin line, stiffening, while Cass just relaxed back, not wanting to appear threatening. "'What is your business here?' one of the figures asked. Cass couldn't tell if the voice was male or female. The person's face was obscured by a mask of a dragon. "'We're looking to buy a Type Four Coalition thrust assembly,' Evie said, her face completely straight. "'We heard someone might have one for sale down here.' "'And?' the other, shorter figure said. Evie produced hers, and a small beam flashed over it. "'And?' he said to Cass. Cass stuck his out, and the same light flashed on it. The figure nodded to the other one. They both moved out of the way as Cass and Evie entered the large area. I guess it's a good thing we did a DNA scramble, she whispered. You did. I have no need to, Cass replied. Things actually tend to go better for me in places like this when people find out I've defected. You didn't defect, Evie said. That's not what the record says. Cass chuckled. He should know. He wrote it himself before getting Box to upload it to the Sarkan servers. Evie glanced around. This place is huge. Where do we start? I'll head down that way, Cass said, indicating straight ahead of him. You start checking for anyone in that section over there. Another wide corridor branched off from the main one and ran at a perpendicular angle away from the first. Shouldn't we stick to... We don't have the time. We need to find it as soon as possible, and we can't wait to play it safe. Don't worry about me. I know how to defend myself. Evie huffed. Calm me if something goes wrong. Just beep the calm twice. You don't have to say anything. Yeah, you too, Cass replied. She watched him a second longer than he would have liked, then turned and made her way down the adjacent corridor. He followed his own corridor, knowing full well he was about to betray her, betray everything she had trusted him with. And for a moment he hesitated. It had been a long time since someone had placed trust in him that wasn't motivated by something other than greed or power or even revenge. But he couldn't go back. And if he didn't take this chance right now, he'd never see the infinity of space again. Rutledge would have him imprisoned forever. His ship was here, fueled and ready to go. Box was set. All he had to do was take a few more steps, find the Plagarians. It was simple. So why was he hesitating? Cass stood there a moment, leaning against one of the shipping containers. It was a large, nondescript box. But somehow, it seemed familiar. He'd been too distracted before to notice it. But now he did, he realized he did recognize it. It was the same kind Vina used when she was shipping people through one of the larger couriers. She'd pack them inside, as many as the container could handle, then ship them off to some core forsaken planet as laborers or other kind of slaves. Cass had never gotten that dirty. He couldn't in good conscience do it. If he had... He'd never had to worry about parts for his ship again. But he also wouldn't have been able to sleep at night. The container presented a larger problem. Why was one of Venus' containers way out here, outside Sargan space? The only way it could be here is if one of her couriers delivered it. 
and Cass wasn't aware of any courier working this far outside her territory. He inspected the container, hoping to find some evidence of when it had been shipped or which transport it had come on. But it had no markings other than her telltale seal that only the couriers knew. It helped keep them from stealing from each other when they were off-world. Vina liked competition, but not for her own goods. Cass knocked on the side of the container, praying he was wrong, that someone had marked the box incorrectly or perhaps even reused one of her containers. But then there came a light knock in response. It sounded weak. Fuck, Cass said. He had two choices. Either leave them to their fate or try and get them aboard the reasonable excuse. Neither was ideal, considering there could be as many as twenty humans inside. Unfortunately, not everyone always survived the journey. He tapped his comm twice to alert Evie. There was no other choice. He couldn't leave these people here. He'd have to abandon the plan. As he was looking for a seam to break, he caught voices approaching. At first he thought it might be Evie speaking to someone on her own comm. But as they grew closer, he realized they were familiar for an entirely different reason. They were the same Plagarians Laura had spoken with earlier. He ducked down behind another set of crates, out of sight. "'And you guarantee full happiness?' one of them said in their odd lilt. They spoke through a type of translator that didn't always get the words correct, as it was trying to interpret the Plagarian's emotions about any given topic. Laura had enjoyed the challenge. "'Of course. If there's a problem, just contact my mistress. She will reimburse you.' said another voice Cass recognized. Rasp, Vina's first lieutenant. He must have been the one to deliver the cargo out here. Insufficient goods will be expunged, one of the three Plagarians said. I'm sure you'll be satisfied, he said. Now, where is my payment? The human is strong any moment, a Plagarian said. Human? And you're sure it's him? Rasp asked. Joyful. We scanned his life earlier. Rabot confirmed. He set up appointments. Shit. Backstabbing Plagarians. No wonder they weren't allowed into the coalition. They were going to turn him into Vina. But why would she want him now? Evie had compensated her. And how did she find him in the first place? Something was very wrong here. He needed to notify Box. We will inspect sorrow, a different Pulgarian said. Afternoon. Cass peeked around the crates to see the four of them standing there. Rasp was nodding. Yes, yes, inspect whatever you want. There's enough life support to keep them alive another day or so. But you haven't delivered my payment. And if I don't get my payment, you don't get yours. Very angryable, the first Pulgarian uttered. Rasp shook his head and walked closer to where Cass hid. He stopped less than a meter from him. Yeah, yeah, it's Rasp. Get her for me. A pause. I don't care, just get her. Another pause, and Cass risked an exhale. My queen, Rasp said after another moment, I've made the delivery, but Rabot isn't here. I think the Plagarians played us. Another pause. Yes, of course, they played me. I apologize. Cass drew in another breath, holding it. No, his ship's here. It's docked on the asteroid. I saw it when I came in. They're here looking for it. Him and that coalition woman. Cass almost made a noise in his throat. Could Vina know what they were looking for? How? And they knew Evie was from the coalition. What was going on? No, they don't have a clue. I will. Yes, mistress. You can count on me. Rasp ended the call. Cass didn't have a choice. He needed to take control of the situation. It was now or never. Twenty-four. As soon as Rasp turned his focus back on the Plagarians and his comm was in his pocket, 
Cass jumped from his hiding place and tackled him from behind, knocking him to the ground. They both landed with an oof. Cass made a move to flip Rasp over and start pummeling him, but an ear-piercing screech penetrated the air, causing both of them to cover their ears. Even through his hands, the noise was close to unbearable. Cass glanced up at the three Plagarians standing still, yet wailing at the top of their lungs. Shut them up, Cass yelled. Rasp either didn't hear him or didn't care. He struggled under Cass's weight, throwing him off. He got up on his knees, but kept both hands to his ears. The Plagarians remained motionless, screeching. As long as they kept wailing, there was no way either of them could make a move for each other. The sound would burst Cass's eardrums if he removed his hands. Cass got on his feet and made a move to charge one of the Plagarians. When the tallest one of the back collapsed, his screech silenced. Behind him stood Evie, sword drawn and tiny blinking devices in her ears. Rasp caught sight of her at the same time and took off running. Evie took the hilt of her blade and smashed it into the small space between the shoulders of the other two Pulgarians, knocking them out cold. The noise stopped, and Cass dropped his hands. Her face was red. The Plagarians! You were going to make a deal with them? she yelled, tapping each of the devices in her ears. Cass shook his head. We don't have time. Vina knows what we're looking for. He pointed to the crate behind him. And there are people in there. They're payment to the Plagarians for info about me, about what we're doing. She sheathed her sword in one simple move. I know, I heard. We can come back for them. We have to find Rasp. She took off running in the direction he'd gone, and Cass ran after her, pulling his comb from his pocket. Box, Vina is close by somewhere. Rasp is here in the lower levels. Make sure you have all defenses on high alert, he yelled into the device. You got it, boss. But I doubt she'll try anything this close to the colony. The other ships won't let her fire. I knew I couldn't trust you, Evie fumed as they pursued Rasp deeper into the storage areas. I never should have told you about your arrest. Of course you would go to the one species that hates the Coalition more than any other. I wouldn't say that, Cass replied. The Plagarians are just mad because you accepted the Ocarians into the Coalition and made them refugees from their own planet. How would you feel if some hulking organization came to your planet, sided with 90% of the population, and exiled the rest? That was 70 years ago, she yelled, and that was a complex situation. You're oversimplifying it. Yeah? How so? Cass countered. A bullet struck the wall to his right, and he grabbed Evie, pulling them both down. Rasp stood behind the cover of another crate, firing his weapon again. It struck right above their heads as they got behind their own cover. Cass automatically reached for his boom cannon, realizing it was still in the security lockup in the Tempest. Damn it, he said. This is why you don't take a man's weapon from him. I don't need a gun. Evie drew her sword again and gripped the hilt with both hands. She crab-walked out of cover, moving quickly. Rasp fired at her again. Only he couldn't get a good beat on her as she was staying low and fast, not repeating a pattern as she moved. He was obviously becoming more panicked the closer she came, as he fired fast but wild. Before he knew what was happening, she was on him, her sword to his throat, and his gun off to the side, having been dropped when she'd nicked his hand with the edge of her sword. Talk, she said. Cass double-checked the cover and scrambled over to them. Screw you, Rasp said. Cass sucker-punched him, causing his head to bounce on the ground, and Rasp to spit up blood in response. Don't do that again, Evie said. It took Cass a moment to realize she was talking to him, not Rasp. What is your mission here? To get him, Rasp pointed a bloody finger to Cass. Why, Evie said pressing the blade against his neck, just as she had with Cass. I paid your boss fairly for him, Rasp chuckled. You think she didn't know you were from the Coalition? She wanted to know why you wanted him so badly. And now we know about the Atlas. Evie winced, pulling the sword back and sheathing it. She grabbed Rasp by the lapels, drawing him up on his feet. 
Cass stood with him. What do you know? You're not getting off this rock alive, he told Evie. And you, he said to Cass, the mistress has a new job for you. The mistress is just going to have to do without, Cass said. What do we do with him? he asked Evie. I'm placing you both under arrest, Evie said, staring at Rasp. You for attempting to murder a coalition officer, and you, she indicated to Cass, for conspiring against the coalition. Rasp only laughed. Evie tapped her hand, activating her calm. Yamashita, we have a situation down here. Bring me two sets of cuffs and notify the Tempest we have prisoners and potential wounded civilians we'll be bringing back. Ma'am? Laura asked on the other end. Don't argue. Just do it, Evie replied. She led Rasp back to the shipping container, but turned to Cass before they got very far. And if you feel like running now, just imagine the consequences when I catch up with you, because you know I will. She turned back and strong-armed Rasp down the corridor. Cass sighed and followed. Laura met them at the shipping container, handing Evie the electronic cuffs. The three Plagarians lay off to the side, still unconscious. Evie placed one set on Rasp, then sat him on the floor. Then she indicated Cass put out his hands, which he did reluctantly, and locked the cuffs on him, sitting him down beside Rasp. See what happens when you trust the Coalition? Rasp whispered to him. Vina tried to tell you. Don't talk to me. You tried to kill me, Cass replied. No, just incapacitate you. If I'd killed you, Vina would have been very upset. Just like she'll be upset she hasn't heard from me. Vina would send others after him when he didn't check in. Cass tried to get Evie's attention, but she and Laura were in the process of studying the shipping container, and Laura's words distracted him. Wouldn't let me contact the ship. He said it was too dangerous to send a signal, Laura said. So they're both traitors, Evie replied. You can't send a signal from here. Half a dozen non-aligned ships will trace it to the source, Cass interrupted. If Box had let her send a signal, she'd have exposed your ship. Evie whipped her head around. Just like you were about to. I wasn't going to go that far. I was going to tell the Plagarians there was a coalition ship close. It would have sent them into a swarming frenzy. They've got to have at least a hundred shuttle-sized ships up there. Enough for an easy getaway. And that's all you care about, getting away. Yeah, it was, Cass said, balancing enough to stand, until I found that. That's the whole reason I calmed you. I couldn't leave those people to be sold into Plagarian labor camps. And if that meant giving up my chance for freedom, then I guess I made my choice. How noble, Evie quipped. Too bad I don't believe a word of it. Why else would I have told you to come back? Cass protested, desperate for her to believe him. Why did he care so much about what she thought? He calmed you to come back? Laura asked. Why would he do that if he wanted to meet the Bulgarians alone? It doesn't matter, Evie said. Just help me get this hatch open. She tugged on the side of the container. It doesn't work like that, Rasp chuckled. Some of the blood from his nose had dried and crusted on his upper lip. It needs an access code. Then we'll just take the entire container, Evie said, turning to Laura. Tell Box to move the ship down here. We'll load it just as it was unloaded. Commander, Cass said, thinking about how little time they had until Rasp's reinforcement showed up. She didn't reply, only continued to ignore him. Commander! Evelyn! She turned on him, fury in her eyes. What? Do you think he's here alone? He said, indicating Rasp. We don't have time to transport the container. We need to get out of here now. She considered him a moment, then glanced down toward the entrance they'd come through. Get Box down here. He'll be able to get this open. Cass put out his hands. He couldn't access his comm unit to call Box with them restrained. Evie scoffed and turned to Laura. That's an order, Ensign. Laura seemed to realize she was talking to her at the same time Cass did. She tapped her calm. Box, we need you in lower level seven. 
We're about forty meters from the main entrance. Be there in a minute, Box replied. Meanwhile, Evie continued to look for some way to access the container, running her hands over the sides. Hey, Rabo, Rasp whispered. Help me out of here, and I'll make sure you're back and good with Vina. You can't seriously think I'd go back to her. I'd almost rather be imprisoned in a coalition cell, he replied. She'll make it pretty sweet for you, he said. He stared straight ahead. I'm not going back. Rasp shrugged. It's your funeral. He wasn't wrong. As soon as Rutledge found out Cass had tried to defect again, there was no telling what he'd do. Box jogged into the space, surveying the area. Hey, what the hell? he said upon seeing Cass. Cass put his hands out in a surrender gesture. It's fine. Just help Evie. Do what she asks you to do. Box hesitated, but he went over to her. Open this, she said, standing back from the container. Box wrapped his slender fingers around the edge of one side and yanked, tearing the metal away from itself. There was a hiss, and a cloud of mist rose from the break in the seal. Box continued to pull, ripping the entire side of the container away. Cass gasped when he saw what was inside. Two rows of people, suspended vertically by some kind of harness attached to both the ceiling and floor of the container, tubes running from them into a series of devices built into the floor. Each had an oxygen mask, but they were all conscious, and they looked emaciated. Cass counted five of them, all different ages. The one closest to the wall where he'd knocked was in her early teens. Get them unhooked as quickly and safely as you can. We need to get them all back to the ship, Evie said after a moment of silence. Perhaps she was as stunned as the rest of them were. You'll never make it, Rasp said, his voice cheery. Cass kicked him in the side for good measure, causing him to double over in pain. Box went to work disconnecting the people from all their tubes and harnesses while Laura helped them out of the container to sit on the ground beside it. How many can you carry? Evie asked Box. Three, maybe four before I won't be able to move under the excessive weight, Box replied. Evie sighed, approaching Cass. You and Yamashita get the ones Box can't carry back to the ship. I'll escort the prisoner. She reached down and held her finger to one side of his cuffs. The chain between them lengthened, but remained connected. It was enough so he could move his hands freely enough to help the people in the container. You trust me? Not at all, she replied, turning her back on him. She walked over and lifted Rasp up to his feet. His hands remained locked behind his back. But just as he stood, a blast of energy hit him square in the chest, leaving a deep black burn mark in his wake. Rasp's eyes rolled up into his skull, and he fell back, dead. The blasts exploded all around them. Twenty-five. Bolts of superheated plasma struck the crates all around them as Cass ducked into cover beside Laura. He glanced over to see Evie and Box hiding behind the crate with the five people inside, who had, free from their harnesses, crowded into the back of the container. Cass risked a glance over what little cover he and Laura had and counted four of Vina's guards, each armed with a plasma rifle. And here they were with no weapons but an ancient sword. Box, Cass yelled. Any ideas? Yeah, but you're not going to like it, he yelled back. I don't care. Just do it. Box nodded, stepped around Evie to her protestation, and reached out in the line of fire, grabbing one of the unconscious Plagarians. Wait, Box, you can't... Before Cass could finish the sentence, the Plagarian went sailing through the air, flying like a lawn dart at the nearest guard, who didn't have time to register just what was happening to him. They struck skull to skull, knocking the guard back with the unconscious Plagarian landing on top of him. The other three guards were stunned by the scene, long enough for Box to grab the other two and toss them in the same direction. Box jumped out into the line of fire as the remaining guard seemed to gather himself and point the weapon at Box, only to find his recently deceased boss, Rasp, heading straight for him. 
The guards screamed, firing wildly. And while some of the shots struck Rasp, they didn't slow his momentum, and he collided with the last guard in a sickening crunch. Let's go, Evie yelled to the people huddled in the back of the container. They wouldn't have long, but the people were too scared to move. Box lumbered into the container, grabbed three of them, and pulled them out, handing one each to Laura, Evie, and Cass. He then went back in for the last two and came out holding one under each arm. Now we're ready, he said, his yellow eyes blinking satisfaction. Evie grabbed her person by the wrist and yanked her down the hall past the moaning guards. Laura followed her with her person, followed by Cass and Box. But as Cass passed, he took the opportunity to snatch one of the errant plasma rifles from the ground as they ran. They reached the entrance to the level guarded by the two men they'd seen coming in. Cass didn't know if they'd heard all the commotion and didn't want to get involved, but he wasn't about to let them stop them from getting back to his ship. One of them reached inside his jacket, and Cass fired the rifle at the ground at both of their feet. They both jumped aside, their hands up, and their weapons forgotten, while Evie and the rest ran through, still pulling or carrying the prisoners. Cass glanced over to his prisoner. It was the same young girl who he suspected responded to his knocking. Her hair was wild and untamed, and her dark eyes traveled over everything, probably looking for potential threats. Cass couldn't help but wonder how long ago she'd been captured. This way, Box yelled, indicating the ramp. Thankfully, the prisoners seemed to understand Evie was helping them and didn't put up a struggle on the way back to the ship. Cass kept expecting another set of guards to jump at them, but they managed to make it back to the ship without another shot fired, though those guards couldn't be far behind. Just as he was about to take a step toward the airlock the others had already passed through, a plasma bolt exploded on his shoulder, causing him to scream in pain and fall to the hard, cold tunnel surface. The young girl just stared at him, her face awash in terror. Run, Cass yelled, trying to push her to the airlock. Box appeared a moment later and grabbed the girl, yanking her back out of the line of fire. Behind him, one of the guards had managed to keep his pace with them, though he was huffing and bleeding from the head. Cass swung the plasma rifle at him, one-handed, and pulled the trigger. But the kick of the weapon made the plasma swing wide. The guard grinned and hoisted his own weapon to his shoulder, bracing it and staring Cass down through the sight. Cass fumbled with his weapon, trying to reposition himself so he could get a better shot. But he already knew it was over. He couldn't get one off fast enough with the chains in between his hands. When he looked up, a strange frown had come over the guard's face. Cass glanced down to see a very large sword sticking out from the abdomen of the guard the hilt wagging ever so slightly. He looked to his right to see Evie standing with her feet prone and her arm outstretched. Her fingers shook, but it was almost imperceptible. The guard collapsed back, just as Rasp had done, his gun scattering across the floor of the smooth tunnel. Evie stood straight and walked over to him, yanking the sword from his body with a schluck. The blade dripped red, Keeping the blade out, she strode over to Cass, hoisted him by his good arm, and pulled him back through the airlock. Box, we're good. Go, she yelled, escorting Cass down the corridor to the kitchen. One of the prisoners sat at Cass's pantry, going through the food, tearing things apart with his teeth. Hey, Cass yelled, that's mine. Get your... Evie reached down and pulled the weapon from his hand tossing it to the counter as Cass felt the main thrusters on the ship fire and the ship begin to rise off the asteroid. She pushed him down into the nearest chair, her eyes burning with an intensity he hadn't seen from her before. You have a med kit, I assume, she said, staring at his black shoulder. It's over by grabby hands there, two cabinets up and one to the left. He surveyed the room. Hey, where are the rest of them? They're not in my room, are they? He moved to get up before Evie pushed him back down in the chair. What the hell was that back there? She asked, going over to the metal cabinet and pulling the med kit from the back. The prisoner ignored her, choosing to continue to engorge himself on Cass's food. 
Cass eyed his shoulder. Strangely, it didn't hurt. It must be the adrenaline. You're asking me, he said. I should ask you. I didn't know you could throw swords. Evie winced. She placed the bloody blade beside the rifle he'd confiscated. I want to know why I shouldn't turn you into Captain Green when we get back to the Tempest, she said. Cass dropped his head. I panicked, okay? You told me no matter what I did, I was going to be imprisoned for it. I couldn't let that happen. You had to expect I wouldn't just sit by. Not when I had a chance. She sighed, pulling a small knife from the kid. She used it to cut away the charred cloth from his arm. Maybe I did, she admitted. But you deserve to know. You have to believe me. I wasn't going to put the ship in danger. I wouldn't do that. Not after... everything. She didn't look at him. Instead, kept her attention on his shoulder, removing the last pieces of cloth. Beneath, the skin was charred and burned. Cass could even smell it. For the first time since he'd been shot, he grew concerned. Shouldn't he be feeling something? It doesn't hurt, he said. That's because it neutralized your pain receptors, Evie said, running a diagnostic scanner over the wound. Your arm could be missing, and he wouldn't feel it. Does that mean I'm going to lose the arm? Cass asked, concerned now. She pursed her lips at him. So there's one thing the great Captain Caspian Rabeau doesn't know about after all. Medicine. Is that a yes or a no? You'll be fine. But I can't fix it. You'll have to see Dr. Zax back on the ship. The ship? Box, turn around, Cass yelled down the adjacent corridor. What are you doing? Evie furrowed her brow. Don't you see? Vina tracked us to Jatan. She knows where we're going and what we're looking for. She's got to have a tracker on us somewhere. Understanding dawn on Evie. And we can't return to the ship until we find it. Cass struggled to stand. She probably installed it when she was unloading all that contraband back at Devil's Gate, Cass said. No wonder she was so agreeable. The links between the cuffs rattled as he stood, his left arm hanging limp at his side. Can you please take these Garth-forsaken things off me? She hesitated a moment, but then pressed her thumb to the inside of the cuff. Both sides released and clattered to the ground. Thank you, Cass said. He turned and made his way down the main corridor to the cockpit. Bach sat at the pilot station, and Laura occupied the co-pilot's seat. The young girl prisoner stood behind them, watching the stars go by. Box, Cass said softly. He turned. Put it on auto. Take us away from the Tempest. Box nodded and hit the appropriate switches. He rose from the seat and faced them. What's the problem? Vina bugged us. We have to find it before we go back. Otherwise, she'll know our every move. That woman is worse than Maxine Anderson, Box yelled, jolting out of his seat and storming down through the corridor. Who is Maxine Anderson? Evie asked. Probably the matriarch of his most recent net drama obsession, Cass said. I try to stay out of it. Evie turned to Laura. Keep us out of range of the Tempest, and if anything looks strange, let me know. Laura nodded and turned her attention to the monitors. How much does she know? Box yelled, heading down to the main engineering access. A lot, Cass said, following with Evie close behind. Then it's on the comm equipment, Box replied. Everyone shut up until I find it. If you had done a level four diagnostic like I told you to, we wouldn't be having this, Cass began. Shh, Box said. Cass shut up, taking a glance at Evie. She was struggling to keep a smile from her face. Box began opening panels and removing equipment, seemingly at random, taking things apart bit by bit. He can get all that back in one piece, right? Evie asked. If he can't, I can, Cass replied. There wasn't a piece of the ship he didn't know by heart. 
Probably only about 20% of the original ship remained since he'd first purchased it. Are you going to stand there and gawk, or are you going to help? Bach said, removing the primary communication drive from its housing. We'll check the holds, Cass said, leading Evie away. Vina wasn't foolish enough to put the tracker there. But then again, she would probably suspect Cass wouldn't use the hold unless he was transporting contraband for her. I just want to say, Cass began as they reached the first hold on the floor, thanks for what you did out there. You could have left me. No, I couldn't, Evie said, bending and helping him move the piece of floor aside. You knew I wouldn't let you stay out there alone. I'd have been too afraid you would have hooked up with pirates and been on your merry way. He avoided her gaze, instead inspected the hold. I don't know what to say. Cass, look at me. He raised his eyes to meet hers. Can I trust you? He sat back, his legs folded underneath him, and his arm dangling uselessly at his side. Sometimes I don't even know if I can trust myself. That's not a ringing endorsement. It's the truth. She sighed, sitting back herself. Is that what you were really planning to do? Notify the Plagarians the Tempest was out there? He shook his head. My first thought was to send a communique to every hostile species in the colony. But that was never a reality. After what happened to the Atlas, I couldn't put people in danger like that. The Plagarians seemed like the next best solution. I set a meeting with them planning to slip them some intel that a ship was spotted in the area and then watch them go crazy trying to find it. It would have been just enough confusion to slip away unnoticed, until you couldn't trace our undercurrent, that is. And what about me and Laura? I was pretty sure you could take care of yourselves, at least until things calmed down. It's not like I would have been stranding you in the middle of the desert. Cass opened a secondary hold under the first one searching for anything out of place. It was hard to squeeze into with his arm flopping to the side, but it was easier than looking at Evie's disappointing gaze. She was silent while he searched, sitting at the edge of the hold, looking down. When he was sure there was nothing out of the ordinary, he managed to hoist himself back out. There was no avoiding this now. I guess the question is... What are you going to do now you know I've tried to betray you? he asked. She watched him for a moment, as if she was searching his soul, looking for something redeemable in him. He didn't expect her to find it. I wish I knew. Twenty six. Box? Cass said, approaching him from behind. The robot was deep into the communication equipment parts and components strewn all around him. He'd recruited one of the former prisoners to hold parts as he removed them from the main comm hub. The man's arms were full. I'm working on it, Bach said, his voice muffled from the depth of the contraption. Cass glanced over to the man with his arms full. He had ochre skin with a mop of blonde hair cut close. Various scars ran down the sides of his face, probably a result of being Vina's prisoner. His clothes were a simple jumpsuit, suitable for different climates. "'What's your name?' he asked. "Setsima," the man replied. "'What happened to you?' Cass noticed Evie lurking around behind him. He wasn't sure if it was because she didn't want him out of her sight, or if she was genuinely interested in the man. "'Kidnapped. Off Paxi. Me and my brother. But I haven't seen him since.' He must have gone with another group. How long ago? Evie asked. Three months. Since then, I've either been in a cell or stasis. I can't thank you enough for saving me. For saving us. Do you know what you are being sold for? Cass asked. Setsuma shook his head. She told us we were going to Cassiopeia Optima. But then, a couple of days ago, she rounded a few of us up and stuffed us in that crate. But we weren't going to be inside long enough to go into stasis. 
She had us hooked up to life support. That asteroid was definitely not Cassiopeia. She intended to sell you to the Plagarians, Cass said. Probably to service their ships. Setsuma shuddered. Those ships are so small. I would have not survived long. Cass thought about it a minute. If you were conscious, could you hear everything from inside the crate? Setsuma opened his mouth to answer. Will you two shut up? Box called from where he was. Until I find this thing, there's no telling how much is getting out. He was right. Vina could be listening to their every word. Commander? Laura called from the cockpit. Evie turned, making her way to the cockpit. Cass followed, and when he arrived, he saw what had concerned Laura. Four of Vina's fighter ships in pursuit. They must have been the ships Vina's people had used to arrive in Jatan. The young girl Cass had rescued stood behind Laura's chair, watching the screens intently. Cass turned to Evie. Can you outrun them? She jumped into the pilot's seat as Laura moved to the co-pilot's position. We'll see. I don't know what the ship can do, but for all the parts I paid for, it better be able to outrun a couple of Class II gunners. She switched off the autopilot and immediately began evasive maneuvers. Thanks to the gravity dampeners, the inertia on the ship didn't change. The only difference was it seemed like the star field outside was twirling in different directions as Evie navigated. Cass ran back to Box. You need to find that thing now, he said. What does it look like I'm doing? He was much more agitated than usual. Cass turned to Setsuma, who continued to stand there with his arms full. What did you do before you were kidnapped? What was your job? I am an architect, he said, for orbital platforms. Close enough, Cass said. Drop that crap and help him look. Setsuma set the equipment on the ground and went to work disassembling parts. Back here with no windows, Cass couldn't tell what was going on. Everything still felt perfectly still. He pulled his comm from his pocket and tapped it. Nothing happened. He glanced over to the disassembled communications array and mentally smacked himself. Instead, he ran back to the cockpit, his useless arm still flapping at his side. I can't get away from them as long as they know exactly where I am, Evie said, her voice strained as the starfield moved left and right. A plasma burst streaked by. And they're getting closer. Cass glanced down to the young girl. You, come with me. It's all hands on deck. The girl nodded, following him back to Box and Setsuma. What's your name? he asked as they approached the parts all over the floor. Yance, yes, she replied, her voice soft. Yance? Yes? I need you to fit in through where they can't. You might be able to find it faster. Box will tell you what he's looking for. A long-range iridium tracker, right? she asked. Yeah, he said, stunned. How? My parents used them to track interstellar creatures. It was the best way to keep tabs on a tunnel guardian or a grand grade. Ah, Cass said. Okay, get in there and help them. The ship shook for the first time knocking them off their feet. Evie yelled from the front, These guys are all over us! Cass had landed on his bad arm, but fortunately hadn't felt much. He struggled to stand, finding Setsuma and Yance doing the same. Box had remained half inside the comm unit. Box! Cass yelled. Tiny hands! Put them to use! Setsuma motioned for Yance to come over, just as the floor shook again. Cass ran back to the cockpit, where Evie and Laura were doing their best to keep Venus fighters off them. At least he was getting his cardio in. Doesn't this thing have anything more powerful than a quad cannon? Laura asked, running her hands over the controls. Unfortunately not, Cass replied, watching the fighters buzz by out the window. It's not worth wasting our reserve fuel if there's nowhere to go, Evie struggled with the controls. I'm basically just flying in circles until we can lose them. The ship shook violently, and Cass hit the sidewall. Breach in one of the hat pods, Laura said. Seal it off, Cass replied, pushing himself away from the wall. They're designed to be self-sustaining. We can eject it if necessary. Got it, Box called from the back. You're clear. Now you're talking. 
Evie narrowed her eyes and jerking the ship into a barrel roll that sent the starfield spinning. Even with the gravitational dampeners, Cass could still feel the pull of the G-forces. His little ship had never been put to the limit like this. Evie hit the accelerator, and the ship shot forward, swinging around the asteroid to the belt. Carpur, the system's star, reflected light off the cockpit as she dove down, coming close to an asteroid. She slipped behind it, pulling them to a near stop, when two of the fighters shot right past. Evie turned immediately and shot the other direction. Laura, if they get on our ass, shoot the hell out of them. I'll do what I can, she replied. Drop the damaged hap suite, Cass said. It has its own power source. You can use it as a mine. Laura nodded, preparing herself. There they are, she replied. She hit the eject button, and there was a loud clank as the hab detached, falling back behind it. They're ignoring it. Cass watched as the two fighters adjusted their headings so they'd go around either side. But when they were on opposite sides of the suite, Laura fired a single shot, detonating the suite and destroying both fighters in the process. I thought you said you were an exobiologist, Cass said, impressed with their targeting skills. I am. Everyone needs a hobby. Still have two more, Evie said. She got a funny look on her face. What is this ship primarily made out of? She jerked the controls to the right. A fighter appeared beside them, just barely strafing the hull. Uh... It's a composite of cyclax, galvanium, and... That's all I need to know, she replied, adjusting her heading for the closest fighter. Wait, you can't, Cass began, as the ship shot forward on a collision course with a smaller ship. This is my ship. You can't just ram it into... The entire ship shook with a reverberation as the vessel ahead of them exploded from the impact. The fourth and last fighter took off in a hasty retreat back toward the colony. Evie swung the ship around and set an erratic course to throw off any further pursuers. I can't believe you just did that, Cass said, as Evie stood from the pilot's chair. She shrugged. It's my ship now, technically. I knew your hull reinforcements could handle it. Those Class twos are pitiful things. Might as well be made out of aluminum. I just needed to make sure the vibrations of hitting something like that wouldn't shake us apart. I'm glad you found it satisfactory, Cass replied through his teeth. He caught Laura looking at them, but she glanced away as soon as he noticed. They made their way back to Box, who, along with Setsuma and Yance, was repairing the comm system. Should be in good order in a day or two, Box said, inspecting components. It's always easier to take apart than put back together. Let me see the tracker, Cass said, holding out his one good hand. Yance came over and dropped the device into his palm. It wasn't much bigger than his entire hand, but had a giant crack down the middle from where Box had disabled it. You found it? he asked. She crawled in there and within two minutes had it, Setsuma said. It wasn't hard, Yance beamed, when you know what you're looking for. I bet she used one of her Val cronies to get it in there in the first place, Cass said. Val were about the size of a human child. Millennia ago, they'd left Earth to settle Valis, which had a much higher gravity, resulting in smaller people over a few generations. Though many left the Coalition these days, despite Valis being inside the same solar system as Earth. Yep, and it was monitoring not only our comms, but our conversations as well. Vina knows exactly what we're looking for, and everywhere we've searched so far, Box said. Which means she's probably already out there looking for it for herself, Cass replied. Wait, Evie said. Does she even know why she wants the ship? She knows it's valuable, Cass said, and that's enough. If she does happen to find it before we do, it will be bad for everyone. Evie tapped the back of her hand. Yes, Commander, Laura said from the cockpit. Cass glanced at her for a moment before remembering coalition comms had their own built-in network. They didn't rely on a ship to maintain communication, like Cass's outdated pocket model did. Any sign of pursuit? Evie asked. None. 
Set course back to the Tempest. It's time to get the hell out of here. Twenty-seven. The good news was Evie hadn't put the cuffs back on Cass. The bad news was she hadn't said another word on the short trip back to the Tempest. As soon as they landed, however, she'd gathered her sword and then ordered a very satisfied-looking Laura back to the biology labs, making sure to compliment her on her performance. Cass thought the ensign might burst from the endorsement. He and the former prisoners were all to report to sickbay, while Box stayed on the ship to finish the repairs. Evie even gave Box authorization to use the maintenance crew in Bay 1, if necessary, prompting a confused look from Box, to which Cass could only shrug. He had no clue what was going on in Evie's mind. They reached Sick Bay, and Cass met Dr. Zax for the first time, a Yaks Inax. She was bipedal and lean, with her small feet balancing her slender frame. Like all Yaks Inax, she had four arms, two with three fingers and two with four, set parallel to each other in a series, and her head was ten percent larger than a human's, and instead of two eyes, she had six black globes on the upper part of her face, each one with beautiful aquamarine blue sparkles inside. It gave the Yaks Inax the ability to see things many other humanoids couldn't, such as wavelengths of frequency and light. Below the globes was a small mouth. Cass noticed her rank was that of full commander, which made her the only person on the ship ranked higher than Evie, other than the captain, of course. Please take a seat. We'll be with you in a moment, she said in perfect English. One of the nice things about the Yaks Inax was they worked for years on perfecting the speech of whatever culture they assimilated themselves into. Their native tongue was much more complex, outside the vocal range of many species. When the Yaks Inax joined the coalition, they decided on their own to expand their vocal prowess by learning as many languages as possible. What is this? Zack said, approaching Cass. Her lower arm with three fingers picked up Cass's lifeless one, while one of the arms with four fingers ran them over the shoulder wound. Nerve killer. I hate these. Please, come with me. Evie stopped Cass for a moment. When you're done, report to the captain, she said. And I don't mean after you've had a shower. I mean immediately. Her eyes said she was dead serious. Cass nodded, as if by that small token gesture he had accepted his fate. He'd hoped there might be a chance of redemption after what he'd done. But he knew he'd only been fooling himself. She left, still carrying her blood-stained sword out of its sheath, as Zax took a scanning device to Cass's arm. As soon as she was gone, Cass glanced around at the rest of the former prisoners, Yantz, Setsuma, and the others, all sitting on their own beds, as the nurses and doctors inspected them as well. At least he'd done something. It wasn't all for naught. Cass stood at the door to Green's command room, having fielded dirty looks from the rest of the bridge staff, with the exception of Zal. But at least he'd been allowed to come here without an escort. It felt like a test, as if Edie had placed a bet with Paige if he'd actually show up or try to run again. Come in, Green's voice said, and the door slid open. Cass, his arm healed and working like nothing had happened, walked in to find Evie sitting in one of Green's two chairs on the closest side of his desk. Green stood, his imposing figure framed by the window behind him. The planetoid the ship had been hiding behind loomed in the distance. Please sit, Mr. Rebeau, Green said, only taking his own seat after Cass had complied. I was afraid there for a while you might not be coming back, he smiled. Cass chanced a glimpse at Evie, whose own visage remained set in stone. There was no telling what she'd already reported. Screw it. He was tired of living in fear of what she may or may not do. He reached over and placed the tracking device on Green's desk. Vina had this stashed on my ship without my knowledge. She was using it to monitor our conversations any time I used my comm, as well as track our progress. She's been shadowing us this whole time. How do you know it's her, and not one of her underlings? 
Green said. Her first lieutenant was down on the colony. In all the years I worked for her, I never saw them apart. He doesn't leave her side. Her ship is close somewhere, and we need to find her before she finds the Atlas. I can't disagree, Green said. Any coalition technology in the hands... This isn't just about coalition technology, Cass said. This is about a weapon. A weapon? Green asked. Evie finally moved, her eyes finding Cass. My mission, as outlined by Admiral Rutledge, is to find the Atlas. Not because of the missing crew, or because the ship is sentimental to him, but because its mission was to develop a new type of weapon to combat the Sill. Green leaned forward, but didn't interrupt. Cass took a deep breath. It was now or never. Seven years ago, the Atlas wasn't off course in Sill space. It was there on purpose. We were looking for a civilian craft, something we could cannibalize and reverse engineer its weapon systems. Because the Sill weaponry is so much more advanced than ours, Rutledge and a few choice officers couldn't stand the idea we were technologically inferior to them. But they didn't want to send us up against one of their warships. We never would have made it. But even their civilian craft are shown to have powerful offensive systems. Our job was to capture one of them, eject the occupants into escape pods to be found later, then tow the ship back to Coalition space for study. You were part of this mission? Green asked. Cass didn't bother looking at Evie. I was. As first officer, I was tasked with firing on the ship when we came into range. However, when the time came, I refused, instead disabling the weapon systems and funneling a coded message to the Sill, warning them of our intentions. Green watched him intently. No wonder Rutledge hates you. Yes, sir. The rest you know. Rutledge was promoted, then put in charge of the project. I'm assuming the mission was a success, and ever since they have been working on building the weapon directly on board the Atlas. Which is why it has its own dry dock floating out there. Yes, sir. Green turned to Evie. Commander? Did you know about this? No one knew, sir. I kept it under strict confidence. Rutledge even confirmed to me he never told Commander Diazol anything about why she was retrieving me, Cass said before she could speak. Green turned back to him. And now this. Vina knows? I've been discussing the mission at length with Box aboard my ship. He's been aware of my unfortunate past for a long time. Obviously, he's not about to say anything. He knows if he does, it would put me in an awkward position. Not to mention I'd disassemble him and incorporate the parts into my ship. He took a breath. I can only assume Vina's overheard everything we said. Green ran his hand down his chin. That's very unsettling, Mr. Rabot. He took a deep breath and stood, turning to look out at the stars beyond, Carpur itself coming into view. The window darkened automatically to shade their eyes from the intense light. How close is the weapon to being finished? From what I can infer, close. Rutledge seemed on edge about it, determined to find it as soon as possible. That tells me they were either close or already in the testing phase. He wouldn't be so anxious otherwise. Damn, Green whispered. If the Sargans get their hands on that... We'd have a major war on our plate. He dropped his head for a moment, then turned back to him. I haven't been happy about this from the start. The subterfuge, the hiding in the shadows. I certainly don't like being kept unaware on my own mission. He took his seat again. Why would Rutledge and others risk a possible war with the Sill for a weapon we don't need? We haven't been hostile with the Sill in almost a hundred years. We have a treaty for a reason. Cass leaned forward. Sir, the longer I served under Captain Rutledge, the more I began to see he'd do anything to protect the Coalition, even against threats he only perceives. 
As time went on, he became more open to the idea. I don't know if he developed it independently or as part of a group within the coalition, but he's always been an integral part. And now he's risking the safety of a few trillion life forms because he can't contain his paranoia. No wonder they didn't want us to know. Green turned to Evie. Commander, you're being awfully quiet. Captain, I must confess something, Evie said. Cass told me about the mission, but he left out the part about the weapon. Had I known, I would have come to you immediately. I've known about the rest ever since before we landed on Jatan. Cass couldn't read Green's face. Evie was resolute, however. I see, Green said. I appreciate your honesty. Sir, there's something else. I also informed Mr. Rabot about his impending arrest. I believe it almost led to a confrontation that could have put this ship in danger. How so? Green asked, his face unreadable. Because as soon as she told me, I panicked, Cass said. I was going to try and run again, and I almost did. Ah, Green said. The prisoners. You found them on your way out. Something like that. Green turned back to Evie. Commander, given the circumstances, I can't blame you for your actions. Arresting this man for attempting to preserve life is a perversion of our laws, and I do not agree with it. You made a judgment call based on the available information. Though I do wish you'd come to me earlier. There's no proof, Cass said. It's Rutledge's word against my own. Evie glanced at him. You were the only one who mutinied? Green asked. Out of everyone else on the ship and the space dock? After the incident, and we lost 24 of our crew, Cass paused, trying not to see their faces in his memory. Rutledge announced he'd be taking responsibility for what happened. He said it was his crew, and he was responsible for all of us. As any good captain is, Green said. But that didn't happen. Cass shook his head. As soon as we were back, he threw me in front of the ethics committee for mutiny and as being the person responsible for those 24 deaths. No one came to my defense, probably because they didn't want to share my fate. Anyone who spoke out against him would be court-martialed. But he also recruits loyal officers. Some, no doubt, agreed with his actions. This is almost incredulous, Green said. Coalition officers conspiring to undermine our very principles... He took a breath. Does Rutledge want a war? I'm not sure. I can't speak to that point. Green shook his head. What a mess. It seems our goals are now twofold. Find the Atlas. Hopefully someone is still alive who can corroborate your story. And stop the Sargans from taking control of the ship. Sir? Assuming you're not confining me to quarters for my decisions, I'd like to interview the prisoners, Evie said. They may have information about Vina's location or plans. Anything they may have overheard. Commander, Green said, his eyes softening, I'm not going to punish you for making a moral decision. That's counterproductive. There have been far too many bad decisions regarding this matter and we're not going to add to the problem. Interview them as soon as you can. Box and I may be able to use that, Cass said, indicating the tracker on Green's desk, to ping back on her location. It was sending a signal somewhere. If we can track that signal, we can find her. What are the odds she'll find the ship before we do? Green asked. She's intelligent, capable, and resourceful. I don't think we can assume she won't find it first, especially since she has a bevy of ships at her command. They can cover a lot more ground than we can. Green stood. Very well. Begin with your assignments. 
I want status updates on the hour. Cass and Evie stood in unison. Yes, sir, they said almost at once. For once, it felt good to say. Twenty-eight. Why didn't you tell me about the weapon? Evie asked as they made their way across the bridge to the hypervader. Cass glanced over to the bridge crew. Paige seemed surprised to see them walking out together and produced a sneer of disgust in response. The only friendly face was Zal's holographic one. He also made a small motion with his hand Cass took as a wave. He waved back. I was under orders not to reveal it, Cass shrugged. Evie scoffed. You're telling me you didn't say anything because you were ordered not to? The doors opened and they entered. He relented. Okay. I didn't want you to have to make the hard choice. I knew if I told you, you'd have no choice but to go to green. And I didn't want to put you in that position. Uh-huh. Mr. Altruistic. What you really mean is you didn't want the captain to know you were involved in an illegal operation to procure military goods for the coalition. He smiled sheepishly. That, too. Knowing about the mission comes with consequences, as you've seen firsthand. She shook her head. I can't believe coalition officers did this. It's just wrong. I agree. She turned to him. And it cost you your career, your freedom. Did you know when you disabled the weapons and sent the message? Did you know then what would happen? It was in the back of my mind. I knew the most likely outcome. If the Sill didn't find and destroy us first, I'd have to face the consequences. Just like I knew when I calmed you about those prisoners. When it's just me, or me and Box, things don't matter as much. But when other people are involved. But you were willing to sacrifice the crew of the Atlas. To stop a war? Yes. She smiled. You're turning out to be more interesting than I first gave you credit for, she said, her shoulders relaxing. When you're not drunk. He laughed. Thanks, I think. I've managed to keep myself out of jail this long, and it looks like I've been given a stay of execution. But it won't really matter in the end. What do you mean? Once we get back, Rutledge will have me arrested anyway. I hope he doesn't decide you and the captain were conspiring with me. Green might have hell to pay for not arresting me immediately. The captain can hold his own. Don't worry about him. He's also not going to let this injustice continue any longer than necessary. When we get back, I'm sure he'll push for a full inquiry. Cash shook his head. I just don't know. Without any evidence, it still comes back down to my word against his. Then we need to find some evidence, she replied. The hypervader doors opened back on the sick bay level. Evie glanced at the tracker in his hand. Get that down to engineering. They'll help you to find the source. When you talk to them, Cass said, still looking at it, thank them for me. And talk to Setsuma. He overheard something, or he indicated he did. I'll be thorough. She stepped out, turning to look at him. It was nice of you to try and protect me back there, but I don't need your help. I can take responsibility for my own actions. Noted. Good luck, Cass. You too. The hypervader doors closed. So, will you be having sex now? Box asked as they made their way to main engineering. Cass had swung back by Bay One and informed Box of their current plans, dragging him away from the ship repairs. No. Stop talking about sex so much, Cass said. I think all I've done is convince her I'm not a flight risk. That's a long way from a relationship. But it's closer, Box said, drawing out the last word. He broke into a little tune. Back before, she hated your face, and now you're a little closer. Back before, she hated your guts, and now you're a little closer. Stop, please, Cass said. 
Why are you in such a good mood? Because we didn't have to become fugitives. Again. I don't like being on the run all the time. Plus, when you get arrested, I get the ship. How many times do I have to tell you robots can't... Excuse me. Cass looked up to a young crewman who stood a few meters away, staring at them. Oh, did you hear all that? he asked. How did I sound? Box added. Um, I'm here to escort you to engineering to see Commander Sester, the crewman said. Right. Thanks, crewman... Pearson, the young man said. Lead the way, Cass said, following him down the corridor, with Box tagging behind. Have you ever met a Claxian before? Pearson asked. A few, back when I was in the service. Never been to the home world, though. Pearson nodded. He wasn't being as antagonistic as some of the others. Was the crew warming to him, or was Pearson just a one-off case? He couldn't be sure. I'd never met one until I started serving on Tempest. He's a sight to behold. Interesting choice of words, Cass said. Pearson chuckled along. The Claxians were an ancient race, already traveling among the stars by the time humans were inventing written language. They were the primary reason technology had advanced as quickly as it had, having developed most of what the Coalition themselves used today. They were the ones to discover the undercurrents and how to transverse them safely, and thus had a hand in developing every Coalition engine that used them. Unique among all the races of the Coalition, the Claxians had no eyes or optical sensors at all, instead navigating their environments through touch and mental speech. They weren't even technically bipedal, being made up more like a starfish with five distinct tentacles that served as either hands or feet, depending on the need. But at the end of those tentacles, each ending in five smaller fingers, were highly sensitive receptors which, combined with their mental abilities, gave the Claxians great insight into how the universe and its underlying properties worked. They were genius engineers, a species Cass had always looked up to, despite knowing he would never be on their level. In here, Pearson said, leading them through a large door that rolled to the side, as if on an ancient pulley. Before them stood the main engineering department, Four giant conduits dominated the room, two starting at the top of the room and continuing down to the floor, where they disappeared down two dark tunnels, and two more which started at the floor and extended to the ceiling, where they likewise disappeared through two more identical tunnels. These were the power conduits for the emitters that kept the tunnels open during travel, each one ten times the size Cass had of the reasonable excuse. In the center of the room, there was a three-sided master systems display, with workstations flanking it to the left and the right. And there, in the back of the room, resting in a mold shaped perfectly for a Claxian, was the chief engineer, lying in the cradle as his tentacles worked different systems within the mold. A catwalk circled above the engineer himself, with more workstations up there to monitor not only the ship, but the engineer's status. Cass was struck by the size of it all. Despite the ship being compact and stealth, main engineering had left nothing to the imagination. May I present Lieutenant Commander Sester, Pearson said. As he said the name, one of the tentacles rose, as if sensing something. Sester pushed himself out of the cradle, then, using his tentacles, cartwheeled over to Cass and Box. Hello... Hello, Commander, Cass said, staring up at the four-meter-tall alien. Nice ship you have here. Your jealousy does not become you, Caspian Rabo. Cass laughed. What's so funny? Box asked. The Commander here just caught me in some self-indulgence, Cass explained. I forgot you were empathetic. Not everyone is receptive to my thoughts. Only a certain few... I have heard of your exploits. For what it is worth, I don't believe all of them. Thank you, Cass said. I appreciate that. I'll assume you're the genius behind the undercurrent drive on this thing. They told me it's almost twice as fast. 
My kindred developed the technology. I only implement it. I understand you've brought a tracking device for us. May I see it? Cass held out the tracker, and one of Sester's tentacles reached out, the fingers on the end gently picking up the device and rotating it over in his hand. We can work with this. Please, follow me. Sester rolled to one of the workstations, handing the tracker to the junior engineer manning that station. The engineer nodded at him, receiving all the guidance he would need, and began hooking the device up to various diagnostic devices. Lieutenant Commander Blum told me you were not to be trusted. But I sense your distrust has been excised. May we trust each other? We may, Cass said. Excellent. Ensign Tyler will assist you further. He is capable. If you have problems, return to me. Thank you for your help, sir, Cass said. He didn't want to get back into the habit of addressing coalition officers with such formality, but he felt this was a special case. He hadn't seen a Claxian in probably a decade, and he'd never met one he didn't respect. Okay, Tyler said, looking over the device. Let's get started. Twenty nine. Evie stood outside the sick bay doors, contemplating. She couldn't get the image of the bloody sword out of her mind, the sword that had been passed down through her family for at least a hundred generations, the sword she'd heard legends about, how it had stopped an army of Precipico, or how it had saved the Anuli from certain death. In all honesty, probably nothing but rumors and hearsay and embellishments, but fun stories nonetheless for her dad to tell at gathering time. At least that's the way it used to be. Whenever she'd worn the sword, she'd felt the power of her family with her. But she never thought she'd actually have to use it one day. It was a good prop, something to scare the locals. It was like an unspoken rule. You just don't fuck with a woman with a sword. But that was all over now. She'd wanted to clean the blood off immediately, as if doing so would wipe the event from history the sword having forgotten that it had seen bloodshed under her care. But she hadn't done it. Partially because she'd been in a hurry to report to the captain. But also because she never wanted to touch it again. She'd taken a life with that sword, and in return she'd given up a small piece of herself she could never get back. She had taken one dark step toward life in the Sargan Commonwealth, or some other equally nefarious organization the type of organization that recruited killers for even the most basic of jobs. Before she knew it, she would be out there slicing people down left and right, all for a small bit of coin. It was inevitable. Evie shook her head, willing the thoughts to dissipate. She didn't have time for that nonsense. She needed to find out if the former prisoners knew anything about Venus' plans and where to find her because now there was more at stake than just one lost coalition ship and her crew. The Atlas could change the balance of power in this region of space for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. She took one step forward, and the door slid open for her. Inside, only two of the former prisoners remained, still being tended to by the nurses. Evie sought out Zax, finding her in her office as she interfaced with her console. No doubt, writing her meticulous reports she'd heard were more boring to read than the serial numbers off a Type 7 ship shuttle. Where did the rest of them go? Evie asked. Zax didn't turn around, only continued typing with her two four-fingered hands, while her two three-fingered hands examined a scanning device. I assigned them quarters and released them there, Zax said. They've had a taxing few days and need the rest. They were in no immediate danger. And those two? Evie asked, glancing beyond the doorway back into the main sick bay area. Just finishing up with them. They both had slight infections. Evie turned back to Zax. Nothing contagious? Zax turned around, her tiny mouth smiling. Of course not. Just a side effect of being cooped up in that box for a few days. I'm surprised it hadn't spread to all of them. 
Can I speak with them? They might have information about our mission, Evie said. Be my guest. But they've been through a traumatic ordeal. They need rest as soon as they can get it. Evie nodded, leaving the doctor to her work. Both former prisoners remained silent as she made her way over to them, not taking their eyes off her. They were the two who had helped find the tracker on Cass's ship. When the nurses saw her approaching, they left to give them privacy. I never got the chance to thank you for your help, Evie said, stopping a few meters from their beds. The girl's short legs dangled off the side, swishing back and forth, as if she were on a swing. Consider it repayment for rescuing us, the man Setsuma said. We owe you more than we can repay. She held her hands up. The coalition doesn't require repayment. You're free to stay and become citizens if you like, or we can return you to Paxi. Though since it isn't Sargan's space, it will take time to return you. Special requisitions will need to be made, and a stealth team... Setsuma put his hand up, cutting her off. I wouldn't dream of going back, he said. I've always been curious about the Coalition, just never had the means to get here. Evie turned to the girl. And you? I'll go back. My parents were captured at the same time I was. I need to try and save them. Evie's heart went out to the girl, and she couldn't help but feel a sense of deja vu. Don't you have any other family members? Anyone else you could stay with? The girl shook her head. Evie dropped her gaze for a moment. I'll see what I can do. But first... I need to know if you have any information about Venus' plans or capabilities. Maybe you overheard something while you were in the container. Maybe something Rasp or one of the others said. You may not even think it is important. Setsuma furrowed his brow. Like I told your crewmate, I was scheduled to be shipped to Cassiopeia. We were with a much larger group from Paxi and a few other worlds, I think. But then they pulled five of us to the side and stuffed us in that container. I heard Rasp say we were an emergency payment. Where were you being held? Evie asked. Before the container? Devil's Gate, in the lower levels, Setsuma replied. Damn. They'd been right under her the whole time, and she hadn't even known. When you were packed, did you notice anything? Hear anything? She was there, Yance said as Setsuma opened his mouth to respond. Evie turned to her. Who? Thena. I recognized her voice. She was on Paxi, too, helping to round us up. That's where I first heard her voice. I heard it again when they were separating us from the main group, but I never saw her. Could it have been a calm? Evie asked. I don't think so. She said she wanted to deal with this one personally. Yance continued to swing her feet back and forth. Cass had been right. Vina was close. Is there anything else? she asked. She has at least two ships, Setsuma said. How could you know that? Back on the ship, when we were trying to find the tracker, I overheard you say we were being pursued by four Class II gunners. Setsuma said. I'm assuming they were Sargan Steel Ravens. Evie nodded. Those are typically only launched from a battleship, either a Vortex or Darkness class vessel. But those types of ships are small, built for maneuvering in a planet's atmosphere. They can only carry three Steel Ravens per ship. So if we were being pursued by four, she had a second ship somewhere. Evie eyed him. You know a lot about Sargan starships, she said. Setsuma gave her a sheepish grin. I... I lied to your crewmate about being an architect. But I was afraid if I told you what I really did, he'd throw me out of an airlock. He paused, but Evie indicated for him to go on. I used to be a ship designer for the Sargans before my gambling and entertainment debts grew too large. I became more valuable as a saleable good than as an employee. 
Evie turned to Yance. And you? Anything you want to reveal? The girl shook her head. Evie returned her attention to Setsuma. Technically, you're a criminal, she said, so I'll have to confine you to quarters. But your help won't be without merit. It may just take you longer to earn your freedom. I'm no stranger to the inside of a cell, he replied, beaming with anticipation. I'll gladly pay off my debt, as required by the Great Coalition. Finally, Evie thought, someone who gets it. Evie returned to the bridge, her body humming with activity. She'd returned to her quarters to change her uniform and gather her thoughts, but had seen the sword again and thought better of it. As she walked on the bridge, she caught a nasty look from Lieutenant Page, but dismissed it. It was no secret he didn't like Cass, and now his ambivalence had seeped over to Evie, just as she suspected it eventually would if she continued to interact with the criminal. But that didn't matter anymore. She knew the truth, and so she ignored Paige as she made her way to the station. Green was in his command room. So, she said, taking her chair. The alien glanced up from his console. Scan the system for twin undercurrent trails, Sargan signatures. We're looking for two or more close together, possibly a small fleet. They were still hidden behind the third planet of Karpur, but their sensors should be able to pick up residual undercurrent trails if anyone had jumped from the system. Yes, Commander, Zal said, going about his work with efficient speed. Lieutenant, she said, indicating Page, I want full weapons readiness. Make sure everything is operating at top efficiency, she said. Is this because of what that traitor told you? Page asked. You have to know he's lying to us. He killed 24 Coalition crew members. We can't trust... Lieutenant, Evie growled, follow your orders or I'll have you relieved. Page sneered, but returned to his station, beginning his preparations for weapons drills. Evie took a deep breath and sunk back into her chair. Stubborn ass. Despite her short time on the ship, she hadn't seen Page this agitated before. In fact, before Cass had come on board... He'd seem like one of the most level-headed officers on the ship. Smart, capable, and professional. Was this how everyone felt about Cass? Yamashita hadn't been too happy with him down on Jatan, but she hadn't been as overtly hostile as Paige. What if they all knew the truth? Could she even risk revealing what really happened without risking a court-martial herself? What if the same thing happened? and the crew banded together against her. Green wouldn't allow that, though. Not if what she knew about the man was accurate. He wasn't someone who could be bullied into silence. She couldn't focus on that right now. She had a job to do. If what Setsuma and Yance told her was true, then Vina had been close to or on Jatan after all. And her goal had been to recapture Cass. And since she hadn't gotten him... She might be even more desperate to find the Atlas now. This had just turned from a search and rescue into a race to the finish line. Commander, Zal said, I may have something, but it's faint. We'll have to move out from behind Carpur 3 to get a better lock. Captain to the bridge, she announced. The autocom would notify Green without her needing to make a specific request. The doors to the hypervator opened to reveal Cass at the same time Green's command doors opened. Somebody call me? Cass said with a smile. Thirty. You insolent, Page said, stepping out from behind a station. Stand down, Lieutenant, Green said, making his way into the center of the room. He glanced over at Evie. Commander? Evie glanced from Cass to Green and back again. Sir, we may have a lock on the Sargans, she motioned to Zal. Cass turned his attention to Zal, who was working his controls while his body remained rigid. The hard light projection didn't do much as far as realism was concerned. It only looked human. It didn't move like a human. We need to move the ship to confirm the undercurrent trail, 
Zal reported to the captain. Cass spoke up. Where is it? he asked. Where does it lead? It's hard to tell from here, but I would extrapolate Quadro Sigma, Zal said. Cass shook his head. It's a false trail. She's got no reason to head in that direction. That's off toward Sill Space, the wrong direction. By now she has to know we're looking for her. She'll have set up decoys, anything to delay us. He turned to Evie. What did you find out? She stood. You were right. Vina is close, or she was. She has more than one ship searching. Cass nodded. She probably brought a small fleet. She won't give up easily. So now we're getting dragged into a war with the Sargans? How much trouble is this guy worth? Page asked. That's enough, Lieutenant, Green said. Mr. Rabot, I assume there's a reason you're on my bridge. Cass held up the tracker. With some help from your very capable chief engineer, we figured out how to track her. We managed to rig it to ping the original signal back to its source. Cass caught the eye of Blum at the bridge engineering station. Her face was impassive, but her eyes showed interest. We can use it without her knowing our position? Green asked. Cass nodded. I thought we were supposed to be looking for one of our ships, not tracking some Sargan scum, Page said. Green furrowed his brow. Saul, integrate the device into our systems. I want to find out which way they went, he said. Saul nodded, then seemed to float over to Cass, taking the tracker from him. Cass caught the touch of one of his hard light fingers. It was freezing to the touch. Commander, your thoughts. Green took the captain's chair as Zal returned to his station. If we find the Atlas and try to tow it back to Coalition space, we leave ourselves vulnerable to the Sargans. We need to find them first and throw them off the trail. Get them to waste their time searching elsewhere. Then we can bring it back without a fight. Evie said. Cass stood in front of the specialist station, which was still dark. Like I said, she won't give up easily, Cass said. I agree, we need to bring the fight to her, if for no other reason than to make sure she doesn't already have the ship. We should be able to tell by her heading. If she's on her way back to Sargan space, then we'll know. She'll already have her prize. Green nodded. Lieutenant Rond, move us out from behind Car Pur 3. Blackburn, plot a course along the trail indicated from Zal's station. Zal, activate the reverse tracker and take us in. Zal nodded, working the controls and bringing up his information on the primary display in the middle of the room. It also appeared on the 2D Master Systems display on the far wall. A blinking dot less than a light year away highlighted the screen. There she is, Cass said. As best he could tell, her course indicated she was moving away from Carpur back to Sargan space. She must have just left Carpur. She hasn't gotten very far. Anton Blackburn? Set pursuit course. Nearest undercurrent, Green ordered. Aye. Blackburn responded, building the navigation plan on the display before them, as Rond reoriented the ship. Cass took a seat in the specialist's chair, preparing to enter the undercurrent. ETA is less than thirty minutes, Blackburn announced once the route was complete. How is that possible? Cass exclaimed, standing back up. Assuming Vina left Jatan as soon as her last crippled fighter made its way back to her main ship, meant she should have at least an hour on them. Was the Tempest really that fast? Green smiled. You should ask Commander Sester, he said, keeping his attention on the primary display. It's his engine. Security to the bridge, Page said. Lieutenant? Evie asked, standing as well. Just an escort for our guest, Page said. He doesn't need to be on the bridge if we're going into battle. Cass glanced at Green. I'm afraid I have to concur with our tactical officer. Civilians aren't allowed on the bridge during war times. Neither are criminals, Page added, smirking with satisfaction. The main hypervader doors opened behind Cass, revealing two security officers. 
I might be able to help, give you some insight about the Sargan systems, Cass said, as the officers came over and stood behind a station. We'll take it from here. Thank you for your help, Mr. Ribot, Green said. Cass shot a look at Evie, but she only gave a light shrug. He supposed he should have been grateful for as much access as he'd been given. He was sure they could handle the Sargans. He might as well return to Bay One and help Box finish the repairs. Cass nodded and allowed himself to be escorted back to the hypervator. The door slid open and the security officers followed him in and he watched the bridge disappear. Why was he feeling such an ache to remain up there? Did he just want to be part of the action? Or was it something more? Box would probably call it a sense of duty, but that couldn't be it. Any sense of duty he'd had died long ago. Bay One, Cass announced, as he realized no one in the hypervator had specified a destination. However, the computer didn't provide its normal chime. Instead, blaring the command rejected chime. This hadn't been a problem before. Had they revoked all of his autonomy? He turned to one of the security officers. Would you mind? Looks like I've been grounded. The officer grinned. You could put it that way, he said. The hypervator stopped, and the officers escorted him out. Something was wrong. This wasn't the way to Bay One. Fellas, I think there's been a mistake here, he said. No mistake, the other one responded. Lieutenant Page instructed us to detain you, and that's what we're doing. You're putting me in the brig? Cash shouted. I don't believe this. Check with the captain, or Commander Diazol. Neither of them approved this order. The lieutenant is head of security, one of them said. He doesn't need their approval. It's his call. Oh, you have to be shitting me, Cass said as they led him down the hallway toward the brig. As the possibilities ran through his mind, throwing him deeper and deeper into panic as they came closer to the brig doors, the ship shook, throwing them all off balance. Cass hit the back wall hard. The wind knocked from his lungs. Lights in the hallway blared, and the general alert sounded. Cass took advantage of the momentary confusion to run back down the hallway to the hypervator, leaving the two security officers still managing to regain their footing. Come on, come on! Cass hit the panel as he waited for the hypervator. The ship shook again, throwing him against the sidewall. He glanced behind him to see one of the officers' faces hit the ground with a smack. The hypervator doors opened, and Cass jumped inside, allowing the doors to close again before the guards could scramble back to him. Once he was inside, he pulled the main control panel from the wall and yanked the two cables connecting the voice command system. The hypervator wouldn't move for his voice, but he could still input a manual test code, something he'd never forgotten from the academy. As he worked, he pulled his comm out of his pocket and sent a message to Box. Yeah, boss, the robot said on the other side. What's going on? I'm stuck in the middle of the ship. I don't have any eyes down here. According to the Excuses sensors, Box said, we're under attack by Sargan ships. Hey, I bet that's Vina. She really doesn't give up. You think? Cass yelled, inputting the last command. The hypervator began moving again. I'm headed back to the bridge to find out what's going on. Get the excuse as ready as you can. We might have to make a hasty getaway. Already on it, Box said, and cut the comm. As the hypervator rose, the ship shook again, this time much more violently than the last two. What had happened out there? Why wasn't Green running? The ship should easily be able to put enough distance between them and the Sargans. Finally, the hypervator slowed, and the doors opened. Except they opened on chaos. The bridge was a different world than the one he'd only left a few minutes before. A piece of the bulkhead was hanging from the ceiling, having smashed the primary display system in the middle of the room. Green and Evie were barking orders while smoke billowed from one of the side stations. Page and Za were frantically trying to maneuver the ship, and Cass could see why. 
Blackburn had taken a piece of the bulkhead directly to the middle of her chest. She was dead in her seat as Ront tried to compensate for the loss of their navigation station. The whole room was flashing red. Cass glanced around the chaos to the 2D display on the far side of the room. Five Sargan ships were on the screen, the largest being Vina's own dreadnought warship, at least four times the size of Tempest. And there, trapped in her tractor beam, was his old ship, the Atlas. Thirty-one. Cass dashed over to Blom Station, jumping over debris and ducking the bulkhead. She was bleeding from a cut on her head and was seemingly having trouble focusing. What the hell happened? Cass yelled. They were supposed to be thirty minutes away. As soon as we locked onto their signal, they appeared. It must have been a decoy, she said, slurring her words. Evie ran up beside them, taking Blom's head in her hands. She's got a concussion. Take the station, Evie yelled, helping Blom out of the chair. Cass glanced down to the engineering station as the ship shook again. He had to grip the side of the console to keep from flying off his feet. There was an oof and a thump to his right. He glanced over to see Evie and Blom sprawled against the wall. He ran over to help, but Evie waved him away. Get the goddamn engines back online, she yelled. Cass nodded and returned to the station, wiping part of the console covered in Blom's blood with his sleeve. He examined the systems. It looked like there had been an overload in the primary conduits when they came out of the undercurrent. The ship lurched to the left as Rond worked his controls, almost sending Cass out of his seat again. He hit the emergency restraints, which shot out from the seat and secured him in. A quick glance confirmed the dampeners were only working at 46% capacity. That would make an undercurrent jump uncomfortable, to say the least. One problem at a time. He had to figure out how to get them out of here. Evie said the engines were off, but as far as he could tell, they were working fine. But the primaries were out, and the backups hadn't kicked in, which meant no matter how much power they shunted to the engines, they wouldn't be moving until the connections were in place. Cass hit the comm button down to main engineering. Engineering, this is the bridge. Are you seeing what we're seeing up here? The primaries are out. This is Enton Tyler, sir, a young voice answered. We've almost got them back. Transfer to the secondary for now. Worry about the primaries later, Cass said. Sir, but won't that blow that... Don't argue, just do it. We stay here any longer and we won't have primaries, understand? Yes, sir, Tyler said, cutting the connection. Evasive maneuvers. Page, where is my firepower? Green yelled. Blades away, Page said. Cass glanced up to the screen momentarily to see two curved energy beams make their way toward the closest Sargan ship. They made a good hit, but as soon as the damaged ship pulled back, another took its place and continued firing on Tempest. Cass worked as fast as he could on the console, reinforcing the secondary systems with temporary force shields, hoping they could hold the amount of power he was about to send through them. It was just like falling back into an old habit. He'd used the same maneuver on the Atlas more than once when they'd been in dire straits. It was amazing how quickly it all came back to him. This ship might be the most advanced ship in the fleet, but it was still a coalition vessel underneath. Seconds later, the secondaries came online. Thank you, Tyler, Cass said under his breath. Instead of waiting for an order, Cass initiated the array and opened up the nearest undercurrent. Get us there now, Lieutenant, Green yelled, pointing at the undercurrent on the screen. Rond, sweat pouring down his brow, nodded and focused on the task at hand. Page, cover the rear. Three seconds later, they reached the undercurrent. Full thrust, Green yelled, his hands gripping the sides of his chair. Brace, Cass yelled, keeping his eye on the dampener fields. He only hoped they'd be enough so the entire crew wasn't turned into soup accelerating so quickly. The ship lurched dramatically and pulled Cass back into its seat so hard he thought it would break from its housing. Within a few seconds, the sensation dissipated. Clear, Evie announced. Sometime in the confusion, she'd made it back to her station. Green slumped back into his chair. Get me a full damage report. He took a look at Blackburn, slumped over in her chair, her eyes still open. Medical to the bridge. 
Cass secured the engineering station and made sure everything was stable. The secondaries were holding, thank goodness, which meant they should be able to sustain their speed for at least long enough to get out of range of Vina. He made his way over to Evie. What happened? It's like as soon as I left, everything went to hell. It was a trap, Evie said. She knew our position the moment we entered the undercurrent. We thought we could sneak up on her, but she was ready with her fleet. They ambushed us. The ship took a direct hit before we could even get the main shields up. The secondary hypervader doors opened to reveal two medics who hustled into the bridge. One hunched down over Blum, who was sprawled out on the floor behind Evie's station. The other made her way over to Blackburn. Cass released his restraints and pulled his comm from his belt. Box, what's your status? Shaken, but only barely stirred, Box replied. The ship? I've got communication equipment all over the place, and your room is a mess. But other than that, she's fine. The ship smells like alcohol. I think your bottle's broke. Get up to the bridge as soon as you can. I need you up here. Cass heard what sounded like a high-pitched squeal on the other end as Box cut the communication. Diazol, report, Green said from his chair. He was out of breath, and sweat peppered his brow, but he was focused, determined not to let his crew down. For the first time in a long time, Cass saw a captain he could actually admire. We should be out of range by now, Evie said. Cass got the engines back up, and with our advantage, if she's coming after us, it will take her twice as long to reach our position if we stop now. Understood. Full stop, Green said. Rond worked the controls, and the ship lurched to a halt, the dampener still only providing minimal protection from the inertia. Cass took a moment to survey the bridge. It was a mess. It would take weeks in space dock to repair. Somehow, Vina had known right where to hit them. I want to know what the hell happened. How was she there waiting for us? Green asked. I can take a pretty good guess. Page said, looking at Cass from the tactical station. He had a cut above his right eye, and the blood had run down the side of his face. Green ignored him. Zal? Checking now, sir, Zal said. His hard light simulation was unscathed, though Cass wondered if the creature underneath had suffered any injuries. The doors to the main hypervator opened to reveal Box, his yellow eyes blinking rapidly in excitement. Cass jumped up from his station and ran to his companion. Help us over here. We have to get this bulkhead off Blackburn. Cass glanced over at the medic, who was trying to reach the ensign, but with a massive piece of metal in the way, was having little luck. Blackburn deserved more than to stay pinned to her station like a piece of skewered meat. Box jogged over and pulled the bulkhead away, the sharp piece of metal that had penetrated Blackburn's sternum coming out easily. Box set the bulkhead down as the medic reached the ensign, closing her eyes. Behind her, Rond seethed. They must have been close. Box stood back. This isn't exactly what I had in mind during my first visit to the bridge, he said. Sir, I believe I found the issue, Zal reported. The tracker provided by Mr. Rebeau had a failsafe built into it. It didn't activate until we were within a certain proximity of the Sargan ships. I knew it, Page said, coming out from around his terminal. Just can't help yourself, can you, Rabo? Have to kill crew members on every mission you're a part of. Lieutenant, Green shouted, standing again. Page froze, but didn't take his eyes off Cass. Mr. Rabo, Commander, with me, right now. He turned and made his way to his command room. Page, you have the bridge. Cass noticed the other medic was already helping Blom to the hypervader. Backup shifts, report to the bridge, Page yelled, as Cass followed Green into the command room, with Evie right behind him. As soon as the doors closed behind her, Green laid into him. I do not take being played for a fool easily, Mr. Rabot, Green snapped. Tell me I haven't misjudged you. You haven't, Cass said. Sir, adding the last bit because it felt wrong not to do so. Did you have any idea about a backup in the tracker? Green asked. No, sir. But it's my fault. Box wanted to destroy the tracker as soon as we found it. 
but I thought we could use it. It was my idea to use it to trace her position back. I guess she was counting on that. She knows you, Evie said. She knew if you found it, you wouldn't want to let her get away. Green walked around behind his desk. It seems she's had the upper hand this entire time. He pressed a panel on his desk. Lieutenant Zoll? Sir? Zoll's voice came through the comm. Destroy that tracker. Yes, sir. Green cut the comm. It appears I have underestimated the Sargans' desire to have that ship. It's not even about the ship, Cass said. Vina probably still doesn't know what it can do. She's more interested in selling the weapon to one of the other Sargan dealers, someone who will use it to their own ends. She might even try to sell it to the heads of the Sargan Commonwealth themselves. And then we'll have a war on our hands, Green said. If they have a weapon based on SIL technology, nothing will stop them from breaking right through our borders and taking whatever they want. I don't understand, Evie said. She already has the ship and crew in her possession. Why does she still want you? Cass shrugged. My bet would be she doesn't like losing things. There's an old Sargan saying, Once inside, doors disappear. It means you can come and go, but you never really leave. I'm her possession. Also, if I had to guess, the crew of the Atlas isn't being very cooperative. Maybe she thinks I can help her use the weapon. Do you think she captured the crew of the Dry Dock as well? Evie asked. Green shook his head. I don't know. He tapped his paddle again. Lieutenant Page, report to my command room. A moment later, the doors opened to reveal Page. Blood still smeared the side of his face. He shot a nasty glance at Cass, but kept his composure. Lieutenant, give me a tactical analysis of the Sargans out there, Green said. Five ships in total. We disabled two of the smaller vessels. But the largest ship, the Dreadnought, we're no match for. We need a coalition warship or destroyer to take on something of that size. We can't survive another confrontation like that, especially if they know we're coming. We've taken care of that issue, Green said. Are you going to tell him about how you tried to have me arrested? Cass asked. Page furrowed his brow as Green stared at him. Lieutenant? It was for the safety of the ship, Page said. I didn't want him roaming around when we were going into a combat zone. Couldn't just confine me to quarters? Or to my own ship? Cass asked. That's enough, Green said. This bickering gets us nowhere. Lieutenant? Return to the bridge and oversee repairs. Commander? As you're the only one who doesn't hate Mr. Rabot, I want you to escort him back to his ship, where he will remain until we have sorted through this mess. Yes, sir, Evie and Page said together. And get that robot off my bridge, he added. Wait. What are you going to do? Cass asked. I see no choice but to make my report to Admiral Rutledge and await reinforcements from the fleet, Green replied. You can't do that. Rutledge won't just send reinforcements, Cass said. He's already skittish enough. You tell him the ship was captured by the Sargans, and he'll probably make a case for all-out war to the Coalition Council himself. Remember, he's not the only one who knows about this project. What project? Page asked, glancing between the three of them. Then what would you suggest, Rabot? You heard the lieutenant. We're outclassed and outgunned. They have the ship. What am I supposed to do? Green asked, flustered. Send me over there, Cass said. Send me, and I'll blow it up. Thirty-two. Page had to contain himself to keep from bursting out laughing. You? We're supposed to trust you to go back over to the woman you used to work for and blow up your own ship? Cass nodded. Give me a break. He glanced over to the captain. You can't seriously be considering this. 
As soon as he gets over there, he'll reveal our position, and the Sargans will have two ships to tow back instead of one. Seems to me if he'd wanted to betray us, he would have already done it by now, Evie said. What do you call that out there? Paige shouted. They were waiting for us. He led us straight into a trap with that damn tracker of his. And if he'd wanted us to stay dead in the water, he wouldn't have gotten the engines back up and running, Evie argued. The Sargans had us dead to rights. Paige turned back to Green. Sir, don't do this. He's a convicted criminal. Twenty-four deaths because of his action. Another five today. He is a walking slaughterhouse. Five. A pit erupted in the bottom of Cass's stomach. He'd hoped the casualties had been limited to Ensign Blackburn, but he'd been wrong. Maybe he didn't deserve to take down the Atlas. Maybe he deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison. Was Paige wrong? After all, if not for Cass, all those crew members would still be alive. Green-faced Cass. How would you do it? Get to your ship. Cass shook the thoughts away. He needed to focus. I would need the Tempest to create a distraction. I'd launch the excuse here and follow you through the undercurrent, both of us coming out at the same time, at different points. Tempest would take a strafing run to the nearest ships, while I got the excuse close enough to dock with the Atlas. My ship is small enough that a big distraction should keep me off their scanners long enough to match the hull frequency of the Atlas. I know it by heart. It won't be hard. Then I get on, enable the self-destruct, and get out. Meet back up with you here. Page sent him a hard stare. Or how about this? You never show up at the fight at all and run away, just like you did five years ago, Page said. Commander, Green said to Evie, your thoughts. It's a sound strategy, but I agree. He can't go alone, Evie said. Cass shot her a look. If something goes wrong, if there's a malfunction, we won't get another chance. There needs to be at least two people on the mission. No way, Cass said, stepping forward. I'm not putting any more lives in danger. If it's just me, no one else can get hurt. I can do this, Captain. I just need the chance. See, Paige said, he just wants to do it himself so we can run if it gets tough. Cass turned and decked the man, sending him sprawling back. Paige's eyes turned to fire as he regained his balance, holding himself up against the wall. He bared his teeth and made a lunge for Cass, only to find Green standing in his way. Cass tried to move forward, but Evie had wrenched her hands around his, holding him back. He tried to lunge against her, but found he couldn't quite move as much as he thought he should be able to. She was strong. Dismissed, Lieutenant, Green shouted at the man seething in front of him. Take care of the bridge. I'll be back out there in a moment. Page took a deep breath and straightened his uniform. He then turned and exited the room. Green spun on Cass, whom Evie still had in a hold. It's a damn good thing you aren't an officer anymore. Or I'd have you demoted for that, Green scolded. Cass relaxed his body and felt Evie ease her hold on him. Now, if you really think you can destroy that ship, I'm all for it. But I want a backup. Commander Diazal goes with you. Sir, this is not up for debate, Rabot. You either do it my way, or we call the Admiral. Cass shut up. Evie let him go, standing beside him. We know where the Sargans are at the moment, so we need to be fast. I don't want them moving on us. We'll move closer, launch your ship, and then return to their position at regular undercurrent speed. Once you're away, we'll use our full resources to get out of their weapons range. You'll be on your own. Understood, Cass said. You try anything funny, or you abscond with my officer, I'll hunt you down and destroy you myself. Is that clear? Green stared at him with an intensity Cass rarely had seen from another human. He had a deep desire not to disappoint the man. I won't let you down, Cass said. We don't have long. 
Get down there quick, and let me know as soon as you're ready to launch, Green said. Dismissed. Cass nodded and turned, exiting the command room. Evie remained a moment, and the doors closed, leaving the captain with his XO. Cass took a moment to survey the bridge again. The medics had managed to remove Blackburn, and her destroyed controls had been transferred to the specialist station, manned by a new ensign Cass didn't know. Page sat in the captain's chair, barking orders and reviewing reports. He ignored Cass as he made his way around the outside of the bridge. Box sidled up to him. Principal's office, huh? Did he get detention? More like a bunch of extra homework, Cass replied. The command room doors opened again, and Evie came out with Green, who took the captain's chair from Page. Cass led Box over to the main hypervator doors, where Evie met them. Your captain is uncommonly fair, Cass whispered. Why do you think I wanted this assignment so bad? Evie replied. The doors to the hypervator opened, and the three got inside. Bye, Bridge, Box called. Nice seeing you. Once the doors were closed, Cass turned to Evie. I wanted to thank you for standing up for me back there. But you didn't need to do that. I can handle myself, he said, remembering a similar conversation with her earlier. No, you couldn't, she smirked. Your ass would have been grass if I hadn't been in there to back you up. Ass would have been grass? Box asked, his eyes blinking confusion. An old colloquialism. It means he would have been in deep shit, Evie said. Now wait a second. I can hold my... He's good at doing that, Box spouted, pointing at him. It's an apt metaphor. Cass turned to Box. Would you please for once shut up? I'm trying to relay some real emotions here. Evie scoffed. Are you even sure you know what those are? See, this is why I wanted to go alone. The two of you are going to drive me to an early grave. That's the idea, Box sing-songed, because I get the ship. Robots can't own ships, Cass yelled. Evie turned to him, getting into his personal space. You need to tell me everything you're going to do. And you need to instruct me on how to do it, too. Holy crap, Cass. She's close enough to kiss, Box said. Without taking his eyes off Evie, whose face was impassive as stone, Cass pushed Box toward the wall, the clink of metal meeting metal echoing through the hypervator as he bounced off and righted himself. Sorry about him. Are you saying you don't trust me to get the job done? No, Evie said. But if something happens to you over there, we need a backup. I need to know everything you know. It doesn't hurt that it prevents me from springing any surprises on you, Cass added. Evie shrugged. We'll just call that a bonus. Now tell me how to enable the self-destruct. Ten minutes later, they were all aboard the reasonable excuse, helping the maintenance crew put the comm system back together. I don't know why we didn't have one of these before, Box yelled from the back compartment. What, a maintenance crew? Cass sat up in the cockpit with Evie, going over the plan of attack. Yeah, they're so much faster than you in every way conceivable, the robot yelled back. Maybe if someone had gotten off his metal ass and done something other than watch net dramas all day, we might have had some extra money for one. I need those dramas. They help my stress level. Cass rolled his eyes. Has he always been like that? Evie asked. Like what? A royal pain? Cass smiled. No, he's so unrobot like Cass tapped the nav panel in front of him, showing them the course. We didn't meet under ideal circumstances. But I always knew there was something off about him. The first words out of his mouth to me were a lie. Only it took me some time to figure that out. But at the time, I needed a pilot and wasn't asking questions. Later on, I became curious and started investigating his internal systems. Someone programmed him very differently than any other machine I've met before. So, I figured, why not take him to the next level? I opened up his learning centers, increased his memory and emotional capacities. The problem is, I never knew when to stop. Before I knew it, he'd kind of... come alive, Evie suggested. 
if you want to think of it that way. I tend to think of it more as just a very complex interaction between millions of programs in its cortex. It led to some interesting results. I'll say, Evie said. Box's humming reached them even all the way down here. They're not that different from non-artificial life forms, Cass said. I guess I was curious to see how much his systems could handle. He tapped the screen again, confirming the course. He hasn't hit the limit yet. It's amazing if you think about it. He's like your offspring, Evie smiled. Don't say that. You're making it weird, Evie chuckled. Cass stood, checking the rest of the systems in the cockpit. How are we doing down there? He called down the hall. They're just finishing now, Box called back. Ready to go in five minutes. Cass turned to Evie. Okay, I think we're good. Call the captain. Yes, sir, she replied, tapping the back of her hand. Go ahead, Green said through the system. Five minutes, Evie replied, and we're good for launch. Understood, Green said. Good luck out there, Commander, he cut the calm. For the first time in a long time, Cass was nervous. It had been a while since people had counted on him for something. Something other than money, that was. But not only would his plan get rid of the Atlas, it would show Vina he wasn't anyone's property, no matter what she did. She'd wanted a fight, and losing Rasp had probably only enraged her further, but he didn't care. She wasn't getting this weapon, and neither was Rutledge. He'd have to start all over again. Sure, Cass would probably go to jail for the rest of his life, but at least his conscience would be clear. Coming up on undercurrent jump, Evie said, as Box entered the cockpit, taking the pilot seat. Thanks for keeping it warm, grass ass, he said, settling in. Cass ignored him. Is the maintenance crew off? Affirmative, boss. Retract the landing ramp and prepare to launch, he said, taking the co-pilot seat. Evie stood behind him, monitoring the excuses systems. You act like I've never done this before. No need to spout orders to impress the lady. Cass felt heat rushing up his cheeks, but he stamped it down as best he could, keeping his focus on Bay One's opening. He made a mental note to thank Sester for fixing the dampener so quickly. He'd barely felt the jolt into the undercurrent this time. Approaching Jettison Point, Evie said. They exited the undercurrent, coming back into normal space. Launch, Cass said. Box pushed the throttle forward, and the ship shot out of the bay, entering the inky darkness of space. He turned the ship immediately to come alongside the Tempest as it opened another undercurrent. The excuse used its own emitters and followed along, keeping pace with the ship now that it was moving at a normal undercurrent speed. Cass wished he'd had more time down in engineering to examine the systems that made Tempest so fast, but there just hadn't been time. He would have liked to use some of those upgrades on his own ship, if possible. ETA 10 minutes, Evie said. Here we go. Thirty-three. The Tempest pulled ahead in the undercurrent. Far enough, they could no longer see her through the windows, though she was still visible on the view screen. Ready, Box? Cass asked. I want my own quarters, Box replied, his concentration still on the controls. What? As payment for this, you owe me quarters, he replied. You're asking for this now? Cass glanced at Evie, then back at his pilot. Fine, whatever. You get one of the hab suites. Are we on course or not? Sure. Now we are. Box, were you going to jeopardize this mission for quarters? Cass asked, his words strained. Box turned his head to him. No, of course not, he said, with sarcasm dripping from his voice. He continued to stare at Cass as he dropped out of the undercurrent. Heads up, Cass yelled. Ahead of them, Tempest had already exited and performed the strafing maneuvers. Three of the smaller Sargan ships were in pursuit, apparently having broken formation around Vina's dreadnought. They'd come out of the undercurrent closer than Cass had anticipated. Whoa! Box jerked the throttle to the right, sending the ship spinning. The dampeners kept them from feeling the effects as the ship cartwheeled over itself three times before he righted them again. Are we good? Can we get in without getting spotted? 
Evie yelled. The Atlas sat below Vina's dreadnought, held in place by a green tractor, despite the fact neither ship was moving at the moment. She wasn't about to take her hands off that ship, no matter what happened. We're close, Box yelled, punching the normal engines, sending them rocketing forward. The Atlas only had one docking bay, located on the rear of the ship. But like Tempest, it didn't have a retractable door, instead relied on force fields to keep the vacuum of space out. Have we been spotted? Evie asked. Cast checked the equipment. As far as he could tell, all the Sargans' attention was on Tempest, who was still performing strafing runs and getting hit in the process. We need to get in there now, she yelled. Give Tempest time to get away. Twenty seconds, Box said, pushing the engines to their max. Cass prayed they weren't big enough to register on Venus scanners. Her dreadnought was huge, at least 2,000 meters long. It dwarfed the Atlas, not to mention Cass's ship. Hurry, Evie said. Tempest is going back into the undercurrent. Ten seconds, Box said. They're gone, Evie replied. Cass glanced out the main window to see Atlas's bay approaching with disturbing speed. Box, slow down, he turned to his pilot. Box? Three seconds, Box replied. Evie, hang on to something, Cass yelled. They breached the base force field, only for Box to throw the thrusters into full reverse, as the excuse came dangerously close to slamming into the wall of the bay. They all jerked forward, the dampeners unable to compensate for such a move, but the ship came to a floating halt. We're in, Box said, smugness in his voice. He lowered the excuse to settle on the deck of the bay. Cass turned to Evie. You okay? Fine. Let's get in there and finish this. She reached down to a small case she'd brought on board, opening it. She grabbed the weapon inside and handed it to Cass. It was his boom cannon. You might need this. Just don't shoot me in the back with it, okay? She holstered her own weapon, a standard coalition pistol. Cass beamed at her, taking the weapon and holstering it inside his jacket. You're all right, Diazol. After everything I've done, I'm not sure I'd trust me with this if I were in your shoes. I guess that's the difference between us, she said, straightening her uniform shirt. Let's move. Cass turned to Box. Keep it on hot standby, okay? We might need a quick exit. Just don't forget you promised, Box replied, initializing the main coolant tanks. I won't, Cass replied, following Evie out of the cockpit. As he reached the main door lock, he heard Box call, Be careful, from the front. Aww, Evie said, hitting the main lock door to open. Yeah, yeah, Cass replied, following her. He pulled his comm out, thankful they'd taken the time to fix the system before leaving. Box, give me a scan of the immediate area. Anything we need to worry about? No life signs, boss, he replied as they walked down the ramp. No one on this ship anywhere, as far as I can see. But all the power systems are still active. We need to find that weapon, Evie said. Disabling it should be our first priority. Blowing up the ship will disable the weapon, Cass replied. And to do that, we need to make it to the bridge. She pursed her lips. Indulge me, she said. Backups, remember? If we, for some reason, can't blow up the ship, I want to make sure they can't use the weapon. Cass relented. Fine. It will probably be in main engineering. But we'll have to take the long way. If we use the hypervators, it might register as power spikes in the system. And if anyone on Venus' ship is monitoring, it will look suspicious. You mean we have to use the access corridors? Cass forced a smile. Yep. She sighed. Lead the way. Twelve minutes later, they were crawling on their bellies through the access corridors that connected Deck 11 with main engineering. They'd already been through seven of the things, and Cass's arms and legs ached in a way he hadn't felt in some time. The access corridors weren't more than a meter in any direction mostly made for maintenance spots and the occasional worker to reach sensitive systems. They certainly hadn't been designed for comfort or ease of access for the crew to get to certain parts of the ship. What do you think happened to the crew? Evie asked as they crawled. Probably in holding cells on Venus' ship. 
She wouldn't kill anyone she couldn't sell or use later, he replied. That's comforting. How much further? Another three meters in this corridor. Then another ladder, then another short corridor, and we'll be there, Cass replied. Stepping back in the ship had been like being home again. Only it was a home he'd been kicked out of. He'd heard the saying you could never go home again, but he wasn't so sure. It all felt familiar to him. He'd even remembered being in this particular corridor before, back when Mason had needed a power realignment and had been too wide to fit. The man spent most of his off time at the ship's gymnasium, and his shoulders were as wide as Cass was tall. Cass smiled at the memory. Mason couldn't have crawled through these things if he'd wanted to. Almost, Cass said, exiting the main corridor into the junction with the last ladder they needed to climb. Engineering would be only a few steps away. Evie grunted along behind him, and he was glad she decided not to bring her sword. It would have been a tough fit getting that thing down the tubes. As he reached the top of the ladder, it occurred to him they would have to come back this way as well. He groaned. What's wrong? she asked. Nothing. Just thinking about the return trip. The last corridor was wider than the others, enough so that he could crouch walk to the engineering access door. But when he approached the doors, they wouldn't open for him. I'm locked out, he said. Let me try, she replied. Only one of us isn't a known criminal. Your organic ID is in the system, prevents you from accessing any sensitive areas of the ship. She stood in front of the door, and it opened for her. Did you revoke that restriction of the Tempest? he asked. I didn't have any trouble accessing the bridge there. She winked. I might have had something to do with it. Plus, it pisses Paige off, and that makes me just the slightest bit happy. That guy needs to learn how to control his temper, Cass said. He wasn't the one who struck first. She had a point. They entered main engineering. It was similar in layout to Tempest Engineering Department, except without the giant cradle for the Claxian engineer. Cass wondered if all coalition ships would eventually be outfitted with Claxians from now on, since it seemed to help with the ship's speed and efficiency. Would a bunch of Claxians even want to serve on ships? From what Cass knew about them, most preferred to stay on their homeworld, though Commander Sester had obviously been an exception. Oh, Edie said. Cass had been too lost in the nostalgia of being back in his old ship to notice the massive modifications that had been made to engineering. In the middle of the room, where the master systems display should have been, was a gyroscope, or at least what looked like a gyroscope at first glance. As Cass drew closer, he could see, while it had the appearance of one, it had to work completely differently. None of the circles was complete. Each was missing segments in their rotations, and in the center of the device was a golden ball which glowed gold. He could almost feel the energy pulsing off it. Is this the weapon? Evie asked. Has to be. This is not Coalition Tech, he replied. He had the overwhelming urge to turn it on just to see what it did. But doing so would register a power spike, and they couldn't risk being caught. It's attached to the main weapons array. This must be the primary power source for the weapon's destructive capability. Cass? Evie bent in front of the device. He leaned over to see what she'd found. In front of the base of the device was a pile of black dust, as if something from the device had incinerated and collected on the ground. Now that Cass looked, it was everywhere. This is the same stuff that was on the dry dock, he said. But there was so much more of it here. Did they ever identify it on Tempest? I never saw a report, Evie said. But you're right. It looks exactly the same. Cass went over to one of the main engineering stations and initiated a scan of the room. There was 44 cubic meters of the dust scattered throughout engineering, but nowhere else on the ship. This doesn't make any sense. Why would it just be in this room and on the command floor of the dry dock? Why isn't it anywhere else? We can figure it out later. Right now, we have a job to do. I need you to permanently disable it. Right, Cass said. The wheels in his mind were turning. 
he couldn't stop thinking about that dust. Where would it all have come from? It didn't make any sense. He walked over to the gyroscope and opened the access panels below it, which required pushing small mounds of the dust away. Inside, it was a mess. Nothing like he'd ever seen before. The parts had obviously been manufactured by the Coalition, but they'd been assembled in a way that didn't make sense at all. Is this how SIL technology worked? You just threw a bunch of things together, and all of a sudden you had super weapons? He wished he could take some time to study the device, understand how it worked. You'll need to purge all references of the device and the computer, Cass said, as he examined just how he was going to disable this weapon he knew nothing about. Won't that show up as a power surge? Evie asked. He shrugged. You were the one who wanted the assurances. And until this ship is in a billion pieces floating through space, the information is vulnerable. Damn, she muttered under her breath. She made her way over to one of the consoles while he continued to examine the device. Probably the best way to disable it would be to take apart as much of the inner workings as he could. He thought about just shooting the thing, but without knowing more about it, he didn't want to risk an overload of some kind. Okay, then, he said. We'll do it the hard way. He got up and jogged to the other side of engineering to grab a maintenance kit from the wall. Inside were all the tools an engineer could ever need. Spanners, ratchets, bolt sealers, fusion guards, etc. He returned to the device and began work on removing its guts piece by piece. After the third panel came off, he stopped cold. Evie? Hmm? She said from the console station. Your people were right about the dust. It's the crew. Thirty-four. What? she asked, turning from the active station. He moved to the side to reveal the inside of the gyroscope's base. Is that a negative mass interdimensional particle? Cass finished for her. I don't know if it's what powers the weapon, or if it's a byproduct of it. When Cass had removed the last panel, it had revealed a transparent casing of some kind, and within the casing was a very bright object, almost like a miniature sun, something that shouldn't even be able to exist in this dimension. Is it really a one-dimensional object? she asked, leaning in closer. That's the theory, Cass replied. But somehow, this one is stable and large enough to exist in a three-dimensional space. She was getting too close. Cass took her shoulder and pulled her back. What? she asked. ID particles are theorized to emit a type of thorium radiation, Cass replied. It robs molecules of carbon and other proteins, leaving nothing but inorganic materials behind. If the weapon uses this type of radiation as its power source, it would explain all the dust. They tested the weapon, Evie said. And it ended up killing them, Cass added. She stepped away from the device. But if they knew it emitted this kind of radiation, why use it in the first place? Cass shook his head. I don't know. Did you find anything in the records? Not yet. I finally got the system up and running. I had to use my own credentials to get in. Cass took a look at the computer interface. It probably won't even open for a rank less than lieutenant commander. I guess it's a good thing you came along after all. Can you still disable it? Evie asked. I don't want to be anywhere near that thing, Cass said. I don't know enough about it to shut it down without it killing both of us. Our best bet is my original plan. Blow up the ship and let it take care of itself. Evie's eyes fixed on the dust collected all around the gyroscope. You're right. But give me a minute to download all the technical specifications. I'm not letting Rutledge get away with this, she said. They court-martial you for 24 deaths. As far as I'm concerned, he's the one responsible for the death of every member of this crew and the space dock. There were 171 people on this ship, Cass said. He couldn't believe this was all that remained of his former crewmates. If he hadn't been kicked off the ship, he would have ended up just like them. Can you set up the self-destruct from here? 
Evie asked, returning to the computer. Probably, he replied. Assuming my codes still work. The captain may have changed them. Or they could still be in the system. I won't know until I try. Get on it. I want to get this done and out of here as fast as we can. Boss! Box's voice came through his communicator. Cass pulled it from his pocket. Yeah? You've got company. Fifteen non-friendlies headed your way. Cass bared his teeth and surveyed the room again. They were out in the open here. Where did they come from? I don't know. I picked up their life signs three decks above you. They're on their way down to the hypervator now, he replied. Scan for a shuttle or anything, Cass yelled. There's a small shuttle docked at the top of the ship, he replied. It probably dropped down from the dreadnought. You better get back here. Cass glanced at Evie, who was working the controls of the station. I've only got about half of it, she said. Leave it. Fifteen to two aren't good odds, he grabbed her arm. She wrenched it away, staring daggers at him. What about the self-destruct? There's no time. It would take me at least five minutes to set it up, and we'll be lucky if we have thirty seconds. Accessing the computer must have tipped them off after all. I'll draw them off. She pulled her weapon from its holster. You finish downloading the logs and set up the self-destruct. Draw them off where? You don't know anything about this ship, he replied. You're just as bound to get lost and lead them right back here as you are to get away. Her face was a mix of fury and indignation. It's a standard Constellation class ship, Mr. Rabot. I think I know how to get around. And I don't need you reminding me what I can and can't do. He put his hands up in defense. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. But you drawing them off is just going to get you or me cornered somewhere. We need to go. Figure out another plan. She winced, her eyes darting between him and the console. Fine, she said, pulling her uplink from the computer and replacing it in her belt. Cass drew his weapon. Box? Which way are they coming in? Access E2 and E6, Box replied. Both sides of engineering. They meant to box them in. We'll have to go back the way we came, Cass indicated the access door to the side. That will take too long, she replied. Talk about making for easy targets. Then what do you suggest, he asked. The main engineering door rolled away, revealing eight of the soldiers behind him. Evie raised her weapon. A frontal assault. She fired as Cass ducked, spinning around and using his own weapon on the men scattering away from the opening. Blasts of plasma flew past them as they got into cover behind one of the consoles. If they hit that gyroscope, Cass said, I guess we won't have to worry about blowing up the ship then, will we? Evie smirked. She jumped out of cover again and fired three more times. Behind them, the E6 doors opened on the upper level, and six more soldiers emerged, taking stock of the scene before them. Oh, shit. Time to move, Cass said, pulling Evie back, as a blast of plasma hit the ground where she'd been standing only a moment ago. I bet you wish you had your sword right now. Could be really handy. He took a few shots at the men on the upper balcony, but they all managed to duck the blasts. They couldn't keep this up for much longer, otherwise they'd be completely pinned in. The main door was still open. All they needed to do was get through it, and they could sprint the hallways to the closest hypervader, which was Hypervader 3, if Cass remembered correctly. That would take them directly back to the ship, but there was so much fire coming from that direction, it would be nearly impossible to get over there. It's too much, he yelled over the blasts, still holding Evie's uniform as she laid down some fire of her own. They were obscured from the view of the upper level, but the soldiers only had to move a few more meters to the right, and they'd be in their crosshairs again. I can do this, Evie yelled back. Just give me some cover. Cass let go of her uniform and put both hands on the boom cannon, pointing it at the upper level where the men would come around. The first one popped his head out, and Cass squeezed the trigger, sending the blast sailing up and smashing into the bulkhead where the man's head had been only a second before. The man jumped out again, and Cass fired three more times, one of the blasts catching him in the chest and sending him back to the wall. Evie continued to fire at the group in the front, but Vina's soldiers wouldn't stay put. 
they'd find a way to make their way around the stations to ambush them. Oh, damn, Evie drew back. One of the blasts had caught her in the arm, which was now missing a significant chunk from the upper part. She fell back to his side, her hand over the wound. Lucky bastard, that was a one in a thousand shot, she said through gritted teeth. That was it. She was injured, and they were still pinned down, and they'd only taken out maybe two or three of the soldiers. Cass glanced over to the access corridor exit. They didn't have another choice. But could Evie even crawl now with an injured and bloody arm? He should have just made her go. Arrgh. Cass exchanged looks with Evie, and they both peeked over the wall to see Box running in through the main door, an old chair in his hands, swinging it wildly back and forth. The soldiers in cover turned to fire on him, but he was quicker than they could anticipate, and one by one he smacked them with a metal chair, sending their weapons, equipment, and sometimes teeth in all directions. He was like a robot possessed. Cass had never seen him so enraged. Come on, Box yelled after he'd hit the last one. A blast hit him in the side, but he paid no attention. Cass glanced up to the upper level, where the soldiers were still in position and were now taking shots at Box. Cass pushed Evie forward as Box hurled his blood-soaked chair with the closest soldier on the upper level, who tried to scream and run, but only succeeded in making a brief noise before the chair smashed into him, sending him sprawling. Box stood by the door, ushering them forward as more shots peppered the ground around them. Cass pushed Evie forward, praying to core he could get her out before any other hits landed. They reached the door, and Box hit the panel beside it, rolling the massive door closed again. Hurry, there's another ship approaching, Box said, grabbing Evie and hoisting her under his arm, as he took off in a sprint for the hypervader. Cass took off after him, checking behind him every few seconds to see if the other soldiers were still in pursuit. I can run on my own. I'm not an invalid, Evie yelled. What are you doing up here? Cass called as they made their way down the hall. Making sure I get my room, Box yelled back. Yeah? I thought you wanted the whole ship. All you had to do was leave us, and it could have been yours, he replied, checking behind him again. Still no pursuit. Box turned to him just as they reached the hypervator. It's more of a long-term plan. I can start small. I've never seen you so enthusiastic, Cass said. I was reenacting Lady Regina Thornhouse's reaction to finding out Lord Thornhouse cheated on her with a chambermaid. She beat people with a chair? A wooden one. Cass nodded in approval. Good call, then. The doors opened, and Cass followed them in, just as a blast ricocheted off the side of the door. Cass fired back as the doors closed. Shuttle Bay, Box announced, and the hypervator began dropping. He set Evie down on the ground, inspecting her wound. You've lost 4% of your upper arm mass. She pulled her hand away to reveal a deep gash. Box was right. Part of her arm had been torn away by the Sargan's weapon. Evie sucked in a breath as she saw all the blood. It's probably not as bad as it looks, Cass said. Can you still feel your fingers? She wiggled them. Yeah, but it hurts. I would have much rather been shot by whatever hit you, she replied. Cass couldn't disagree. Dealing with temporary numbness had to beat getting half your arm ripped away any day. We have to stem the flow of blood, Box announced, and grabbed Cass's shirt underneath his jacket, ripping a perfect strip all the way down the center of Cass's chest. Box, you did not... Would you rather her bleed out? he asked, applying the makeshift bandage on the wound, tying it tight. Ah... Evie grimaced as Box cinched the wound. The doors opened to the bay access, and Box picked Evie up again against her protestations while Cass ran ahead to make sure the area was clear. No sign of anyone. Let's move. We got lucky, he yelled as Box bolted past him up the ramp with the excuse and through the locks. Cass took one last look around and followed. Inside, Box deposited Evie in the kitchen, then went to the cockpit to confirm the startup sequence. Fast as you can, Box, Cass yelled. He went over to check on Evie. Are you okay? Can you make it another few minutes to the rendezvous? She squinted, still holding the wound, and nodded. Go. Get us out of here. He hated to leave her, 
but she'd be okay for a few minutes. Cass made his way to the cockpit, just as Box had fired the engines. Punch it, he said, and the ship lurched forward, bursting out of the hangar bay into open space. Somehow, I didn't think we would make it, Cass added, scanning the surrounding space. The only other ship in the area was the Dreadnought, which quickly fell behind them. One of the indicators beside Box began blinking. Uh, boss? Cass glanced over. Is that the Tempest? Box shook his head. Caspian, Vina's voice boomed through the internal speakers. How nice of you to visit. Thirty-five. Vina, Cass said as her image appeared on the screen in front of him. I hoped I'd never have to see you again. Now that's not a very nice thing to say. You hurt my feelings, Vina replied in that sickeningly insincere voice of hers. Two of her ships have changed course and are on our tail, Box said, pushing the engines even harder. What do you want? Cass asked, readying the undercurrent drive. Even if they couldn't outrun Vina's ships, they could at least keep them in pace in the undercurrent. But he'd have to lead them away from Tempest. Why, you, of course. You're my key to a unique and special lock, Venus said. The prize is no good without someone who knows how it works. And based on what I've learned, you are the perfect person to help me operate it. I just got a pretty good look at your super weapon down there. Sorry about your men, by the way. I can tell you one thing. It's pretty much useless. Vina waved her hand in front of the screen dismissively. Somehow I doubt that. The Coalition wouldn't have gone to so much trouble to build such a weapon if it didn't work. Even if it doesn't, the information itself is worth more than its weight in Casope. Just imagine what the Claxians will do once they find out humans from their precious coalition have conspired to build a superweapon based on SIL technology. Cass cursed. She really did know everything. Aw, oh, now don't be upset, Caspian. You really didn't think I'd let you go without a little insurance now, did you? That mercenary act by your new girlfriend was pretty pathetic. She's not his girlfriend. They're not initiating sexual encounters, Box yelled. Vina grinned in the screen. I'm glad to see my robot is still in good working order. I feared you might have tried to disassemble him after you left. What do you mean your robot? Cass asked. I mean, he's been the one transmitting all this wonderful information to me, Venus said, grinning even wider. Didn't you know? Box turned to Cass. What's she talking about, boss? Cass shook his head. No, that's not possible, he said. We found your tracker. It was in the communication equipment. Oh, you found the decoy. Yes. Very good. Bravo, Caspian. You're too clever for your own good. She mocked clapping. Evie, get up here, Cass yelled. He turned to Box. Are you compromised? Have you been spying on us this entire time? Box's eyes blinked wildly. No, of course not. I don't... I haven't... Oh, he doesn't know about it, poor thing, Vina said. The best type of informant is one who doesn't even realize he's informing. My maintenance crew managed to get the drop on him while we were unloading my wares before you left. Made a few modifications, you could say. Box... Get away from the controls, Cass said. Boss, I'm fine. She's lying. I'm not. Evie made her way into the cockpit, still holding the bandage on her arm. What's going on? There's our mercenary now, Venus said, making small claps with her hands. Now that we're all together... The ship shook with the force of a plasma blast, and Evie was knocked to the ground. Cass grabbed onto the nearest thing he could to keep from being thrown from his chair. We're caught in a tractor, Box said. Wait, this can't be right. We're back under the Atlas. We haven't gone anywhere. Thank you, Box, for delivering my cargo undamaged, Vina said. You have been more helpful than you can imagine. Box slammed his hands down on the controls. I'm not your slave, he yelled. 
Cass jumped over the seat to help Evie back up. The bleeding around her arm had gotten worse. He bent down to her ear. Can you still fly? I need you to get us out of here, he whispered. She nodded. Yeah, I think so. Cass stood back up, turning his attention to the screen again. All of this? It's been nothing but a ploy to get the ship? He motioned for Evie to move behind Box. Vina pursed her ruby lips and tilted her head like she was explaining basic math to an infant. I didn't know what I was in for when little Miss Merck there showed up willing to pay your debt, did I? But I figured it must have been something important if the Coalition was willing to infiltrate Sargan's space just for you. I knew you were an outcast, but it gave me unending pleasure to find out exactly why. All this business with the Atlas, so serious, she said, tisking. But once I learned from you, no less, that the Coalition was in possession of SIL technology, well, how could I refuse? The opportunities were just too wondrous. She's pulling us in, Box said from his seat. Cass kept his eyes on Vina, but motioned with one hand behind his back to Evie. The only problem is you've done nothing but find a dud, Cass said. The weapon doesn't work. All it does is kill every living thing in the immediate area once it's activated. The crew of the Atlas didn't know its power source makes it unusable. Does it now, Venus said, tending her fingers under her chin. Well, that explains why the ship was empty when my men found it, she paused, thinking. Still pulling, Box said, watching the monitors. Cass risked a glance at Evie. She nodded to him. Regardless, it could make a wonderful present for some of my enemies. And when they try to activate it, yes, that will do quite nicely. Caspian, you are just a bundle of good information. You should have known I'd never let you go. I love you too much. Evie hit the hab ejection button, and Cass reached down, targeting and firing the quad cannon at the hab, destroying it. The ship rocked with the explosion, sending all of them tumbling. Vina's image disappeared from the screen, replaced by static waves. Get in the pilot seat, Cass yelled as Box was thrown against the far wall. Evie had landed on her side again and scrambled up. It didn't escape Cass's notice that she was leaving a trail of blood in her wake. But she managed to get to the seat and engage the engines. Jumping to the nearest undercurrent now, she said, hitting the emitter. The tunnel opened before them and the small ship pulled away. We've only got three stabilizers working, Evie said, jerking the controls. This is going to be rough. Signs of pursuit? Cass crawled over to where Box lay against the bulkhead. I can't tell. All the sensors are down. I'm flying blind here, she replied. The ship continued to shake back and forth. Without the fourth stabilizer, they wouldn't be able to stay in the undercurrent long. The friction would tear the ship to pieces. Box? I'm sorry, boss. I didn't know. I'll trust you on that, Cass said. But you can't remain active. If she's seeing everything you're seeing... I know, he said his eyes blinking. Just promise me you'll turn me back on. I don't want this to be it. I promise. Cass winced. He wasn't sure it was a promise he could keep. If they couldn't find the bug inside Box and remove it without destroying his cortex, he might not be able to reactivate him. Box nodded, and his yellow eyes went dark, his lifeless body slumping to the side. Don't worry, buddy. We'll get through this. Cass placed his hand on the machine for a moment. He jumped back up and returned to the co-pilot seat. Status? We've maybe got another two minutes in this undercurrent. Then we'll have to go back to normal space. See if you can't get the sensors working, Evie said, piloting with one hand. Her other was back on her wound, blood seeping through her fingers. Is the calm down, too? Can we call the Tempest? Cass asked. The forward and aft sensor arrays were out. Not only was he flying blind, he had no idea if they were being pursued. Calm is still up, Evie tapped a series of buttons. Tempest, come in. Mayday. Gamma stabilizer is out. Can't maintain heading long. Excuse? This is Tempest, Green's voice said over the comm. We're coming to you. Stand by. 
Any luck? Evie asked, indicating the sensors. Cash shook his head. Then I guess we'll find out if anything is behind us pretty quickly. She pulled back on the throttle and disengaged the undercurrent emitter. Normal space appeared around them. She swung the ship around to give them a visual of what might be coming behind them. Evie took deep breaths through her teeth to control the pain. Let me take the controls, Cass said. You're in no shape to fly anymore. No. If they come out of that tunnel after us, you won't be able to maneuver us to safety, she replied. You told me yourself you were a terrible pilot. Cass was about to argue the point when a tunnel opened to their right, revealing the Tempest. Stay where you are, Green said. We'll bring you in. The ship came around in front of them and lined up Bay 1 with their position. Evie sat back in relief as Tempest enveloped them into the hangar. She pushed the controls to set the ship down. Come on, Cass helped her to her feet. We need to get you to Zack's. He draped her arm around him and helped her to the lock, where they were met by a group of security officers and medical staff. She's been seriously injured, Cass said. She needs medical attention right now. What about you? One of the medical officers asked, as Cass helped hand off Evie to the others. I'm fine, but I need to go get my robot. I don't want to leave him aboard. The officer nodded and tended to Evie as they walked her down the ramp into the main part of the bay. Cass jogged back over to where Box lay slumped against the ground. I'm not leaving you here. He hooked his arms under Box's frame, dragging him back along the hallway. Box's metal legs scraped along the floor. Never realized how much you weigh, Cass grunted as he pulled Box further down the hallway. When he reached his personal hab suite, he yanked Box over the threshold and left him in the middle of the floor. Sester can help you, he said, and Evie knows what's wrong. You're going to be fine. He took one last look at his friend and ran from the room, sealing the door behind him. Cass bolted down the corridor back to the cockpit and began the initiation sequence for the engines. He may not be the best pilot, but he could at least get the ship out of the bay. The engines rumbled back to life, and he retracted the landing gear as well as the main ramp, making sure all ports were sealed. Finally, Cass toggled the switch that would release his own hab suite with box inside, hearing the rumble as the suite dropped to the bay floor. Okay, Vina, he said. You want me? You got me. Cass hit the engines and blasted out of the bay back into open space. Thirty-six. It took a minute to get used to the steering as the ship wobbled back and forth, but as long as he was moving away from Tempest, that was a good thing. The comm button beside his chair chirped three times. Cass decided to ignore it. This was what was best for everyone. The reasonable excuse was already hanging on by a thread. He'd lost three hab suites and a stabilizer. There was no future for him in either the Coalition or the Sarkhan Commonwealth. Vina would either keep him a slave forever, or Rutledge would have him locked up for the rest of his life. And he wasn't going to go out like that. He was going out on his own terms. If the last seven years had taught him anything, it was life never turned out how you wanted, but at least he'd have control over how it ended. The calm chirped again. Cass ignored it, plotting his course back to Vina's ship, or at least its last known position. It wasn't as if he'd never flown before. It had just been a long time. His vector drifted as he tried to re-enter the coordinates back along the route he'd just come through. The ship could survive one last small jump. She'd been better to him than he deserved, holding together long after any other ship would have long fallen apart. She was like a friend who'd always been there for the ride. And she was going to help him end this once and for all. Finally, he got the coordinates inputted and made the necessary arrangements for the jump. Emitter power is active, he said, feeling the rush of adrenaline as the emitter opened up the undercurrent tunnel and the ship shot forward. Two minutes. In two minutes, he'd be right back at her ship. Then all of this would be over. His only hope was the previous explosion had permanently taken out that tractor beam. Because if not, he might be in a world of trouble. 
the comb chirped again. And again. And again. Cursing, Cass finally hit the accept button. What the hell do you think you're doing? Green's voice said on the other end. I'm taking care of this once and for all. Maintain your position, Cass said. I don't know how large this explosion will be, but you need to keep your distance. The weapon on board can affect things beyond the confines of one ship. That's how the dry dock crew died, too. What the hell are you talking about, Mr. Rabot? Green asked. Talk to Evie once she's better. She'll explain everything, he replied. Was she in on this? Was this her idea? Green demanded. Cash shook his head, even though Green couldn't see him. No, sir. This was all on me. She didn't even know about it. This weapon must be destroyed, and we don't have time to wait for coalition reinforcements. I'll regret I won't get to see the look on Rutledge's face when you tell him his ship was lost, when you tell him I did it, but we're out of time. Caspian, Green said, I know you think there is no other way out of this, but this isn't the answer. His voice sounded softer, more understanding than Cass had heard it before. Sorry, sir, I think it is. This will be best for everyone, including the Coalition, Cass replied, cutting the comm link. It chirped again, but he ignored it. Less than thirty seconds to go. The ship shook like it would fly apart at any second, and warnings flashed in front of Cass, letting him know the structural integrity wouldn't hold much longer. All he needed to do was get close enough. The Atlas wouldn't be able to sustain a direct hit from his ship, despite being much larger. Plus, Cass knew right where to hit its most vulnerable spot, the underbelly. Based on his speed, he should be able to penetrate at least one of the main emitters, which would be enough to destabilize the matter conversion system, resulting in a complete self-destruct. The screen in front of him flashed an urgent warning. He wouldn't be able to hold it. He had to come out of undercurrent space. But he hadn't reached his destination yet. That was fine. It would just give him more time to speed up. Maybe he could reroute some of his extra power to the emergency thrusters. Anything to get him to critical velocity. Cass pulled back on the throttle and re-entered normal space. In the distance sat Vena's ship. He'd come close, but not close enough. It would take another few minutes to get there using the normal engines, and he'd probably burn most, if not all, of his reserve fuel. Computer scan for additional, he began, before remembering the scanners were offline. The best he could do was stare out the main window and count how many ships he had to avoid for the next five minutes. Venus Dreadnought was the largest, obviously, though it didn't appear to be moving. The Hab Suite may have done more damage than he'd thought. Around Venus' ship patrolled two of the smaller Sargan ships. Setsuma had been right. They were Darkness-class vessels. He hadn't gotten a good look before when the Tempest was making its strafing runs, but there they were, clear as day. All three Sargan ships were well-armed, but he just needed one shot, one well-timed shot. The comm chirped again and Cass hit the button, swearing this was the last time. Listen, Captain, you're not going to convince me. Oh, so it is you again, Vina said. I thought that little girlfriend of yours might have gotten all heroic. But look at you, back again to finish what you started. There was a certain amount of sarcasm and pity in her voice, which only enraged Cass more. You were the one who wanted me back so badly, he quipped double-checking his approach. He was dead on target for the Atlas. This flying thing wasn't so hard after all. So I did. I must have done something right in a previous life, because here you are, ready and waiting. What are you thinking? A suicide mission? Oh, Cass, how quaint. A bolt of high-energy plasma strafed across the bow of his ship, having originated from Venus. He hadn't even seen the imminent weapon indicator. With all his focus on the heading and keeping the ship straight, he couldn't afford to split his attention. While you are quite capable, she teased, there's always been something you never mastered, hasn't there? Another bolt flew to the side of the ship, and Cass jerked the controls, sending the ship sailing starboard. 
He struggled to write the excuse again. I thought maybe all those years with that robot might have taught you something, but, alas, still just an engineer. Only a few hundred thousand kilometers. I can make it that far, Cass thought, readjusting his angle back toward the Atlas. It was a clumsy attempt, and he knew it, but he only had to survive long enough to actually hit the damn thing. That was all that mattered. Plasma strafed the left side of the ship, lighting up ten different warning indicators. She'd burned out one of his engines. He'd have to reroute additional power to the others to compensate. And his heading was off again. She was just toying with him. There was no way he'd ever make it to his target. The destroyers would see to that much. Once you're back home safe, we might give you a new job, Venus said. Unfortunately, you can't have Rasp's old position, since you're the reason he's gone. But I do have a space in my entourage for a new servant which would fit you nicely. Cass shuddered. Servant only meant one thing. Sex slave. He'd rather go to jail. Come now, doesn't that sound nice? Catering to my every whim, my every desire? You couldn't ask for a better assignment. He had half a mind to blow up the excuse right there. But he had a job to do, and he'd see it through. There had to be some way of getting around all these obstacles. Yeah, if you were a better pilot, you could fly circles around them. There was only one thing left to do. He pulled back on the throttle and threw the ship into a barrel roll, as he'd seen Box do so many times before. Indicators went off all over his panels, and he completely lost his vector. But at least plasma blasts weren't scorching his ship anymore. This would be a lot easier if the sensor arrays were working, he grumbled, orienting his ship back into a stable flight plan. Only, when he looked up, he found himself staring at the nose of a darkness-class Sargan destroyer. They had positioned themselves directly between him and Vina's ship. Fuck. He stared at the green ship in front of him. Take comfort in knowing you never had a chance, Vina said over the comm. It was always going to turn out this way, no matter what you did. He had to think. There had to be another way. What if he just rammed the destroyer? Would that create a large enough shockwave? Just as he was about to try, a bright pulse of light caught his eye, coming from the left side of his ship. Cass could barely believe it as the tempest exited an undercurrent and fired on the destroyer, causing it to dip down to minimize the damage. A new voice came over his comm. Rabon, get in there and do what needs to be done, Green said. Yes, sir, Cass replied. With the destroyer out of the way, he had a straight shot for the Atlas. He gunned the engines, causing the dampeners to fail momentarily and pull them back into his seat. All ships, fire on that small one. Don't let him get close, Vina's voice screeched. But it was too late. It was too close. She had let her overconfidence get the better of her, and now it would cost her everything. Really enjoyed the job, Vina. Cass said, but if you don't mind, I quit. He cut the comm and focused all his attention on plowing the reasonable excuse right into the side of the Atlas. Soon, this would all be over. You're not going out there, Zack said, running down the hall behind Evie. The hell I'm not. Who else do you know who could get out there and save his wretched ass? Someone not missing part of their upper arm, she yelled back. She spun on the doctor. Am I in danger of losing the arm? Right now? Will I lose it? Zax took a step back. Well, no. I've stabilized it. But that doesn't mean... She held up her hand and resumed running down the hall to Bay 2. Cass was out there making a suicide run, and she wasn't about to have another dead man on her conscience. Evie reached the main doors, which opened for her, revealing the large bay. Glancing to the side, she saw the firefight outside the ship. Green had brought Tempest through a short undercurrent to catch back up with Cass once he'd blasted out of the bay. She should have known he would try something stupid. Had she not been injured, she never would have left him alone in his ship. At least he'd had the decency to leave Box behind, which told Evie everything she needed to know. He was going out, and he wasn't coming back. Clear the way. I need a space wing ready, she yelled. Two crewmen looked up from their jobs 
and hurried over to the small fleet of vehicles stashed on the side of Bay 2. They were designed to operate short range only, but they were highly maneuverable and carried a large complement of offensive weapons. They could also fly in a planet's atmosphere, and thus they were more aerodynamic than most coalition ships. They had been her favorite ship back at the Academy. It will take a moment to warm, ma'am, one of the crewmen said, beginning the startup procedure and popping the access hatch. I don't have a moment. Emergency startup, she ordered, climbing the ladder and hauling herself in with some difficulty, given her arm wasn't functioning right. As long as it could hold a stick and push a button, she'd be good. The other hand was the one she needed for navigation. Just what the hell are you doing with one of my ships? A harsh voice said from below. Evie looked down to see Chief Master Raffenkel with her hands on her hips. I need this for just a minute, she replied, flipping on all the startup procedures. Commander, you're not authorized. Chief, don't. We've got a man out there, and I'm not leaving him. Then let my squad do it. We can have him no time, Evie interrupted. Executive order. Now move. Raffenkel watched her for a beat, then took a step back, working her jaw. The space wing hummed to life under her as Evie yanked the hatch back down and hit the seal button on her console. She tapped the top of her hand. Put me through to Cass on the reasonable excuse, Evie said into the onboard comm. It's locked down, Paige replied. And if you haven't noticed, we're a little busy up here. Paige, shut up and put me through to his personal comm. That one won't be active. She heard a colleague grumble, but he did as he asked and the small beep around her told her she was connected. Hello? he asked. He sounded surprised. Evie dropped the moorings and hit the main thrusters, pulling the ship into a direct line of launch from the bay. Cass, you don't have to do this. She hit the accelerator, and the ship blasted out of the hangar bay. A little late to back out now, he replied. Just as she suspected, his course was locked on the Atlas. No, it isn't. Take the last hap, sweet. Get out of there. Idiot thinks he's going to be a martyr. It's better this way, Evie. Trust me. I don't belong in the Coalition any more than I belong with the Sargans. This solves everyone's problem. She shook her head, yanking the ship around into a pursuit course. She wasn't sure if she could catch him in time. The excuse had more powerful engines than the small space wing. Including Rutledge? She challenged. You dying would be his greatest gift. Don't let him win, Cass. Don't give him the satisfaction. The only way this won't happen again is if you speak out against him. You're the only one left who can. He didn't respond. She pushed the accelerator harder, willing it to move faster, even though she knew she was at full speed. She checked her instrument panel, which told her Tempest was engaging both the destroyers. The dreadnought still hadn't moved and Cass was headed directly for it. She needed to be more persuasive. Cass, please. The Coalition may have failed you, but that doesn't mean you give up on the rest of us. Some of us still believe in this institution, and it needs people like you who are willing to fight the corruption for it to survive. If he was right, and there was a threat of corruption running through the Coalition, his death would bury it forever. Without him... Any hope of bringing Rutledge to task would be destroyed. Plus, she had to admit to herself, she didn't want to see him die. He was a good person who deserved better. She waited, trying to think of something else to say while the excuse only flew closer to the Sargan ship. If he'd already made up his mind, she needed to turn back now. I'm on my way, Cass finally said. Thank Kor. Evie leaned forward, urging the ship to move faster, all the while checking her surroundings to make sure there weren't going to be any surprises. Her arm throbbed in pain, but she pushed past it. Why wasn't the dreadnought firing at Cass's ship? It was like it was just sitting there, dead in space. Had something happened? Evie watched as the last hab sweep detached from the rest of the ship. But due to the inertia, it didn't slow down, only kept pace with the excuse flying right beside it. She adjusted her heading to match the new object, hoping she hadn't done all this for nothing. Evie, you better be able to grab me, he said. This is going to be close. 
She watched his ship inch closer and closer to the Atlas, flying at full speed. The impact would not be pretty, not at these speeds. The hamp suite was just out of reach. Evie reached down with her damaged arm and readied the grappler. As soon as the reticle turned red, she fired, the grappler digging into the side of the hab and jerking it back. She immediately reversed thrust and whipped the ship around, throwing all her power into heading away from the Atlas. On the panel to her right, she pulled up a visual of the ship as the excuse grew ever closer to its target. She only had seconds to get out of range. A bright blast filled her screen. That was it. The shock wave would hit them any second now. She could only hope they were far enough away. Evie braced herself. Thirty-seven. From the bridge of the Tempest, Green watched the tiny ship plow into the Atlas, obliterating both ships. The resulting explosion began a chain reaction in the dreadnought. Report, he yelled. It's a massive shockwave explosion, sir. Whatever was on the Atlas had more destructive power than I've seen from... from anything, Zal said. The weapon, Green thought. How far away is Commander Diazal? 40,000 kilometers, sir, Page replied. Will she make it out? Not before the shockwave hits. Green turned to Zal, knowing the answer to his question before even asking. Can a space wing survive that kind of destructive power? Zal shook his head. No, sir. Neither can the hab suite she's towing. His crew may have been fresh compared to some of his other shipmates in the past, but that didn't mean they were worth sacrificing. There was no choice. He had to try and save them, even if one was a convicted criminal. Cass had tried to sacrifice himself with the Coalition, despite everything they'd done to him, and Green wasn't about to let them get away with it. How long until it hits them? he asked, watching the screen with intensity. The waveform was massive, closing in on his executive officer's ship. He'd never seen anything like it either. Whatever this weapon of the Atlas had been, he was glad it was destroyed. Watching the destruction, he couldn't help but wonder how long it would spread before it could dissipate. Even supernovas didn't generate this kind of power. Thirty-two seconds, sir. Green turned to his helmsman, his mind made up. Rond, you did an excellent job last time enveloping Mr. Rabot's ship. Think you can do it again? We're too far away, sir. If we were closer, Ron said in an uncertain tone, frowning. Ensign River, plot an undercurrent course to the commander's ship. Green said, and make it quick. Hi, River responded with an unsure voice of her own. He watched her hands move over the controls faster than any normal human could. Despite her lack of confidence, she was talented. Green had to admit, if he'd had a non-augmented officer at the navigation station, this maneuver probably would not be possible. But that was the beauty of the Coalition. Anyone could become an officer. Course plotted, River replied. Lieutenant Rond, if you please, Green said, staring at the screen on the far wall. He braced himself. This was definitely off-book, as far as standard rescue procedures were concerned. The image turned into a blur for a split second, before repixelating to show the commander's small craft directly in front of them, the shockwave closing fast. Her ship then moved past the image of the monitor, out of view. Green barely had time to appreciate the beauty of the wave itself. It was as if someone had spun paint and oil and water and lit it all on fire. Got them! Rond whooped. Blom, full power to engines and punch it, Green ordered. The ship made one fluid motion around, and within an instant they were in an undercurrent. We're clear, Zal said. Well done, everyone, Green said, tapping a pad on his chair. Sax, prepare to receive wounded. Oh, I'm already waiting, Zax replied, causing Green to smile. Anton River, set course for Starbase 8. Full speed ahead. Thirty-eight. Oh, look, he's coming out of it. He might be better off sleeping a while longer. He only likes extra sleep when he's hungover. 
Cass opened his eyes. Box stood in front of him, his yellow eyes blinking approval. Cass groaned and turned over, his body responding to the movement by sending a surge of aches and pains through his system. You better not be recording this, Cass said. A small circular device landed on the bed beside him. Cass picked it up, examining it between his forefinger and his thumb. Sargantech. Box shrugged. It wasn't buried deep. Sester was able to get it out without much trouble. Cass squinted. And I'm assuming, because I'm sitting here talking to you, I made it out okay. He tossed the device on the small table beside him. That depends on your definition of okay, Zack said, sidling up to him as if from nowhere. She stared at Cass with her six black eyes, as if she were staring into his soul. You sustained a concussion and three broken ribs, which I have since repaired. But you may experience some vertigo over the next twenty to forty hours. Cass sat up. In a response, the room did a quick 360 before settling again. He rubbed his temples. Thanks, he said, swinging his legs off the side of the bed. What about over there? Box pointed to where Evie lay on one of the beds, a medroid beside her, stitching new muscles and skin together inside a self-enclosed chamber. We had to reconstruct her arm from scratch, Zack said. She re-injured it, rescuing you. She'll be out another twelve hours, until her immune system has healed enough to prevent any infection. Cass got on his feet. The floor wobbled under him, but he managed not to fall over. That was a beginning, at least. Box? What happened? I wasn't shut down, but from what they told me, you decided to make a suicide run. I know that part. What happened after that? Oh... Box said. Well, Evie went after you because she secretly has a crush on you. Then Captain Green went after her because he secretly has a crush on her. Box, and then I woke up under the care of the engineers because they secretly have a crush on me. Cass coughed. People don't rescue other people just because they have crushes on them, you know. But it makes it that much more plausible, doesn't it? Box said. The girl going off to risk everything to save the man she loves? It makes my servos flutter. Cass rolled his eyes. Yeah, okay. What happened after that? You managed to plow my ship into the heart of the Atlas, which caused a cascade reaction completely destroying both ships. I watched the footage. Venus Dreadnought was obliterated in the subsequent explosion, as in atomized turned to dust, kaput. So you don't have to worry about her anymore. Cass caught Zack's giving him a look, but it was hard to interpret. He wasn't fully versed in Yak's Inax body language. If he had to guess, he'd say the doctor wasn't too happy about the loss of life on Venus' ship. But the universe was a better place without her. Which means you now owe me one ship, Box finished. I never said I'd give you the ship. I said I'd give you quarters, and I kept my word. What good is a hab suite if it isn't connected to a usable ship? Box complained. Guess you should have been more specific in your request. Cass made his way to the door as Box grunted behind him. The captain wants to see you, Zack said, as soon as you're able. Cass nodded and exited sickbay taking one last look at Evie, lying unconscious on the table. He wouldn't forget what she'd done for him. She had saved his life. And he wasn't going to let it go to waste. The doors of the hypervator opened on the bridge. Much to Cass's relief, he saw much of the damage had been cleared away. The view screen on the back wall still served as the focal point, since the central display was still in dozens of pieces. It would need a full replacement. All of the stations, save the two sunken into the floor, had turned to face the display. But because navigation and helm control already naturally faced that direction, those stations didn't need to turn. Cass noticed Ensign River now occupied Ensign Blackburn's post permanently. Green wasn't on the bridge. 
Cass cleared his throat, and Paige glanced back at him in box, dismissing them with his eyes. He's in the command room, Paige said, turning back to his work. Cass ignored his urge to go and punch the man again, and instead led Box to the command room door, entering only when given the all-clear from the captain on the other side. Feeling better? Green stood as they entered. Alive is better than dead, so yes, much better, Cass replied. Green stuck out his hand for Cass, which caused Cass to gape at him for a moment. You were willing to do what was necessary. That's a trait I respect, Green said. Cass took the man's hand and gave it a firm shake. Thank you, Captain. I'm curious. Why did you change your mind? Green asked, his eyes penetrating. He'd almost gone through with it. But then, Evie had reminded him there were more important things than sacrificing yourself for a cause. Sometimes it was more important to keep fighting. Eve, your first officer, reminded me I wasn't done yet. And I didn't want to give the Admiral the satisfaction. Green nodded. Which brings me to why I've asked you here. Please take a seat. Box sat in the seat directly across from the captain. Cass couldn't hide his smile as he took the other. Green was momentarily flustered, but turned his attention to Cass. You have a problem, Mr. Ribot. I think the Coalition has a problem, Cass replied. I agree. And you are the only one who can help us remove that problem. You are the last eyewitness to a terrible atrocity that never should have taken place. And I want to make sure the man responsible for it is taken into custody and punished for his crimes. I would love to do that, sir. But without any evidence, it's like I told Evie. Green held up a small data recorder. It was exactly like the one he'd taken off Maddox back at Devil's Gate. Standard issue. Commander Diazol had the forethought to download the Atlas logs while you were over there. I've taken some time to examine them, and some of the crew's personal logs back up your story. It seems a few of your fellow officers weren't happy about what Rutledge did to you, but were too afraid to speak up. Their personal logs, sir? Aren't those protected? Not when the subjects are deceased. They become coalition property, and I have every right to review them in order to seek out and end an injustice. With an eyewitness and corroborating evidence, I don't see any reason Admiral Rutledge will remain at his post much longer. Green set the recorder down on his desk. Wow, she really does care, Box whispered, staring at the recorder. Cass was stunned. She did that for me? he asked. Why? I haven't known the commander long, Green said, but from what I know about her and her service record, she has a real problem with bullies and people who don't believe in the sanctity of the coalition. What Rutledge has done goes against everything we stand for. Perhaps she took it personally, having been assigned by him to go get you. Whatever it is, she wasn't going to let it go. Cass furrowed his brow. I can't say I'm not appreciative. Of course, she also violated protocol by going after you and saving your life, Green said. Fortunately, records of the incident have been conveniently misplaced, he grinned. Cass grinned back. Maybe the Coalition wasn't so bad after all. I never thought I'd see the day, Cass said as they watched Rutledge being led from his office by three security personnel. He and Evie reclined on the couch in his quarters on Starbase 8, provisionally given to him by Admiral Sangvi, the new ranking officer for the station, watching the feed repeat over and over. The official Coalition news station hadn't been showing anything else for the past six hours. You think you'll be ready for the trial? Evie asked. Her arm was still in a hyperbaric wrap, but only for another twelve hours. I doubt he'll let it get that far, Cass replied. He's got too much pride. 
he'll take whatever deal they offer him. I can't believe Green made this happen, he turned to her, that you made it happen. She placed her hand on his forearm for a moment. We all made it happen. And hopefully, after this, the Coalition will think twice about commissioning experiments based on alien technology. I think it was for the best you destroyed that ship. I think you're right, Cass replied. So, what are you going to do now? No ship, and stuck in the middle of Coalition space. Cass glanced around. His quarters were on the upper levels in the starbase. From here, he could see Tempest under repairs down below. It had been a rough few days, but he hadn't had a lot of time to think about the future. Between all the meetings with admirals and providing his testimony to the Coalition security forces, he'd wanted nothing more than sleep. Box had been adamant about staying in his hab suite, but the maintenance crews had already disassembled it, leaving him to bunk with Cass again. I'm not sure. Without a prison sentence hanging on my neck, I was thinking about working my way back to the inner systems, figure out a way to get another ship. Nothing fancy, just something that will get me from here to there. You could always join up again, Evie suggested. Cass recoiled. And go through everything all over again? The Academy was tough enough the first time. I'm not sure I want to put myself through all that again. They might be willing to grant you something provisionally, since, you know... Cash shook his head. It's been seven years. I doubt I'd even be able to qualify for lieutenant anymore. No, I think I want to take my robot and start exploring, without any kind of weight dragging me down. You don't think the Sargans will come after you? After what happened to Vina? He shrugged. Maybe, but I'm not too worried about it. I can start on the far side of Coalition space, about as far from the Sargan Commonwealth as I can get. That's where I used to be stationed, out near Epsilon Lyre. Cass leaned back, putting his arms behind his head. I'm talking about even further out. Arkelia, or Beta Strongren. You know, the real untamed frontier. Evie scoffed, sitting back and taking a sip of her tea. Just can't stay in civilized society, can you? It will take months, if not years, to even get out that far. Yeah, but what's life without a little adventure? Cass replied. He would never be able to express how thankful he was to her for saving his life. And, in all honesty, he would love to stay here in the middle of the Coalition find a way to stay on Tempest. But it wasn't realistic. He'd never be anything other than the criminal-turned-revolutionary to the crew. And even if people no longer looked at him with disgust, it would still be in the back of their minds. He was still the reason 24 people from the Atlas were dead. Nothing could ever change that. But at least now he'd taken steps to make it right. Well... Cass said, standing. I guess I should go start booking passage. What about you? Headed back to Tempest? She stood as well, nodding. We'll be in repairs for another week. Then we'll get our next assignment. But I think it will be hard to beat this last one. He smiled. Yeah. It was one hell of a ride. He paused, trying to draw out the moment. Thanks. She watched him a moment before heading toward the door. At the last moment, she turned. Thanks yourself, she said, then disappeared through the other side. It was only when she was gone, Cass realized it was probably the last time he'd ever see her. And for all his protestations to the contrary, he couldn't help but feel a pang in his heart as the door slid closed. Epilogue. Ready? Cass asked, approaching the airlock. Box trudged along behind him, dragging three crates which scraped along the floor. Are you sure we have to go? 
I suppose you could stay here, if you wanted to be assigned to exhaust cleaning, Cass said. I should have rights, Box announced, banging on his chest, sending an echo of metal on metal through the space. I should be able to go to the Academy if I wanted. Cass scoffed. Keep dreaming, bud. He turned to the airlock. Beyond was the USCS Winston, a survey ship headed for Priocyon. He'd managed to book passage for them as far as Priocyon 4. But once they arrived, he'd have to make new arrangements. He'd been given free passage through the Coalition, but that didn't mean things would be easy. The Coalition had been very enthusiastic about keeping the events surrounding the Atlas quiet, which meant few people beyond the crew would know the actual story. The cover was Rutledge had been arrested for a separate charge, having nothing to do with the crew of Tempest or Cass. The two events were to be kept as separate as possible, though any arrest warrants for Cass had been quietly rescinded. Cass understood. They wouldn't want word getting out to the Claxian homeworld or any of the Coalition's enemies that there had almost been a coup within the Coalition itself. Rutledge had brought them to the brink of war, and it had only been the actions of Cass and the crew of the Tempest who had prevented it all, and no one would ever know about it. Cass had been given a clear record, all war crimes expunged. But in his experience, people had a long memory. People like Page would never stop suspecting him. So what reason did he have to give them the chance? He was sure once they got to the far side of Coalition space, back out into non-aligned territory, he'd be able to find another ship. And not a courier this time, something much nicer. Cass's com beeped. He creased his brow and glanced at Box. I bet it's Evie, Box said. She's going to come running down the corridor at any minute and throw herself into your arms, begging to come with us. Cass pursed his lips. Somehow I highly doubt that. He tapped the com. Rabot here. Mr. Rabot, you haven't left yet? Why would Green be calling him? No, we were just about to board the Winston. I need you to report back to the main officer's ward. Admiral Sangley's office. Immediately, Green said. Is there a problem? Immediately, Mr. Rabot. He cut the calm. That was odd. What could they still need with him? Rutledge had opted not to go to trial. Everything regarding the Atlas had been wrapped up. Cass turned to Box. You stay here. Don't let that ship leave without us. I'm sure this won't take but a minute, he said. Fine, Box said, pulling a screen from the crate and turning it to the closest wall. A net drama immediately popped up. I'll just sit here and wait, like always. He slumped down so he was sitting on the ground. Cass jogged to the closest hypervator. This had to be some sort of last-minute farewell or something. He'd heard people did that sometimes, surprise their friends with a going-away party or other equally sappy gesture. Not that he wouldn't be happy to receive it. It just seemed odd that they would wait until he was leaving to tell him. Add in the fact he didn't have any friends meant it would be a small party. Which was fine. He wouldn't be able to stay long anyway. The Winston would be departing within the hour. And they still needed to check in and get settled in their temporary quarters. Priocyon was 200 light years away. A good 40 days away on a ship that wasn't equipped with Tempest's advanced drive. Watching the interior of the station fly by as he transversed from the docking ports to the habitable sections, he figured most Coalition ships would probably be equipped with the drive within the next five years. It had been their only saving grace in the fight with Vena. Had the Tempest not had the speed it did, Vena's ships could have easily pursued and destroyed it. But that also meant a Claxian on every ship, something Cass was keen to see happen, as he'd felt it had been a long time coming, even back when he'd still been an officer. The hypervator doors opened on the Admiral Office's level, and he made his way down the large corridor, reading the names on each one. This was the same level Rutledge had been stationed on. 
If they were throwing him some kind of going-away gathering, he could already tell it was going to leave a bad taste in his mouth. He'd hoped never to see this corridor again. Cass reached Admiral Sangvi's office and touched the panel to the side. Come in, a man's deep voice said. The doors opened to reveal the Admiral himself, a tall, dark-skinned man with jet-black hair standing with his arms locked behind his back as he stared at Cass. In front of him sat Evie and Green. There was a third chair, empty. Mr. Rabot, thank you for coming on such short notice, the Admiral said, indicating he'd take the third seat. We've been discussing your exploits in the car per system. Please have a seat. Cass shot Evie and Green a look, but they seemed reassured he was there, not worried. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here, Cass said. I'm sure it seems that way. However, upon speaking with Captain Green and Commander Diazal, I've concluded we can't ignore your unique position in the Coalition. Okay, Cass said, taking the seat. Unique position? The blunt truth of why you are here is simple. Admiral Rutledge was both wrong and right. I'm sorry? As I'm sure you know, he was not alone in his wish to build a weapon based on SIL technology. Sangby took his seat. I thought that was the entire reason he was arrested, Cass said, not liking where this was going. What you don't know is there was a very good reason for what he did. A few months ago, our long-range telescopes out past Starbase 5 at the edge of Coalition space detected something we're calling Andromeda. We know they are an alien species, and we know they are incredibly destructive, and that's about it. And they are headed for our region of space and will arrive in about a year. And so... Based on my conversations with your colleagues here, and your unique position in this situation, we've decided to bring you back into the fold. The question is, are you willing to help the Coalition? Are you willing to help defend us against this threat? Cass couldn't believe it. An alien presence? And they were heading for Coalition space? I know you said you wanted the quiet life, Evie grinned but this seemed like more your style. Cass returned her gaze, then glanced at Green, whose face was still, yet his mouth was upturned at the corners. It looked like he wouldn't be headed to Priocean after all. Cass returned his attention to the Admiral. Tell me everything. This has been Caspian's Fortune, Infinity's End, Book One, by Eric Warren, narrated by Larry Gorman. Copyright 2019 by Eric Warren. Production Copyright 2019 by Eric Warren.